All right, good morning, everyone. We're here this morning in the state of Florida versus Catherine Magbanawa, 2016 CF 3036, 2018 CF 497. Ms. Magbanawa is present along with her counsel and also counsel for the state. Okay, the first thing uh, that we need to address is the uh, any motions that the defense would like to present. And so, uh, Ms. Kawas? Yes, sir. Would you like to proceed? Thank you, Honor. And for the record, the state has rested. So, Your Honor, at this time, the defense would like to renew all previous motions and objections and make our first motion for judgment of acquittal as it relates to the charges against Ms. McBanwa. I'll start first with the principle to first degree murder. To sustain a conviction as a principle for a crime committed by another, the state must prove that the defendant intended that the crime be committed and did some act or some word that would cause or assist the other person in actually committing the crime. In this case, Judge, it's very clear, even through the state's um, lead detective, the only direct evidence in this case against Ms. McManus' involvement comes from the words of Luis Rivera. Everything else is circumstantial as it relates to Ms. McManus' involvement. In this case, the only thing he was able to testify to as to Ms. McManus' involvement was that Gar Garcia said that she is the mastermind be behind all of this. There were no details as to who did the hiring, how the money was transferred. Rivera just said everything came through Garcia and he was hired by Garcia, who was paid afterwards by Katie. So in this case, Judge, we don't have any evidence that Ms. McDonnell intended that this crime be committed or did anything to assist. I'm going to point the court to the case of Williams versus State, which is a Florida first DCA case from 2021. 314 Southern 3rd, 775. The state failed to produce, and this is a murder for hire case, Judge. The state failed to produce evidence to make out a prima facie case again, that Miss Williams uh, was a principal to murder. In this case, they found that the only the com culpable conduct Miss Williams um, who was a defendant in the case was that she helped develop an alibi. She included considerations to, of ways to kill the victim in the case, and she was agreeing to encourage the person to go out so that he could end up being killed by who was her, um, uh, I guess, lover at the time, who was, ended up being a witness that testified against her. And the court actually overturned her jury conviction for a principle for first degree murder. That case actually delineates very well, you know, solic uh, accessory after the fact, uh, accessory before, and the principle uh, case as it relates to first degree murder. And I feel that that case is controlling here. They had more evidence in that case as it relates to principle for first degree murder. So I would say that in this case, we have even less because the only evidence as it relates to what Ms. McBanwa allegedly did to assist in this came from the words of Luis Rivero, which all he was able to say was that she was a mastermind. I'm also going to rely on Rocker versus State, 122 Southern 3rd, 898, as the language in there as it relates to circumstantial evidence. I won't go all of, all, over all of that, Judge. I'm just going to rely on that, of what um, circumstantial evidence can be to establish principle. I'm gonna now move on to count two, conspiracy to commit murder. A conspiracy exists where there is an express or implied agreement between two or more persons to commit a criminal offense and an intention to commit the offense, which in this case is murder. We have zero evidence before this court of an agreement between Ms. McBanwell and any member of the Adelson family. In fact, the state's own witness, Miss Adelson, said that her family had nothing to do with this. The court is very well aware that the state can't rely on impeachment evidence to substantiate the charges and the, uh, in, uh, the elements of the charges because impeachment evidence isn't substantive evidence. So the court has to look at all the evidence that was not impeachment. All we have left here is Luis Rivera saying, Garcia says she's the mastermind or the go-between. There's nothing in there that says who she conspired with, what the agreement was. He explicitly said he had no information as it relates to that because he doesn't know those people. And that all the information came to him from Garcia. And in this case, in this courtroom, the only thing he was able to say as it relates to Ms. McBanwa, anything occurring before the murder was he told me that you know she's in the middle. Count three, solicitation to commit murder. 
The elements are that the, defend, the, the state has to prove that the defendant commanded, hired, requesting, and encouraged another person to commit a crime, and that the intent that the other person commit the crime. In this case, I'm relying on the same argument, Judge, because the only direct evidence comes from Luis Rivera's mouth. There's nothing else to substantiate who it was that solicited um, uh, Sigfredo Garcia. Uh, he didn't explicitly say that Sigfredo told him that Katie was the one that came to him to get him to do the murder. Um, he just said Garcia showed up at his residence, or actually he found out, whichever one it is, that he found out on the way up on the first trip what it was, and then he then testifies that he hears Garcia talking on the phone and believes that it to be Miss McBanwa, but there is no direct evidence that Miss McBanwa solicited either one of them to do this crime. So, Your Honor, I know you've been paying close attention to all the evidence in this case. I'll rely on the court's recollection of how the evidence presented itself, but that's our argument as it relates to um, first JOA, that the state has failed to establish those elements uh, as being a prima facie case of any of the three charges that I just went over. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kwas. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Kappelman. Your Honor, the facts taken in the light most favorable to the case, including the testimony of Luis Rivera as well as <coughs> Jessica Rodriguez as direct evidence, and coupled with all the circumstantial evidence in the case, in the light most favorable to the state, um, is sufficient to go to the jury in this case. The distinction between our case and the Williams case that the defense cited is twofold. One, in that case, the court found there was insufficient evidence to show that the uh, defendant planned anything or stage managed the murder. In this case, as the defense mentioned, Rivera describes her as the mastermind and does offer details. She's the one that hired. She's the one that paid. She's the one that told them to take stuff off Instagram. She told them when to kill, who to kill, and uh, where to go to do it. She's the one that provided all the direction or stage managing in this case, different from what we had in the Williams case. In addition, um, a very important distinction is that this defendant was paid and paid others to do the murder, um, which is distinguishing from the Williams case. So I would ask that you deny the motion and let the case go to the jury. All right. Thank you. Okay. The court uh, will find that there is sufficient evidence uh, in the light most favorable to the state for uh, all three charges to go to the jury. Uh, in regards to the first degree murder, there was sufficient evidence uh, proven by the state that the victim is dead, that the death was caused by the defendant, and that it was also premeditated, uh, that she acted as a principal, had the conscious act uh, to uh, perform the criminal act, and also did some act to assist in the murder. Uh, that uh, evidence consists of uh, Rivera's testimony, which is direct evidence uh, that implicated the defendant from which the jury could find uh, that this uh, murder was committed by the defendant. That's also supported by both direct and circumstantial evidence, which would include uh, the bank records, the employment records, the content uh, of the intercepted phone calls, along with the timing of the intercepted phone calls, uh, the substance of the meeting at the Dolce Vita restaurant, and then also other independent witness, witness testimony, particularly uh, testimony in regards to the money payment that went to Rivera and how that was done. Uh, there's also uh, sufficient evidence to prove both the conspiracy and the solicitation. Uh, there was evidence of the intent to commit the murder and also uh, that she conspired with other people, uh, namely Charlie Adelson, uh, Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivera in uh, with the intent to commit this murder and also the solicitation. She solicited, solicited a person, uh, namely Mr. Garcia, and that uh, is, uh, there is evidence of that and that she commanded or hired that person uh, or people, uh, both Garcia and Rivera, in order to commit this crime. So therefore, and the light most favorable to state, there is sufficient evidence uh, for this to go to the jury and the motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. All right, so we are moving uh, at this point to uh, the defense case. And uh, who would like to speak on behalf of the defense case this morning? 
I'm just going to ask about witnesses and that type of thing. Oh, Mr. DeCose? For a second there, I was cut off guard. I'm like, can only one okay. of us do the witnesses? Um, I'll speak on it, Your Honor. Um, All right. So I received a list. I appreciate that. And so uh, I see this, uh, that you have a list of six witnesses. Is that correct? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. And um, this does not include, at this point, it does not include Ms. Magdanua, but uh, is that a decision that you want to make after these witnesses or are you prepared to uh, make that decision at this point after or is your, your client honor. prepared to make that decision at this point no, we would prefer to do it after your honor okay all right what do you anticipate uh time wise in regards to these witnesses you sure you don't want to ask miss gloss that well <laughs> no i'd rather ask you and then i'll add a couple hours to that all right perfect <laughs> perfect so your honor um uh, it, 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 this may help out as well too for the timing. Unfortunately, this system has gone down, and we need the system in some part for each witness. Okay. Um, the the and I apologize. I don't know his name. The tech guy came, and then he said he's calling facilities management. There's no power going to it, so we're not going to. Right, I didn't know that. Okay. My anticipation. I'll go through the witnesses. Craig Isom. I think the direct examination is going to be about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So 40 minutes. And then, uh, obviously, cross-examination. We do have Trooper Downing, who is here, the FHP Trooper. We haven't spoken to him yet. Um, we're going to push him a little bit later in, in calling the witnesses and have a conversation with him. Ryan Fitzpatrick, we flew him up. He's here. He's going to be a little bit longer, and Ms. Quas can tell me how long she thinks that examination is going to be. Judge, I don't anticipate my direct being more than 30 minutes. Okay. Michael Dilmore, he's laying the foundation to enter in some items, sort of like the ZRT report, which is a download of Secreto Garcia's phone. All right. Jason Newland, who, of course, is here. I think that his direct examination is going to be about 45 minutes. Okay. His is the longer one. All right. And then our first witness of the morning is Sherry Bennett. She's being called to impeach Jessica Rodriguez. It's a matter of playing five minutes of a recorded phone call with Jessica Rodriguez. So figure okay. 10, 15 minutes. Now, what ahead. about play? Can you play? Do you have power to play that recorded phone call from there? I do, but I don't think it's going to be loud enough for the jury. On all witnesses, too, there's an aspect of showing something on the Elmo to be able to go over it. So well, do you have all those things on paper or do you have them just in your computer? The things um, that you're going to show to the witnesses. Do you have them on paper also? No. Well, how are they going to be admitted into evidence? Well, I can go through it. There's certain, there's certain, for example, the maps that we use, it's best in the electronic form because the printout can't get the, although we have the maps in evidence. All right. Are form. these I, are these demonstratives? I'm just trying to see if we can get it done with some of these because I don't want to hold things up just because we're dealing with this. We're going to try to get it fixed. But if we've got things in paper that we can show to the jury, you know, we've done that at one time or another. Correct. And that's the way that we used to do it before all this. <laughs> right. The... Um, my hope is that we can get an idea of whether it's going to get fixed right now. I haven't gone, because I just came in, I got my stuff set up. I haven't gone through it to figure out what I need it for and what I don't. I can okay. look real quick and see. All right. It looks like we're going to find that out right now. So let's see if we can, uh, maybe we're running power from another source. Judge, can I be heard while they're working on that? Sure. Okay, on the defense issue of defense exhibits, throughout the course of this trial, we have really not been privy to what the defense is showing the witnesses. That's been told, explained as we don't know what we're going to use until the minute we use it. Um, but now this is the defense case. The defense knows what witnesses they're going to call. They know what exhibits they're going to use. So I would ask that the state be permitted to use whatever evidence they have used today and show the witnesses today. Um, the only exhibit I'm aware of as, as we stand here right now is the... Um, there's a portion of an interview with Jessica Rodriguez that they intend to publish. I'm not aware of anything in that interview that's inconsistent with what Jessica Rodriguez said that she was confronted with and denied saying. So at this point, I'm going to object to the admission of that item. I think that's something that needs to be done outside the presence of the jury and ruled on before we get in front of the, in front of the jurors. All right. So first of all, in regards to exhibits, any exhibits that you have that you anticipate that you're going to enter into evidence today, the yeah. state needs to see those. Okay. So, Your Honor, to, to make clear on this, days ago, I went over with Ms. Dugan and went through these items. There's nothing new in here. It's all from their discovery. We've reviewed it. I'm going to review it with them again so that there's no surprises so that they can't claim that, that they haven't seen it. This, this idea that we have not given them items, first, it's incorrect because it's from their evidence. 
But yes, as I'm questioning, th th there's a difference in between exhibits and impeachment items when I'm questioning Agent Sanford. And he says I understand that. Okay. I don't need to get into okay. that. If you anticipate that you're going to use some exhibits today, if you could just show them to the state we'll so that they can take a look at them. Secondly, what is this? There's a, a recorded statement of Jessica Rodriguez. Correct. And Your Honor remembers her testimony. She said that with respect to not being at investigator Bennett in the phone call says, you were aware that I was going to be calling you. And Jessica Rodriguez says, yes. So she's being impeached on that topic. She said that this- Aware morning, that I was going to be calling you? Correct. So Sherry Bennett in the investigator Bennett in the phone call says, Ms. Rodriguez, you were aware I was going to be calling you. To which Ms. Rodriguez says, yes. In her testimony, she said that she was not aware that there, that she was not aware that the phone call was coming in. She also testified that this alleged money drop happened in July of 2014, yet in the phone call, she says August, September. She says that Catherine handed the bag, but in the phone call said he had the bag in reference to Garcia. She said that she pressed Katie to find out what was in the bag and that Katie didn't know what was in the bag. She then stated that it was Garcia that called Rivera not Catherine McVanwa, and most importantly, Your Honor, she is very clear in saying that, and again, we believe that these are all, all allegations, so they're not ent entered for the truth of the matter asserted, but we're still only using it for impeachment. She says that Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine McVanwa left before Luis Rivera got there, which is a complete contradiction to what she said on the stand the other day. That's all we're playing. It's about a five-minute portion. There's right, other I'll, stuff. I'm going to allow it as impeachment testimony. You're getting this in through who? Through what witness? Uh, the investigator Sherry Bennett, who did the recorded phone call. All right. So I'll lay the foundation with her, play it, and that's the extent of her testimony. Okay. You're going to mark it as an exhibit, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, any progress? Well, okay. We think we've made some progress. I see lights on over there. So, Your Honor, I have a recording of the entire phone call. But because I'm using it for impeachment, I think the government would agree that I can't enter it in as substantive ed evidence. Oh, okay. That's I can correct. mark it for the record, though. No, 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 no. That was my mistake. You're correct. Okay. All right. Do we want to check? Uh, counsel, you want to check and make sure that there's power coming to this now and everything is operating as you need? Because it looks like it is. All right. Now, in regards to uh, uh, Trooper Downing, he's here in the courtroom. Are you anticipating that he's going to testify today? Uh, given the communication, so he walked in when Your Honor was on the bench, um, I think. That's when we noticed that he was here. Based on ASA Dugan's email yesterday, we still have to talk to him. All right. Well, we don't want him in the courtroom then, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Trooper Downing, good morning. I'm going to ask, sir, that you please remain outside the courtroom until uh, if and when you testify. And uh, during our break, counsel will talk with you at that time. OK, thank you for being here. All right. And you're going to be able to talk with him during the first break. Yes, you are. OK, so that we can. Uh, if we need to get him done this morning, that would be most efficient so that he can uh, then resume his duties. Okay, anything else before we bring the jury in? From the defense, Mr. Dacos? No, Your Honor. Just one of us would like to step outside to make sure that our witnesses are here. They weren't before we started. All right. Well, they, they were told to be here right before now. We're ready to start. Ms. Kappelman, anything? No, sir. I'm just assuming there are no exhibits being shown to this first witness. Ms. Kawash, do you know that? Well, I think this first witness, we have the audio that's being played. I believe that's the only thing, yes. And that's the only one. Okay. All right, let's bring in the jury, please. Bennett and Isom, 
just waiting on uh, Dillmore, but we can start with, with, with the right, best. The jury's event. coming in. The only exhibit for this first witness is the audio, correct? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Good to see you. Morning. Hi. Good morning. Morning. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. The state has rested its case, as you saw yesterday, and so we're now ready to proceed with the defense portion of the case. And Mr. DeCoste, the defense may call its first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. The defense calls Sergeant Sherry Bennett. Sergeant Sherry Bennett, please. Somebody will need to go out and get her, Mr. DeCoste. I get it. Okay. Good morning. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand in response to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Sergeant, good morning. If you could please introduce yourself to the jury. I'm Officer Sherry Bennett. Tallahassee Police Department. I apologize. I uh, upped your rank. Yes. All right. Um, what was your involvement in this case? At one time, you were an investigator, correct? Correct. And uh, you were involved in this case. If you could explain to the jury your involvement. I was initially involved with assisting with some of the paperwork, typing up search warrant subpoenas, um, and a lot of the data that has been collected by the other investigators and put in together for orders that were needed. At one point in time, did you do a phone interview of a witness, Jessica Rodriguez? Yes, I did. All right. Now, that's one of the topics that we're going to talk about. That's the second one. So let's go to the first topic, which is the arrest warrant of Ms. Magvanela. Were you involved in that? Yes, I, I presented the arrest warrant to the judge to be signed. After an arrest warrant is, is presented to a judge and signed, what is done with it? It is usually enter, or entered into NCIC, FCIC at the clerk of courts. I believe this one was signed after hours. And once you entered into the system, would it be available, let's say, the next business day to your colleagues? Yes. Uh, does it even matter whether it's a business day? Um, yes. All right. Um, I must, um, if it's entered after hours, <coughs> It is temporarily entered. It is not available through the clerk of court. So therefore, a copy has to be sent to someone until the clerk of court opens the next business hours. Now, that's through the courthouse. But throughout TPD, Tallahassee Police Department, your colleagues at TPD would have access to those documents, right? No. Um, the other officers that you're working on on the case, Investigator Craig Ison, he'd have access to the arrest warrant, correct? Yes, I sent it to him directly. When did you send it to him? After it was signed that same night. Do you have any reason to believe that he didn't receive it? No. How did you send it to him? Through email. All right. Now let's go to, to Jessica Rodriguez. Who is Jessica Rodriguez in relation to this case? She is the girlfriend of Rivera. Do you remember when you did a phone interview of Jessica Rodriguez? I believe it was September 30th of... 20, give me a second. 
2016. And if you know, if you could explain to the jury the relation of that date to Luis Rivera's cooperation. Um, I was aware he was, at the time, in an interview with uh, Detective or Investigator Isom and Pat Sanford. So on September 30th, 2016, Agent Sanford and Investigator Isom meet with Luis Rivera and they inform you that there's cooperation happening? Uh, yes. And what was the reason for your phone call to Jessica Rodriguez? I was summoned to the state attorney's office to make the call um, regarding her providing a statement. Was it your understanding that Luis Rivera was allowed to speak to her before that phone interview? I'm unaware. Was this phone call recorded? Yes, it was. Do you have public? You may. Like a plastic grocery bag? 
Yeah, like a plastic grocery bag, and I don't know what was wrapped, what was inside of it, like wrapped in. I thought it was like a brick of like cocaine or something, because it felt like a brick. So my my first thing was to bring drugs to my house. That's why I kept asking questions. What is this for? But inside, inside, it was like a couple of grocery bags, like wrapped all in one and tied. Officer Bennett, just a few questions on this, just to make sure that it's clear. Do you know who Tuto is? Yes. Who is that? Tuto is Sigfredo Garcia. And who is Tata? That is Luis Rivera. And you would agree with me that there was interchangeable using names and nicknames in that call? Yes. Um, is your understanding that what Jessica Rodriguez is saying is that Garcia and Catherine come to the house and that they leave before Rivera even gets there. Yes. At one point in time, you were co-lead investigator on this case? Yes. The alleged payment that Luis Rivera talks about, he says that it happens on July 19th, right? I'm unaware of what he said. Uh, your understanding is that it was the day after the murder? I, I don't recall. You do recall that Jessica Rodriguez, though, said that this happened in August or September? Yes. And that that bag was given to her by Sigfredo Garcia? Yes. And that Kath McDaniel had no idea? She did not say that. She did not say that she pressed Kath McDaniel and that she didn't know anything? I don't recall about the bag. Uh, with respect to what was going on? Oh, yes. One brief moment, Your Honor. I'll say nothing further. Cross examination. What she actually said about the dates was that she couldn't remember, right? Yes. That it was shortly after her daughter was born, which we learned in this trial was June 27th. Yes. And what she said is her best guess is August or September. But she but doesn't want to say for sure because she can't be sure. She had her daughter in June, so my daughter had to be at least two, two months or a month. That is correct. So a month from July, June 27th would be July 27th. Two months would be August 27th. Correct. So somewhere in that neighborhood, but she couldn't tell you the date. Correct. One moment, please. Okay. Regarding whether or not Katie knew what was going on, was there ever a question and answer in your interview about whether or not Katie knew what was going on? No. Okay. She said that Jessica Rodriguez told you that she asked Katie what was in the bag and Katie said she didn't know. Correct. But she didn't say she didn't know what was going on. Correct. All right. Thank you, Madam. Redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay. We can excuse the witness. She's free to go? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, officer. Have a good day. So I'm going to step out for one moment. See if I next week. All right.
defense calls investigator Michael Dillmore. All right, Michael Dillmore, please. morning. Good morning. Before you have your seat, we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand and respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you. Good, how are you? Doing well. If you could please introduce yourself to the jury. Certainly. My name is Mike Dillamore. I'm an investigator with the Tallahassee Police Department. That's D I L M O R E. And what do you currently do for the Tallahassee Police Department? I'm an investigator with the Technical Operations Unit, and I do digital forensics. Do you work with Sergeant Corbett? I do. He's my good supervisor. Deal. All right. So you did some work in this case, correct? Yes, sir. If you could explain to the jury the different tasks you did on this case. Certainly. My job in digital forensics is to go through computers and cell phones to find evidence. Um, so when an investigator um, comes something across an electronic storage device in their case that they believe evidence is on, they'll either get consent or a search warrant, bring it to me or my partner, and we'll go through it and try to find that evidence. So in this case, I did some cell phones, a computer, and some uh, like file returns, things like that. Did you happen to do any work on a phone that belonged to Secreto Garcia? Yes, sir. Was it your understanding that that phone was received after he was arrested? I believe so, yes, sir. And what kind of work did you do on that phone? Um, hold on, I'll get my documents up. Yeah, if you need to refresh your recollection, just let us know what you're taking a look at so it goes on the record here. Certainly. And you'll take a look at it and then let us know. Just opening up my activity log to see what I did on this particular phone. So I believe I did cell right extraction on this particular phone. Is that related to something called a ZRT report? No, sir. The ZRT is different. Um, the ZRT is where a camera is used to take pictures of the device if we can't extract the data itself out of it. Right. I believe another investigator actually did um, a ZRT on a different phone. Uh, did you do a Z Did you do a download and a corresponding ZRT report for Sigfredo Garcia's phone? No, sir. I did the Celebrate report. All right. Now there is a a long report that has your name on it. Correct? Yes. Sir. What is that called? If I'm calling that by the wrong right. Term. Yeah, it was, it was listed in the, you know, the ZRT, but it's actually a celebrate report. This is why there's a technical unit, right? To <laughs> yeah. explain to all of us what this stuff is. Just let me get that one open. And that particular report that you're talking about was done with a celebrate UFED device. It's a universal forensic extraction device. And basically, I connect the phone to it and then extract the data to my computer. And you did that for Secreto Garcia's phone? Yes, sir. Did you review the information that was downloaded? Uh, no, sir, not at the time. Have you since reviewed it? Some of it, yes, sir. And in your review of that, did you find that? Uh, let me back up here. With that download, are you getting you're getting data off of the phone? Does it include things like text messages? Yes, sir, it does. Since the time that you did this work leading up to today, have you reviewed 
those messages? Some of them, yes, sir, I have. And in your review of some of those messages, did you find that Secreto Garcia was in communication with Luis Rivera during May of 2016? I cannot say that for certain. I do not know Luis Rivera's phone number. Um, did you find in there that there was communications that within the communication referenced Luis Rivera? Yes, sir. All right. And if you don't remember, we can take a look at the document, but do you remember the time frame of those communications, when they began and when they went until? I believe it was May of 2016. If I were to ask you the specific day, would you know, or is it something that you need to take a look at the items? I'll need to take a look. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Right, I have it open right here as well. So, Investigator Dillmo, um, when did the, the communications between, and again, this is Sigfredo Garcia's phone. Correct. And your understanding from the content of the messages that it's Luis Rivera, or do you know if it's Luis Rivera or somebody that goes by the name of Tata? I can say that in the, stored in the device, in the contacts, it was listed, I believe, as T, just the letter T. But in one of the messages, it said, this is Tata, T-A-T-O. Now, this is coming from another cell phone <coughs> or another, another phone number? Another phone number, yes, sir. If you could tell the jury when those communications begin. Sure. Looks like, looks like the first one that looks like May 11th of 2016. Would you agree with me that it continues for the next week or so? Uh, I believe it goes through the 16th of May, if I'm not mistaken. Double check real quick. Uh, the last one that I have here is uh, May 16th of 2016. All right. You would agree with me that this is not coming from an email account? It does not appear to be. It, it says that it's from a phone number. Do you know if the technical operations unit ever did any work to find out if the phone number that these messages that Mr. Garcia's handset was communicating with, whether any work was done on that to find out whose cell phone it is? I don't know. <coughs> but you yourself didn't do any work on that? No, sir. Now, you also did, and I think it was a celebrate, but you're going to let the jury jury know if I'm wrong in that, um, with respect to Charles Adelson's iCloud, correct? Yes, sir. Now, just just for education purposes, my understanding is that a, a, a warrant or a subpoena is sent to Apple. Apple gives you data, and you need to put it into a system to then interpret that data, correct? That's correct. Yes, and sir. the Celebrite program interprets that data so it will organize contacts, calendar events, recording, messages, stuff like that. Yes, sir. Um, you were involved in the, the, the review of Mr. Adelson's iCloud information, correct? I did, the, I did um, the processing of it and created the report for it, yes, sir. In your review, and in your prior testimony with respect to that iCloud data, did you come across a phone number, 954-581-1747? Yes, sir, I believe I did. And that was in Charles Adelson's iCloud data? Yes, sir, I believe so. Was it saved under the name Eco-Friendly Shop? Yes, sir. Did you happen to find that same phone number in the download of Sigfredo Garcia's phone? Yes, sir. And what was it saved under? I'll give you one moment and I'll pull it. Could you give me the number one more time, please? 954 yes, 581 1747. Sully Mech, I believe. Do you know who Sully Mech or Eco-Friendly Shop is? No, sir, I do not. Do you know if any investigation was done into that phone number, the 954-581-1747 number? I don't. One brief moment, John. Yeah. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank Cross you. Cross-examination. No, sir.
Okay, you can relate to Whitney? Yes, please. Okay. All right, you're free to go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Defense may call its next witness. Your Honor, I'm going to walk out and get him. It's, All going, right. to be, it's going to be Craig Eisen. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. We are going to swear you in again. Sure. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. You may proceed. Hello again, Mr. Eisen. Hello. <coughs> investigator, or retired investigator. Yes, sir. I want to, I want to point in reference to Ms. Mag Vanwa. Uh, when you testified for the government, you talked about circumstantial evidence. You remember that? I, yes. I, All right. Now, vaguely, one of one of the piece one of the pieces of circumstantial evidence um, was the cash deposits. Correct. Yes. All right. And the the theory was that it was payment <coughs> for a murder, right? Yes. You would agree with me that you can't say the source. Correct. And this is in relation to her work at nightclubs. You can't say the source because there was not a full investigation of the nightclubs, correct? Correct. By you, there was actually zero investigation. Correct. And there's no reason why you didn't investigate. It was just an oversight. Correct. And you would agree with me, too, that you made many trips to South Florida for other investigative purposes. I don't know how you define many, but we were down there a number of times. Do you know who Juan Marcos Vega is? I've heard this name during the state's case that you provided. I do not know him. Did you ever meet with him? No. Is it your understanding that at the time he was a Latin King probationer? I, I don't know him. I don't know have any background on him. All right. Now you do know who Investigator Jason Newland is, correct? Yes. Works with the so you were an investigator for Tallahassee Police Department. Jason Newland is an investigator that is law enforcement but works for their office. Yes. You received no information from him with respect to any information that Juan Marcos Vega had, right? I recall that there was a communication between myself and Newland about someone in Central Florida. I do not recall the name. Um, and to my understanding, whatever he found out, I don't have knowledge of. Now, based on whatever information investigator Newland gives to you, that would dictate what work you do, right? Mm. Let me ask that a different way. Okay. If he doesn't tell you that there's somebody that has potential information about the case, it's natural that you're not going to investigate it, right? I missed half of that. Are you saying that I would not investigate if someone told me there's something pertaining to the case? I'll back up and I'll ask that. Okay. So Jason Newland doesn't tell you about the importance of Juan Marcos Vega. 
is it is it then expected that you're not going to investigate something that's not important? Like I said, there was somebody in Central Florida. I just recall that. I don't know if that was the name, and and I did not do anything as far as investigating this person you're talking about, this Vega. If you were told it was important, you would have investigated. Yes. All right. That's the way that I should ask. Okay. Now, on your direct exam, on your redirect examination, and I wasn't able to get up and, and ask you more questions. Uh, you talked about uh, Miss McBann was alleged flight, right? There was there was testimony to flight. Yes. All right. On cross examination, I asked you, and I went through a series of things like you know the PC affidavits, twenty twenty special, and you agreed with me that she didn't flee. And she did not flee the county, flee the country, or anything like that. What she did was she moved, right? Yes, I, from my understanding, she moved to her brother's home. And this someplace. is this is subsequent to Sigfredo Garcia, the the father of her children, being arrested, right? Correct. All right, so he gets arrested. She moves in with her brother, right? I I don't know for a fact she moved in with her brother, but I knew it was somewhere in South Broward County. Okay, just want to make sure we're not talking about she fled the state, fled law enforcement, because the word flee, you would agree with me, has a, a connotation to it. Yeah, it, it could be a lot of different things. I mean, fleeing from one house to another house next door, fleeing three miles down the road, fleeing halfway across the country. To say that she packed up and never returned wouldn't be accurate of what happened. She packed up and moved to another address, right? That's correct. Now, May 2016, you went to that house, right? May of 2016, yes. You went to the first house that you moved out of. I, I went to the house on 122nd Street. That's Now, this is the same day that other law enforcement are out speaking to Secreto Garcia, correct? Correct. Sorry about that. You so at the same time, law enforcement is speaking to Sigfredo Garcia, correct? Yes. You and a Miami Beach Police Department detective go to Captain McDaniel's house and you knock on the door. Yes. Were you in uniform? No. What were you wearing? Uh, civilian clothing with a uh, Tallahassee Police Department badge displayed on my belt, clearly visible. You would agree with me that you didn't do anything letting her know that you were there for her? Specifically for her, no. I just know that I was told because of the wire, the phone, that she was stating to a third party that the police are out front. So you would agree with me that when you're knocking on the door, she doesn't know that you are there to speak to her? Specifically to her, no. We're looking for a response at the door. Now, at the same time, and you just referenced those those intercepts. At the same time on those intercepts, she knows that Sigfredo Garcia is getting questioned by the FBI, right? Yes. Let's not go to our last topic. Luis Rivera. October 4, 2016, uh, his statement is recorded, correct? Yes. September 30th, 2016. You agree it was not recorded, but it could have? Yes. And should have. I'm not going to say that. That was instructed by the state attorney's office not to record it. This office? Yes. What did Luis Rivera tell you about when he found out it was going to be a murder? When they were en route on the first trip in June, the first attempt. When they were on the way to Tallahassee from Miami. All right. Now, investigator, you, you wrote a report summarizing what he told you on September 30th, right? Yes. Do you have that report with it? Not right here. Did he not tell you, did you not write, that he told you it was before the June trip, before leaving Miami? I recall that the original trip was for a robbery because he specifically states that's his specialty. He robs drug dealers. 
investigator would refresh your recollection to take a look at the report sure. as to what he told you about when he learned. Your Honor, if I may approach. Yeah. Reviewed it. That refresh your recollection? Yes. He told you that he learned about it before the June trip, before leaving Miami, correct? It's during departure, the date of departure is when he learned it was a murder. If I could approach him? Yeah. Investigator, you would agree with me that if we had the recording, it would be the best way to interpret his words, correct? <laughs> yes. And what you wrote was not on the way. What you wrote was, once the departure date arrived, June 2014, Garcia told Rivera it was actually a murder he was hired to do and wanted Rivera to commit the homicide. Rivera was promised 30000 to commit the murder. After leaving Miami en route to Tallahassee, Garcia provided more information. That's what I wrote, and that's what was that was the way I understood it. And you agree with me that what you didn't write was that it was on the way to Tallahassee that he was told it was going to be a murder. It says on the date of departure. I, you can interpret that as being driving on the date of departure, or we haven't left yet and we're talking about it in the driveway. Who did he say? Who did he say did the hiring for the murder? Rivera. Rivera stated it was a mother that wanted her kids in South Florida. He said that it was Wendy that did the hiring, correct? I don't know if it was specifically Wendy. I remember it was a mother, a woman. Would it? Sure. Your Honor, if I could approach yeah. page three. Okay. Told you Wendy did the hiring, correct? Eventually he uttered the name Wendy, yes. All right. Now he also told you on the June trip that Garcia drove the whole trip, right? Yes. Emphasis on the word whole trip. Or two words, whole trip. <laughs> yes. I'm showing you incidentally in case they would buy. Whole trip. You know what I can show you, right? Yes. The one I can show Speeding ticket. Now, he also told you that on this first trip, the June trip, that he never saw Professor Mark L, correct? Is that the right one? No, it's not. Citation. You'd agree with me, though, that there, we all have paperwork over here. You'd agree with me that there is a citation for Mr. Vance, correct? Yes. That citation would mean the obvious, which is that Louis Rivera was actually driving, correct? Yes. 
Now, the other question, I don't believe he gave an answer, that he stated he never saw Professor Markell in the first trip. If you don't remember, no, we can... I'm, I'm sorry. Just... I believe that's accurate. He also tells you that on the murder trip, the July trip, that there was one gun brought, right? Yes. Not two. Correct. Next, with respect to the call after the murder by Sigfredo Garcia to Captain McVanwa, he originally told you that Garcia told him what was said. Yes. And then he changed it to he overheard. Yes. Nowhere in the September 30th statement did he say that there was a separate third trip between King Anthony and Sigfredo Garcia, right? No mention of that. No. The morning of July 19th, he told you he was at a barber shop? Yes. That Katie called him? Yes. You reviewed the call detail records. Luis Rivera actually called Katie, right? I believe so, if I remember right, yes. There was no mention ever by Luis Rivera in that statement or any other ones that on that morning, everybody apparently had burner phones. I believe Garcia's phone had already been disposed of, if that's okay. what you're asking. I'm going to get laser focused with this one. Good. September 30th, 2016, did Luis Rivera tell you that Captain McBanwa had a burner phone? I don't recall that. No, because you would have written it in your report. Right. right. You had always worked under the theory that Luis Rivera had his 8153 phone on him and that Miss McBanwa had her 1312 phone number. Yes. Luis Rivera never told you that he gave that 8153 phone to King Anthony to go do an errand for him, right? To go do? To go pick somebody up. He never said that to you, no. right? One brief moment, Your Honor. Yeah. Your Honor, if I can approach the street to the office, I got one final question. Mr. Eisen, I just want to confirm on the the day that Ms. McDaniel was arrested, when Ms. Kawas was asking you for a copy of the arrest warrant, your testimony is that you didn't have it and you couldn't provide it, right? I didn't have a hard copy, a paper version. I could have obtained an electronic version, but I did not have it with me at the time. I didn't have a paper copy with me. So you, you had it in email, right? I could have gotten it in email from Tallahassee. It could you, have been sent. You didn't already have it from Investigator Bennett? I may have. I mean, the, the warrant was already in the NCIC, FCIC system. It had already been entered about, in the computer system. What we're talking about is you providing it to Ms. Kawas. When she we never me. met. We never met to provide her anything. I was expecting her to call me after she met with her client at the Broward, Maine jail. Never heard anything back about that. Mr. Eisen, you would agree that on that day you're text messaging back and forth, you're talking on cell phones back and forth, right? Yes. You don't have to meet in person to send somebody an email, right? No. You could have emailed it to her. <laughs> it was never requested. I didn't know. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination. specifically mentioned to the defendant at the time of her arrest that we were looking to do a controlled call to Charlie Adelson? No, that was not mentioned. You were asked about a few things in your report. I wanted to ask you again about one was this issue about did Rivera tell you that he learned on the first trip that it was going to be you were asked to read the couple lines of your report were read to you, omitting this first line. Could you read yes. the highlighted portion? Okay. No, I'm good. <laughs> I need readers. It's nothing to shame about. Go ahead. No. What it allowed? Yeah. Is it objection? Is the witness refreshing or just reading the no, document? No, sir. He's reading the complete portion of the report that he was asked about in part. 
on All right, I'm going to allow it. Correct. If you read it out okay. loud, I'm going to allow it. So you can read the first the sentence, which is before what was read. If you can cipher that. Okay. Garcia initially told Rivera about a high dollar robbery he wanted to do with Rivera in Tallahassee. Once the, the, the departure date arrived, June 2014, Garcia told Rivera it was actually a murder he was hired to do and wanted Rivera to commit the homicide. And we're also asked about Here, Wendy, does it say the name Wendy? Did he say, did, did Rivera indicate that he knew the name Wendy initially? No. So first he knew it was a lady. Right. And then what? Yeah. Yeah. During more discussion with Garcia, while waiting to see the target, Rivera learned the ex-wife's name quotation, Wendy, in quotation, who Garcia said hired Katie to have her ex-husband killed. You were asked about the, the, you know, not recording the first interview. Was there, you documented the first interview in this report, yes. right? Okay, so if there was anything inconsistent with Rivera's testimony between this first report and the recorded interviews later, you would have documented that, Hold right? on a second. Objection, speculation. Overruled. Yes. That's the purpose of a police report. Yes. Document what's said, what, what happens, what you observe, what you learn. Correct. All right. I want to ask you about what happened when you went to interview Catherine Magdanawa. I know we've kind of beaten this to death, but you attempted to interview her, and at, on that day, that's the day she left that apartment, right? Yes. So she packed up and left the apartment the day of the interview attempt. The interview attempt at her home when I knocked on the door and she did not respond, yes. And she did not return to that apartment? Not to my knowledge. Never stayed there again? No. And after she left that apartment, police had a difficult time tracking her. We didn't know where she was staying, right? Correct. All right. In reference to Rivera and the speeding ticket, Rivera initially and really still maintains what about the speeding ticket? What what was his recollection of the speeding ticket? He he remembers it that the ticket was um, given to him on the second trip when he was driving. Well, he he got a ticket. In the Prius, right? Maybe I'm getting it confused. Let's find that. Yeah. Sixty-five. Alright, so what is the actual date of the case? And what vehicle was it in? The citation was issued on June 4th, 2014. 9.12 a.m. to Luis Rivera. Um, the car is listed as a 2011 Hyundai four-door. All right, so it was the first trip that he got a ticket. Yes. Okay, but he believed it was the second trip he got a ticket. Yes, he's All maintained right. that. I've never corrected him. Okay, he thought he got a ticket in the Prius, but it was actually the, the Hyundai. Yes. Okay. So was the fact that he got a ticket in the Hyundai something that had been documented in police reports and provided in discovery? Yes. All right. So if 
Rivera was studying the reports to memorize them and regurgitate them, he would know that he got the ticket on the first trip. Yes. Okay, but his memory was that it was Prius in the second trip. Correct. All right. Yes. Nothing further, Judge. Redirect. So R Rivera claims that, that <laughs> Wendy hired Katie, right? That was your testimony, right? That that, and, and I'll read it back. Garcia said, "This is Rivera saying it." Garcia said, "Garcia said hired Katie to have her ex-husband killed." So Wendy, who Garcia said, I'm sorry, this I've got to read your words here again. Wendy, who Garcia said hired Katie to have her ex-husband killed. That's what you wrote, right? Can I look at it again? Yeah. Before I do that, you would agree with me that that it would be easier for us to have a recording than you trying to interpret your own words. We could just directly Objection, in asked and answered. That's asked and answered several times. Okay, can we repeat the question now, please? What you wrote about what Rivera said is that Garcia said Wendy hired Katie, right? Yes. Has Wendy been arrested? No. Nothing further. All right. Um, whose item is this? Whose report is this? It's my report. I'm figuring he's going to give it to me when he's getting off the stand. Okay. All right. Uh, you are excused. Um, you might be subject to recall. So just go under the rule. Okay. Thank just you. Go under the rule. Thank you. The bench may call its next witness. <coughs> Brief moment, John. Defense calls Jason Newland. All right, Jason Newland, please. Are you going to get him, or can somebody at your table assist I'm you? I'm thinking that Miss Kappelman, because I don't think he's waiting outside. Let's make sure he's just not going to come and wait outside the doors either. He's on his way, Ms. Kaplan. He's going to come in. Yeah. All right. Good morning. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand and respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I swear. Have a seat. You are on permission to treat me as an adverse witness. Uh, you may. Well, I get organized. If you can introduce yourself to the jury, please. My name is Jason Newland, J A S O N N E W L I N. <coughs> I'm an investigator with the state attorney's office here in Tallahassee. If you could explain what being an investigator with the state attorney's office here in Tallahassee means. Uh, assist the prosecution with follow-up investigation, piecing cases together. Um, you know, one of the ways to describe it is law enforcement puts the puzzle together and we try to kind of put the glue in it. 
your your law enforcement, correct? Yes. You have a badge. Yes. Carry a gun. Yes. But you you work closely with Miss Catman, correct? We are employed in the same office. Yes. And you work closely with her. You work directly with her in cases. Yes. All right. Y'all are a team. Yes. Now, you'd agree with me that part of your work is doing investigation, correct? Correct. But one of the other tasks that you do that you receive from other law enforcement, their reports, their evidence, and you organize it, correct? Some of it, yes. So in this case, uh, you know, TPD's involved. They're producing reports from their investigation. They're providing it over to you to the state attorney's office, right? Correct. And the reason why they're doing that is because you have an obligation, your office, to give it over to the defense. That's correct. And that includes all defendants, right? All are entitled to what's called discovery. Yes. Uh, Louis Rivera was entitled to that discovery, correct? That's correct. And your understanding of the rules that apply to discovery that you have to give it with in a timely fashion. That's correct. So if somebody's arrested, you know, within within weeks, items have to start being given over. It's not something that you, you know, a report is drafted and years later it's given over. No, it's generally within weeks. Same thing applied in this case to the, the reports that were authored by the FBI, correct? That's correct. You've also reviewed these reports because at the same time you're investigating things, right? Many of them. And you would agree with me that these reports were detailed? Uh, most of them, yes. In July of 2016, right after Luis Rivera is arrested, uh, Investigator Isom does a 30-plus page report that's very detailed. I, he wrote a 30-plus page report. I'm not sure when it was actually completed. Do you believe that you've reviewed that report? Oh, I would have looked at it, yes. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at the report? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to ask the question again, Your Honor, if I could retrieve. Yes. <coughs> In late July of 2016, did Investigator Isom author a 31-page report? Yes, he did. And was that report detailed? It was fairly detailed, yes. Those 31 pages, you would agree with me that it's it's basically single-spaced narrative. It is. Well, there's at least a page or two of his information, but the rest of it's the report, correct? Fair enough. So you've got some you know, biographical information, page one correct. and two. And of course, there's breaks in between paragraphs, but it's a lot of words in the remaining 20 plus pages, correct? It is. And it lays out the government's theory as to the what happened in this case, correct? I do believe most of it is in there, yes. All right. It, it, it basically talks about the theory that Kathy McBann was somehow in the middle, right? <laughs> I don't know the last time I read that one, so it, it, it may. Now, in this report and in other reports, you'll agree with me that it had loose information, not the detail that Sergeant Corbett. Actually, let me withdraw that question. I'll ask a different one. You as an investigator for their office, you're allowed to sit in during the trial, right? Correct. The rule of sequestration doesn't apply to you. You're the only witness that that doesn't apply to. That's correct. So you've seen some of the testimony in the case. Some of it, yes. So Sergeant Corbett from the Technical Operations Unit, he gives very detailed testimony about cell phone communications, right? Yes. But in these initial reports, it was not as detailed about the cell phone communication. It just, just talked about contact in between people. Uh, Sergeant Corbett, I don't even know if he writes reports. So this is let me break that down for you. You've got TPD, you've got Investigator Isom, you've got Agent Sanford. They're communicating and getting information from Sergeant Corbett, correct? There is some of that, yes. And there's some rudimentary cell phone data that they put into their own reports about the communications on, on yes, significant days, correct? Correct. 
but it lacked all the detail that Sergeant Corbett gives us in his testimony. That's correct. And again, those items are going over to Rivera. They should be, right? Police reports? Police reports go to Rivera. Like I said, Sar I don't know that Sergeant Corbett even writes a report. We don't have one. Yeah, I don't. Let, let, let's do go it. through this and it'll make a little bit more sense. You, you receive the, these items, these reports from Investigator Isom, from Agent Sanford. You organize them, right? Correct. And then you, you are involved in the process of providing them over to the defense shortly after arrest, correct? Correct. And that's what we were talking about, that there's a rule, the rule of discovery, that you have to do that. Correct. Rivera is arrested May of 2016? No. June. Early June? Correct. You'd agree with me that there's no reason to believe that discovery wasn't timely provided in the month of June and July? No, discovery was provided in that case. All right. And Rivera, then months later, he implicates Catherine McBano in September of 2016. That is the, that is one of the proffers, yes. You would agree that this would allow him the time to review, either himself or with his attorneys, digest and formulate his own theory? That would be between he and his attorneys. Let's talk about the media in this case. You'd agree with me that it was extensive. Yes. There was a 2020 special in September of 2016. There's something along those lines, yes. Well, you know it's something along those lines because yeah. you appeared in it, right? Not in 2020, no. No, no, no. Not the year 2020, the show 2020. No. W was there another one? Which one did you <laughs> did you get interviewed on? That was the Dateline one. Okay, so you get interviewed by Dateline. You'd agree with me that, that all of these, these shows, it's also discussing the government's theory. It, yes, it was discussed, yes. Ms. Kappelman even did an interview talking about it, right? Yes. You've been to the jails, right? Oh, yeah. They have telephones there? They do. They have television? Some do. They have email? Some are getting email. Some have had email, yes. What we're getting at is Luis Rivera wouldn't be cut off to the outside world. Where Lewis Rivera was, I don't even know if they have email yet. Jefferson County is still a little bit behind. Right, I think so they just got text recently and they didn't even know they had it. We're talking about that's when he's cooperating. He's transferred to Jefferson County for safety, right? He was transferred pretty early on to Jefferson County. Okay, but before that, he was in Leon County. He was. All right. And you also know, because you guys requested often, that you can get an inmate's phone calls, right? Yes. And you've gotten them before from Jefferson County. Yes, we have. So he would have access to people in the outside world to discuss whatever it is that's going on in the media, right? Yes, he would. And you don't know whether they have television over there or not, or do they? I don't know about Jefferson County. You don't know, but most jails do have TV, right? They, most do that I've been in, yes. Leon County, where he was for a period of time, they, they have TV, right? They do have TVs there, yes. Let's talk about... Luis Rivera and uh, the interviews. You were you were present for these interviews, correct? I was in the same building. I was not in the room with him. Okay, but uh, all right. So th there are meetings, and we're not saying that you're in the room. We agree on that. But but you're present in the building, right? Correct. Now the purpose is to to let's back up here. Let's back up even more. You understand that there were meetings with Luis Rivera before you ever met with him, right? In May 27, uh, May 27, 2016 and June 3rd, 2016. Those were interviews done by Pat and Craig. And, and you said it perfectly. We're going to talk about the difference in between interviews and proffers. Okay, so let's talk about the interviews first. Present for the first time on May 27, 2016, when there was a meeting with Luis Rivera. You weren't there, right? No. But your understanding is that Agent Patrick Sanford and former investigator Craig Isom were there? Yes. All right. So they go into a jail. They go into Coleman down in South Florida, right? That's correct. And the purpose of this, this interview, it's to investigate, right? That's correct. And that's different than a proffer. We'll get to that in a minute. So they're going in there to find out information to investigate it. Right? Yes. All right. So May 27, 2016, you're not present. Sanford and Isom, you'd agree with me that it's recorded? 
That one was recorded, yes. And that Luis Rivera denied any involvement. Objection. Calls for speculation and not true. Um, if you know, you can answer. I don't know which interview it was where he did not say he was not involved, but he said you're talking to the wrong person. Okay, so in one of them, either the May 27, 2016, and Your Honor, and I asked you for the government to not make speaking objections. All right, just make your objection. That wasn't a speaking objection. So May 27, I'm oh, sorry, Your Honor. May 27, 2016, it's recorded though, right? It is. June 3rd, 2016, you're not present for that one either? No. Again, at Sanford and Isom? I believe it was, I know it was at least Pat. I'm not sure about Isom. It's recorded? Should have been, yes. He didn't confess to being a murderer? No, he didn't. In confess. either of those? No. Now, a proffer is different, right? Correct. What is the what is the purpose of a proffer? It's the opportunity for an individual to tell the truth, um, and anything they say that incriminates themselves can't be used against them at that point in time. It's a little bit more than that, right? You're evaluating the information that's being given, right? Um, to figure out if you're going to make a deal. No, that's... That's kind of chicken and egg situation. It's like you get you try to figure out where you're going to go with the proffer before you come up with any idea with the proffer. Sometimes sometimes we have the deal on the table and sometimes we don't. It just it depends on how it's working. OK, so let, let's back up a little bit in, in these proffers. You're going to have law enforcement present, right? Yes. You, it could be yourself. It could be Miss Kaplan. Yes. But you're also going to have whoever it is that you're speaking to, their attorneys. We're going to have the inmate. The inmate's attorneys the are going to be there as well, too, for a proffer. Correct. So it's different. When you do the interview, it's investigation. The attorneys can be there. But in this situation, they weren't. For the proffer, you've got all the people involved talking, right? Correct. Now, when a proffer happens, it's with the hopes of getting to a point of coming to a deal, right? That's sort of the whole point of the proffer. We want to see, does this, does this guy or girl have information that we can use? And then we'll figure out if we want to give a deal. But it's, it's moving towards coming to a cooperation, correct? Um, it, in some cases, it is. In others, again, we'll have the deal already made. And then the proffer is conducted. In this case, it was, right? The deal already made? No, no, no. When you met with him uh, for these proffers, it was with the hopes of coming to a deal. And these, from what I recall, we were, um, there was discussions about the plea negotiations. There was discussions about what he had to offer and the attorneys were just back and forth. That's trying to work out a deal, right? That's correct. Right. So August 8th, 2016, you were present for this, for August. a proffer with Luis yes. Rivera, correct? Uh, <laughs> so that's a little bit different than a proffer. Um, that situation was us in a room, myself in Georgia, and I don't know if any others. And then the defense attorney and that entire team was in a whole nother room. We never saw Rivera that day. We never crossed paths with him. The attorneys would go back and forth and tell us, this is what he can provide to you. And that's the extent of that one. And we agree on that. Okay. We agree. So, and I just want to get who was there. You were there? I, I know I was there. I know Ms. Georgia Catherine was there. there. Yes. One of the Collinses was there. Had to be one of the Collinses because they were doing the back and forth. And for the jury, the Collinses, the father and son team, represented Luis Rivera. Correct. They were his defense team. And of course, Luis Rivera is there. Yes. And Luis Rivera is in a room, and his attorney would leave that room, give you what he's saying. Then you'd say something, and he'd go back. So basically, one of the Collinses right. was going back and forth, like a tennis match with information. Correct. Now, you remember some of the details of the information that you were provided, correct? Uh, some of them, yes. And one of the pieces of information that you received was about the gun, right? Yes. That it was thrown near a body of water and a bridge located on Interstate 10 between Tallahassee and the Interstate 75 corridor. Yes, two bridges, body of water, I-10, yeah. You also remember how the information was given to Mr. Rivera that giving Garcia wouldn't get him any deal. No. You would agree with me that there was no mention of Katie that day. I would not agree with you. Let me 
brief moment, Your Honor. Yeah. Do you remember? I, I know what you're going to ask me. So. What am I going to ask you? Did I recall? You don't recall whether he ever said Katie's name that day. I do not specifically recall that, but I, I can't say that he didn't say it either. You would agree with me that if he were to have implicated somebody else, the person who literally has been at the center of your theory since the beginning, that you would have remembered that. I can tell you that the an agreement was not made on the 8th, and that stemmed from the agreement on a sentence. And when we left that day, there was nothing I could use. All right. No report. No. There's nothing to document. So to back up here to Garcia for a moment, you would agree with me that the evidence against Garcia was strong? You already had Garcia in him. custody? Yes. The evidence against him was equally strong, if not stronger, than the evidence against Rivera? Yes. Safe to say you did not need Rivera to flip against Garcia. I mean, it always helps. But you wanted to further your case to get Rivera to cooperate against Ms. McBanner, right? Literally, we're trying to get to the bottom of the case. All right. So we're going to come back to what you wanted, but you would agree with me that no deal was struck that day? That's correct. If Luis Rivera had said Catherine McBanwell was involved on August 8th on that day, you would have gone and arrested her. No, they, no, no. The, <laughs> the agreement was the time of uh, the term of prison was not agreed upon, and he was not going to provide that information to us directly. At the time we had it, it was literally coming from his attorneys. I never got it from Rivera himself. No deal was struck. Rivera returned to his cell. Correct. With his thoughts. Correct. And his discovery. Correct. Well, I don't know what he had as far as discovery is. But you have no reason to believe that he didn't have it. I, he may have had some paper documents, but CDs, he wouldn't have had any of those. These reports that, that lay out the narrative, are they on CD or printed? Those are printed. September 30th, 2016. That, that is when the next proffer happens, right? Correct. Now, the reason why it happens on September 30th is because on September 29, 2016, your office and Luis Rivera's team come to an agreement, right? I don't know the answer to that. September 29, 2016, you had another meeting with the same fashion with Ms. Kappelman, one of the Collinses, Mr. Rivera, where the attorney's going back and forth. Right? I, I truly don't remember that one. It Possibly. There's no recording of it. There's no report. No. Now, with respect to these two meetings, Luis Rivera, he never said anything about the involvement of Anthony Ortiz, a.k.a. King Anthony. He mentioned Anthony Ortiz. I do not remember when that occurred. Right. I know I've heard the name. Investigated no one. Rivera never said that Anthony Ortiz made a third trip with Secreto Garcia, right? At some point in the last six years, he said, I believe Garcia made a prior trip to Tallahassee with Hebero because he knew where he was going. He drove around Tallahassee like he'd been here before. And, and you know that in the past years, six years, he made that statement. He made it in deposition when he slipped up because you've reviewed that deposition. I do not know when that statement was made. I, I don't recall. I just know that statement was made. All right. And... Around the September 29th, September 30th, 2016 time frame, he, he, he does what y'all had hoped and he names Katie, right? It's not what we would hope. He told the truth. Okay. But in September 29th, September 30th, he names Katie, correct? And I know September 30th, yes, because that was the, an official proffer. And he gets his deal. I, I know paperwork was signed. Um, I think he pled a few days later. And Katie was arrested, in fact, the following day, October 1st, 2016. That's correct. Investigator Newell, what evidence do you have that Rivera didn't untruthfully name Katie to get a deal? I mean, this, there's a whole lot of evidence to that. 
that this guy isn't lying and made things up based on the reports that were provided over to him. What evidence do you have that he is not lying? <laughs> Talking to him, sitting in rooms with him, he's... He, you. Do you think that somebody becomes the boss of the Latin Kings by being stupid? Street smart. And what do you think is needed to get a deal in a criminal murder case? Street smarts or the aptitude to score perfect on the, on the SATs? I would say he listened to his attorney's advice. All right. Now, the, the, the meeting on September 30th, 2016, um, that could have been recorded, correct? Could have been, yes. Should have been recorded. Wasn't my decision. The, the, our determination of the evolution of Luis Rivera's statements is limited by, by your memory and the memory of other law enforcement, right? Uh, you had Craig and Pat. And, and you then, agreed with me that I was the, in another room. That it's limited because we're only going based on people's memory. I would agree that what was written in the report is what you have. That we wouldn't have that problem with memories if we had a recording, right? No, that's correct. But Rivera's testimony potentially could have a problem because we could show the conflicts in his different statements. That's correct. And this exactly is precisely why you don't record these initial meetings, right? No. So that we can't show the conflicts between the initial rehearsal statements and the eventual showcase, the final statement. That wasn't my decision, and but no, I would not say that's why. Your Honor, this would be a good time to break if you want to take the morning break and we can talk to Trooper Downing. Well, we need to have cross-examination. Oh, no, no. It's a good time to break. I'm roughly halfway through. All right. Um, okay, we'll break for 15 minutes, and uh, we'll then come back and continue with the testimony. Please have discussions amongst yourselves, and uh, we'll see you back in 15 minutes, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right, please be seated. Um, refresh my recollection in regards to Mr. Fitzpatrick. What, he is who? He is a friend, our former friend, of Charles Edmonton, the, the Ms. Gawas's uh, witness to be named if I can better remember. All right, so. He was listed by the state, I think, in 2021, 20, 20, 20, and we took his depot, and we've now adopted him as our witness. All right, so you anticipate his testimony to be approximately what? With cross, I'm depending with the state cross, I don't think it would take more than an hour. And I'm being generous, Judge. I mean, I don't think my direct is going to be more than an hour. All right, hour. okay. Um, so when uh, we come back in then, um, all right, well, we'll take another break then before I inquire of the defendant. Yes, um, and, and but I expect that these two witnesses, uh, I expect that all of these witnesses will be completed uh, prior to we break for lunch. Yes, sir. But then when we send the jury out, uh, I'll have a discussion with Ms. Magbanoa. So I expect at that time the decision to be made. I'm not going to wait until after lunch. That's what I was going to request, Your Honor, if I could just have that. No, lunch we've had plenty of time, and you'll have the testimony, and I'm going to make my inquiry at that time so that we know where we're headed. Okay, so I'm going to need to know at that time. Okay. I did have one thing. I'm not going to have much cross for Mr. Fitzpatrick, but I was just looking through the depo. In his depo, there's a lot of statements about what Charlie Davis has told him. Um, I, I would object to hearsay for him to say it, so I'm not sure if that's necessary. I'm going to wait until I hear the testimony, make an objection if you need to. Okay, uh, we'll be in recess for 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Can you make Gotcha. 
All right, Deputy, would you please bring the jury in? Please be seated. We're ready to continue with the testimony. Mr. Okay. DeCoast. Investigator, <laughs> you would agree with me that the, the goal was to get Catherine McVanwa to cooperate against Charles Adelson? Yes, there have been attempts to do so. All right. Now, law enforcement questions for you that I've asked a lot of law enforcement. The jury's heard it. You've probably heard it. You'd agree with me that, that your job as law enforcement is to objectively investigate? Objectively? Yes. Correct. To present the evidence, both the good and the bad. Yes. Subjectively investigating a case would be a bad thing, right? That's correct. It could lead to a lopsided case, right? Could. Could lead to wrongful convictions. It could. All right. So let's go through some of the work. Now, in fairness to the jury to explain it, your investigation was less than that of law enforcement, other law enforcement, TPD and FBI, right? Yes, and it's kind of hard to say it this way, but some of what I would do is almost just pick up the trash that was left behind. That's a perfect segue to the next topic. You did some investigation about a gun, right? Yes. And you'd agree with me that a murder weapon is great for a murder case. Great piece of evidence. It is. On August 26th of 2016, you went down to the uh, Osceola River, right? I did. All right. And you were supported by uh, one of your investigators, Tully Sparkman. Correct. And uh, analyst Thomas Balboni, right? Correct. <clears throat> now, you already knew from your work on the case the type gun that was used to kill Professor Markell, right? I did. And you know guns, right? You have training in guns. I do. And when you were out there at Osceola River, you did find a gun, right? Yes, sir. But you knew right away that it was a different make and model. I did. But you still investigated it, correct? I, I did. You took pictures? Took photographs in place, yes. You you guys went down in, into, the, into the river. Did you guys have like waders on or boots? Just old shoes, but yeah, it's down into the mud underneath the bridge. <clears throat> you got in there. You did your work, right? Yes. And you, you impounded the gun, which means that you, you, you just can't take it. You have to bring it to the Madison County Sheriff's Office, right? We had Madison County meet us at the bridge and sign it over to us. A gun that the thought is this doesn't belong, but we're going to objectively investigate this gun, right? That's correct. And you then checked it out from Madison County and you brought it over to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Correct. We submitted it there. And you brought it there for testing, right? Correct. For ballistics, DNA, fingerprints? Anything they could do. <clears throat> now, you knew about this, or you went there, not knew about it because it was a different gun. You went to Osceola River because of what Luis Rivera told you from the meeting, right? Correct. You remember that, that he had given details. It was rather specific, near a body of water, Interstate 10 between Tallahassee and Interstate 75, right? He was pretty detailed in that. So I got to say, let me create, it wasn't from Louis Rivera. It came through his attorneys and okay. they were telling us that the gun should have been dumped within an hour after the homicide, somewhere on I-10, near two bridges, a body of water, and before I-75. So that's where I went looking. 
you re so you remember in in fairness given by his attorney you remember that detail being given correct but you can't remember whether katie was mentioned or not no i, I <laughs> can you say and i don't mean this to be attacking but can you say that you did the same level of objective investigation for evidence that that would hurt law enforcement's theory <clears throat> evidence that would hurt our theory correct i investigated almost everything that came to me that it, that i could try to do yeah so let's go through it the if you receive information that somebody wants to talk your involvement in this case you would send it to fbi or tpd right um i would always contact them prior to following through with any of the stuff we would get but yes December 15, 2016, you receive a letter from a woman, Jennifer Mosley, correct? Ooh, I do remember Jennifer Mosley. Do you remember the letter? I do not. Would it refresh your recollection and take a look at the letter? Yes. You are fine, May Pro. May. Investigator, I need to do two things here. First, I'm going to show you what's been pre marked as defense uh, 31A through O. You know what those are, right? Oh, yeah. That's the gun under the bridge. Those are photographs of the gun under the, under the bridge uh, at El Silver, right? That's correct. And you know that those are pictures because you were there when they were taken. That's correct. And those photos are in the same or substantially same condition they were in last time you saw them? Yes. Defense offers this to pre marked Defense 31A through O. Objection Any object relevance, Your Honor? Overruled. Be admitted as Defense 31A through O. All right, so take a look at that. Let me know if there's one question you have left. <coughs> It really doesn't. It doesn't refresh your recollection? Um, no. You remember receiving the letter, though, correct? We receive lots. Lots of, in, in fairness, Miss Mosley, she was an inmate, right? She was an inmate, yeah. All right. Now, understanding on a case like this that you get a lot of communications, at the point in time that you receive that letter, Lewis, that letter is received December 2016, right? Correct. That's after... Luis Rivera is cooperating and is your witness, correct? Yes. And it states that, that she has new information or confirmation of facts on Rivera. Right? Yeah, it just said she rode the van with him. And it just said she rode in the van with him. And has new information or confirmation of facts, quote unquote. Okay, yes. All right. Nobody ever met with Miss Mosley, correct? I didn't, not that I can recall, yeah. If somebody were to impeach Luis Rivera's testimony and show that there's contradictions, that would be bad for law enforcement's theory, correct? Somebody discredits Rivera. Yes, that would be bad. Your Honor, if I could approach. Yeah. Let's now talk about Facebook, Instagram, You smirk. You know what I'm going to ask. If you could, <laughs> what am I going to ask? I'll let you do it. All right. Thank you. So, in in at one point, Luis Rivera tells you this this tall tale that um, he posts a photo of an owl on Instagram, right? Yeah, Instagram was, or Facebook? Which one is it? You know? I, I believe it was Instagram at the time. All right. That he posts mm -hmm. a picture of an owl. That was yes. Not a line. No. Were you in the courtroom when he said no. that it was a line? I was not. Now, understanding, I, I'm going to trust that everybody in the courtroom knows this. Uh, is there a difference in between an owl and a line? There is. A big difference, right? There is. He previously said it was an owl. <laughs> now he says it's a lion. 
but there was something, whatever animal it is from the wild kingdom was posted on Instagram. Correct. And that apparently, uh, allegedly, Miss McVanwell called and, and told the Latin King boss, you take that down, right? Uh, that <clears> was, <throat> it was either a call to Garcia or a call to him, but yes, get that off the, yes, take that down. Now he tells you this after he's cooperated. This would have been in that September 30th, October 4th time range. Because, of okay. course, he's not confessing before and saying, hey, you know, all this stuff happened, right? right? So so he, he peppers in this detail of, you know, hey, this other thing happened where I posted on Instagram. Did anybody ever get the records from Facebook or Instagram? I do know we tried. Um, I know Instagram, just the amount of times I've had to get documentation from them, um, if you don't send a preservation letter within seven days of anything being removed, it's gone. And this proffer was two years later. So. Your, your understanding is that Facebook owns the Instagram, correct? They do now. And I don't know how long they've owned them. All right. You were able to get social media accounts for Secreto Garcia and Kathy McVanwell, right? Yes. All right. Yes. Now you're saying that there was an attempt to get from Instagram. Were there any warrants that were signed? There was nothing to sign a warrant for. Okay. Were any subpoenas sent to Facebook? We'd have those if a subpoena was sent, right? You'd have to give that to you, us. You would have had them, yes. Yes. Is the fact that I don't have that consistent with the fact that none were ever sent to Facebook? Or Instagram. It would be consistent with that, yes. Now, you'd agree with me that, you know, if he is telling the truth and there is a response showing that th this post that was taken down, you don't, it, 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 let me sidetrack for a second. You don't know the policy of what they retain on posts that are taken down, right? No, I, it, at Instagram, if you don't yeah. send a preservation letter within seven days, you're not getting it. That's not what we're talking about. Luis Rivera says that he took the post down, right? Right. You don't know whether Instagram maintains data of posts that take that are taken down, right? If you don't send in a preservation letter within seven days, you're not getting it. It's gone. All right. So it would have literally had to have been done before July 25th of 2014. But nothing was ever sent to try to collect it. Not to my knowledge. There was nothing to get. But we don't know until an attempt is made, correct? I guess you could say it that way. But let's talk about now your meetings with Luis Rivera. And, and I want to preface this. I'm not trying to insinuate that you told him what to say. Okay. Okay. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm saying is he's a very smart guy. All right. Street Luis smart. Rivera is <laughs> no, street smart. I'll give you. All right. Now we talked about that and I don't want to go things that were asked and answered. But again, this, you're understanding this man when he's still, before he's even a teenager, he, he's a gang member, right? It was pretty early. It was like 12 or 13. He before, was through an uncle. Before he can even have a license, he is the boss over 15, I, 16 years old. He's the boss of Miami for the Latin Kings. I don't know what age he became the, the, the right. boss, I guess you'd say. So now we'll get into the, the topic that we're talking about, your meetings with him. You'd agree with me that there's many times that he was transported from the jail over to your office here. And that you sat down and met with him to review his testimony. And again, I'm not saying that you told him what to say, but yeah. you reviewed the discovery and his testimony to help him testify again, right? Correct. And over the years, that's happened many times. Prior to appearances, yes. So in, in 2019, October 2019, multiple times he's transported. He would spend the day reviewing items and, and preparing to testify, correct? Uh, we had to review calls. Um, we had to review his prior testimony. But yes, there was, I, I recall one day. I don't know how many. All right. Let's go to the, the, the next name. And we're still on the topic of objectively versus subjectively investigating. Juan Marcos Vega. Okay. September 2016, you receive a letter from Imran Hussein, correct? Correct. And you also have a phone interview with Mr. Hussein. I do. Now, Mr. Hussein, unlike Ms. Mosley, gives you some very precise details, correct? He gave us details that were highly publicized details by that point. He gave us literally what almost all our headline 
from an article. He had nothing more than that. So we did basically what Louis Rivera did. No. Louis Rivera doesn't confirm many things that aren't known. Again, we don't say that Louis Rivera wasn't here for the murder, but with respect to Catherine McVan, well, Louis Rivera says things that are written all over the reports, right? He confirms the reports. And and your thought is that that his story fits the facts, not that he's fitting his story to the facts. He's not fitting his story to the facts now. But you have no evidence to say that that's not happening. Let's stay on Juan Marcos Vega. So Mr. Hussein, whether he got the information on, online or not, he's got information. You do uh, a phone interview with him, right? Correct. Now this one you find relevant enough to actually travel to South Florida to interview Juan Marcos Vega, right? This is kind of one where, like I said, I cleaned up the trash. All right. So September 22nd, 2016, you have a recorded interview with Juan Marcos Vega. Correct. And you'd agree with me that when you walk in there, one of the first things you say to him is, we believe someone has linked you to a case you know absolutely nothing about. That's correct. You'd agree with me that that was the wrong approach. Probably not the best. Because you're you're not finding out if this is legitimate information or not, correct? I did research prior to going to do that interview. I mean, I knew a lot of the case. This was 2016, so it was all very fresh. Um, and when Imran Hussein described who he described, he said Vega, and then he described him as shorter, round. Vega's 5'10 and not round. Rivera's short and round. Nothing was fitting other than what he got on the news. So you do know that Juan Marcos Vega was a co-defendant in Luis Rivera's 23 defendant in Rico indictment, correct? I do. And he was a probationer in the Latin Kings. I didn't know his status in the Kings, though. Right. Now, you didn't ask Imran Hussein clarifying questions of what he considered to be tall or short, correct? He described him specifically as 5'7 or shorter, I think. Okay, and sometimes yeah. descriptions are off by an inch or two, right? We'll have to agree to disagree on that one, but 5'10 and 5'7 are... Three inches apart. Yeah, but they're different. Did you show him a photo lineup? Imran? Yes. He's on the phone. So you never actually met with him in person? No. All right, so you immediately walk in and you make the decision, this isn't the guy, right? Vega? No, I didn't make that decision as I walked in, no. But you're telling me you knew it wasn't the guy, and right when you walk in on the recorded interview, you say, we believe somebody has linked you to a case you know absolutely nothing about, despite him that. clearly knowing Luis Rivera. He actually doesn't. He said, I met him because we got indicted in the same indictment. He goes, I didn't even know who he was until we all went down. He was a different Latin king in a different group, and they wrapped 23 of them in together over a couple counties, and he's like, I didn't know 90% of my co-defendants when I got indicted in this thing. That's what the convicted criminal told you, right? Yes. Doesn't mean it's the truth, right? Yep. You sat down once with Ms. McVanna, correct? I did. And it was by invitation of the defense, you and Ms. Kaplan went over to the Leon County Jail, and we said, ask her anything you want, right? Right. No immunity to ask any questions, correct? Ask questions, yes. And she told you she was not involved. That's right? correct. But you don't take her word for it. Nothing fit. All right. So staying on the topic with Juan Marcos Vega in bringing in Osceola River, when you went to Osceola River, you knew it wasn't the gun, but you still took 20 photos, impounded, went to FDLE for testing, brought another personnel, got down in the mud, right? Yes. Did you ever let Agent Sanford or invest, former investigator Isom know about this possible information from Juan Marcos Vega? Yes, that was actually, I mean, like I said, I would communicate with him and let him know, hey, we got another one. You want to handle or you want me to handle it? And generally when it came to ones that were pretty off base, I got stuck with. So is your testimony that they told you to go down there and do it and that there was a discussion no, about him? No, it was somebody's got to do it, so I'm going to do it because they weren't. 
what Imran Hussein tells you is this guy's got information about that, about Professor Markel's murder, right? No, Imran said he had information and that the guy Vega, what he was describing Vega was Tato. He was describing Luis Rivera to a T. Not, you never showed him a photo lineup, so it's your opinion he was talking about Luis Rivera, right? Everything he said about him was Luis Rivera. But there is the connection between Juan Marcos Vega and Luis Rivera by way of the Latin Kings, right? By way of a single indictment, yes. But their gang affiliation. Latin Kings, correct. Okay, so there's the indictment and there's the gang affiliation. One brief moment, John. Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross examination. So we went out to the Leon County Jail to meet with the defendant, and you were asked about that. Yes. How'd that work out? Not too good. It was a joke, right? It was. She, we were invited out there so that you know the defense could tell the jury we were invited out there. Pretty much. Okay. Objection, speculation, move to strike. Overruled. You were showed defense A through O pictures of a gun. Does that gun have anything to do with this case? No. Not related in any way to the murder we're here about? Nope. You were asked about the interviews that you were a part of in reference to Mr. Rivera. Did you or did anyone in your presence ever tell Mr. Rivera what he needed to say? No. Did anyone in your presence give him any information about a particular suspect he needed to give up. You need to give us Charlie, you need to give us Katie, you need to give us Garcia. No. Did we ever say that we needed him to do or say something in particular in order to get a plea bargain or a deal? No. Was there anything unethical that happened in your presence at any Rivera meeting? No. Was there anything unusual about the way the Rivera deal was handled? No. Were you aware of any Rivera statement that did not implicate Catherine Magvanoff? No. No further questions. Redirect. Briefly, Your Honor. Investigator, September 20th, 2019 was that meeting, correct? September 23rd was the following <coughs> Monday. It was a Friday afternoon. Which meeting are we talking about? The meeting uh, with Ms. Magvanoff that oh. Ms. Kaufman termed a joke. Yeah, that sounds uh, September, October, something like that. All right, so let's walk through this briefly. Friday afternoon, Ms. Kaplman contacts you and says, they're giving us an opportunity to speak right. to Ms. McBanner, right? Right. And there's no requirement of that, right? No. She doesn't have to speak to you at all? No. And you were notified because Ms. Kaplman wanted to have a witness there with her. That's correct. And both yourself and early evening on a Friday, ASA Kappelman and yourself went out to the Leon County Jail, right? Correct. I was there? Yes. This Ms. Coffs is there, Tara Coffs? Yes. yes. And Ms. McBannell? Yes. And this wasn't something that had been prepped for days, weeks, mm, like no. Luis Rivera. This was a, you want to talk to her? Let's go right now. That's correct. When witnesses speak like Luis Rivera, he signs paperwork that's immunity, right? That they're protected, that anything they say can't be used against them, right? That's part of the proper agreement, yes. And Luis Rivera had that every time he spoke to you. Not for the interviews, for the proffers. For, for the proffers, yes, at that point, and then he pled. Ms. McBanwa didn't request to have that protection when she met with law enforcement, correct? That would have been between you and Georgia. Uh, you don't you don't know that it was there, right? I don't know. And basically, what happened in that room is Miss Kowas and I sat back. Object to counsel testifying. 
Continue with the question. What happened in that meeting is that Ms. Kowas and I stepped back, right? Sort and, of. And let you and ASA Kaplman, for as long as you wanted to, for whatever questions you have, question Ms. Magbanla. You kept throwing hints that you had a piece of evidence that we missed and overlooked, and we knew what that piece was, and it there was no surprise to it, and so, yeah, it didn't go anywhere. Okay. That wasn't my question, though. My question was, we let law enforcement ask her whatever you want without any protection. <clears throat> that's correct. We didn't stop you. We just said, go ahead, ask away. No, that's correct. Not so that we could come in here and say that there was the opportunity so that you could finally try to get to the bottom of what happened here, right? The strategy behind it, I don't know. Ms. Catman said it was a joke. Was anybody laughing in that room? Nobody laughed in the room, no. Thank you, Honey. Nothing further. All right. You may step down. Thank you. Defense may call its next witness. All right. Is this Mr. Downing? No, this is Mr. Fitzpatrick. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Come up, please. Good morning. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. Okay. Please respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please have a seat. Speed up to that microphone and talk loudly into that, okay? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Fitzpatrick. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for the court reporter? Right. My name is Ryan Fitzpatrick, R Y A N F I T Z P A T R I C K. And what do you do for a living? I run a medical facility in Hypoluxo, Florida. Do you know someone by the name of Charles Adelfi? Yes, ma'am. How do you know him? Uh, I've known Charlie for many years. He was a former friend of mine and a former business partner of mine. And how long ago do you think, and you can approximate, how long have you known him? Like 2012, 11? Like 15 years. Okay. And when do you, if you remember, when did, when did you first meet? Uh, prior to moving to South Florida, uh, just through mutual friends. And from that time on, <coughs> you guys were really close, right? Yes, ma'am. So you know his family as well? Yes, ma'am. Have you spent a considerable amount of time with his family? Yes, ma'am, I have. So you know his mother, Donna? Yes, ma'am. Harvey? Yes, ma'am. And his sister, Wendy? Yes, ma'am. Do you know his brother, Robert? No, ma'am, I do not. Have you ever met him? No, ma'am. When you were ever around the Adelson family, did they talk about him a lot? No, ma'am. And how close would you describe Charles Adelson to his mother, Donna? Very close. Like, talk on the phone every day? Yes, ma'am. Multiple times a day? Probably, yes, ma'am. And how close was he to his sister, Wendy? I mean, very close. Was he protective of her? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever meet Wendy? Yes, ma'am. Do uh, you remember how many times you were hanging out around her? Multiple occasions. Okay. But, uh... The majority of the time that you knew her, was she living in Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. Well, no, she had come to South Florida at that point for the majority of the time, but I had know who she was and when she was in Tallahassee. Okay, so the, um, the majority of the time that you spent with her is after she relocated back to Miami after the death of her ex-husband. Yes, ma'am. After the murder of her ex-husband. Yes, ma'am. 
Did she ever talk to you about her divorce? No, ma'am. Did Charlie ever talk to you about her divorce? Maybe occasionally in passing, nothing that I recollect uh, of significance at all. Was there a type of tone or demeanor to him whenever he was referencing the divorce or Dan Markell? After the murder, yes. Okay. Before the murder, did... No, ma'am. Okay. No. After the murder, what was your what? How did Charles express his feelings towards Dan Markell? Did he one way or the other? If he didn't, he didn't. If he did, he did. Let us know. Uh, can you rephrase it? Let me make it easy. Did he ever talk badly about Dan Markell? Nobody talked good about Dan. Nobody talked to you about Dan. <laughs> Not in that family. Okay. Nobody and talked good you, about Dan. I said. Okay, so that's what I was gonna get to. How did you, because you've been around them, how did you get their, what was their feeling towards Dan Markell? I mean, I really didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it was insignificant to me at the time, mm -hmm. but, you know, I mean, you could tell it wasn't something, someone that they were fond of. Now, how would you describe, well, would you describe Charlie Adelson as of a marrying kind? Want to settle He's down never with my you. type, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I appreciate that, Mr. Patrick. <laughs> All right. So, but Charlie wasn't a one woman kind of girl, was he? When you no, guys are no ma'am. Okay. And you kind of laughed when you said that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, he would have different girls all the time. Yes, ma'am. Could you even keep track of them? No, ma'am. Would some of these girls, the ones you've seen, they overlap with each other, right? I imagine they did. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, as far as you knew, these all these women didn't know about each other. If you know, I don't. I don't think so, no, ma'am. Okay. And uh, you remember when he started dating Catherine, right? Vaguely, yes, ma'am. Just okay. because I would hear her name, Katie Cat, you know. That's how Charles would refer to her. Yes, ma'am. And your understanding of their relationship was this just one of the girls that Charles was seeing? To be honest, I really didn't pay a lot of attention to girls that he saw. Understandably. Just, it was just kind of like, okay, whatever. Just because it's another one and another one and another yes, one. You don't want to invest too much time in someone you're probably not going to know for too long. No, ma'am. All right. Now, would you describe Charlie as being someone who likes to be the center of attention? I guess you could describe him as that. Yes, ma'am. Can you describe for the jury as a friend how much he talks? When doesn't he talk? <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. Right. So, um, and isn't it true that part of the reason you don't speak to him is because you got sick of listening to him talk? It became overwhelming, yes, ma'am. And it's because he always puts himself as the center. It, it's always him, his problems, what's going on in his life, right? Yes, ma'am. Right. And is it an accurate description to say that he will repeat the same thing a hundred different times, a hundred different ways to prove his point? Yes, ma'am. All right. And has he ever, when he's trying to prove a point to you, presented different scenarios to try to prove his point? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And sometimes do you just agree with him because you give up? Yes, ma'am. You just want him to shut up, right? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, have you seen him use this technique to manipulate others? To myself. I mean, I've experienced it and do you feel that that's what he tries to do with his words is that he's a manipulator i mean i never thought of it as like that till later in our relationship but you can say that yes okay and you'd also describe him as being very very smart right brilliant yes brilliant is the word you've used can he read a situation very quickly and just react yes ma'am right. the wheels are always turning when it comes to him right yes ma'am now, were you best friends with him in July of 2014? We were, we were close friends. Okay, we I'll were, say close like, friends. We, we got closer as time went on. Okay, and then you had said earlier, just so we have a time frame for the jury, that you eventually have a falling out. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you remember what year that was? I mean, the COVID year that we, uh, I imagine it was 2018. Okay, perfect. Like June of 2018 or something around that time. All right. And we, I know it's an approximation, but the, the year is held. Yes, ma'am. So going back to around the time that Dan Markell was murdered, because that is July 
2014, and you said you guys were close friends, right? There's a bunch of you guys, right, that hung out. Yes, ma'am. Who was a group, basically? You, there's Clint Stevenson, right? Yes, ma'am. There's Darren Pike. Yes, ma'am. There's, am I leaving anyone? Charles? Yes, ma'am. Anyone else that is a, a close friend of that group? I mean, there was a lot, a large group okay. of friends. Yes, of, 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 of guys, right? Yes, ma'am. And whenever you guys, I mean, when this happened, that was a, a pretty big deal, right? <laughs> yes. Someone yes, that he knew, a family member, former family member, had been murdered. Yes, ma'am. That just doesn't happen every day, right? Not in my family. Now, when he was around you guys, did he ever say anything like, oh my God, you would not believe what happened to Wendy's husband? Never. Never said, did you guys hear this about Dan Martell? No, ma'am. You never heard him express that, right? No, ma'am. Did he, as far as you know, go up to Tallahassee to be with his sister when he was murdered? No, ma'am. Okay. Do you know if he's ever been to Tallahassee? No, ma'am. Did you find that strange that he just never spoke about the circumstances surrounding Wendy's ex-husband's murder? I think it was so hard to fathom and that it was a reality, I guess, that okay. I really didn't, it was just never brought up. So it was almost like it wasn't real. Okay. Even though obviously it is. And, and, and that's close to home as it relates to Charles Adelson. This is his sister's ex-husband. Yes, ma'am. The father of her two sons, his nephews. Right? Yes, ma'am. Right. Have you ever met them? Yes, ma'am. Now, isn't it true that when you were friends with Charlie, one of the ways that you would use to communicate with him and he communicated with you is by the use of WhatsApp? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Okay. Now, and he would use the WhatsApp to make phone calls to you on the phone. That's how you guys would talk. Voice calls on WhatsApp, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And... You knew that back then, I mean, Charlie even would talk to you a couple times a day, right? Yes, ma'am. All right. And so your records had WhatsApp. You don't know if WhatsApp would be reflected on call detail records, right? Well, the thought was that it, that it, it was encrypted communication. Mm -hmm. Would you describe Charles Adelson as a paranoid person in that way? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Like has all these cameras around his house? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and always thinking that, like, you know, he's always very cautious when he's talking on the phone. Yes, ma'am. And this was even before Dan Markell was murdered, right? I can't recall. I don't even think WhatsApp was out back then, but, I mean. It was, but. Uh, yeah. Um, But you don't, that's just the nature of who he was, kind of. That he's always kind of suspicious of everyone. Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, you remember meeting Catherine. And in passing, but no, I, I don't know Catherine personally at all. No, and the one time you had met, you had seen her at his house. I believe so, yes, ma'am. I mean, it's been so long. You do remember, though, Charles telling you that Sigfredo Garcia, the mother of her kids, had confronted him before, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You also remember him telling you something about a confrontation that involved Katie. Yes, ma'am. Do you remember? Just continue with your question. Yeah, okay, I'll just go to the next one. Get past this question. Okay, now, with that said, um, mm -hmm. do you know if Charles knew about the existence of Secreto Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Has Charles Adelson ever made payments to you in cash? Yes, ma'am. How did he package his money? Stapled. Describe for the jury how bills and where the staple would be. Usually it would separate $1,000 at a time. Uh, 10 one hundreds equals a thousand dollars and you would staple that okay and you just want staple like stacks of hundreds but it's 100 10 one hundred dollar bills yes ma'am per a thousand right yes ma'am and he's paid you that way before yes ma'am did you find that strange yeah yeah i mean yes ma'am and i mean if that was an odd way to have money you've never seen anyone ever done that with money yeah, before right now in your estimation 10 stacks of the thousands, it'd be the same as if it were 10 $1 bills, right? Because one, a $1 bill and a $100 bill are the same in diameter, width, and all of that, right? Correct. So if you just stack 10 of them together, it's pretty thin, right? Correct. And then you put 10 of those together, it's probably about that big, right? Probably, yes, ma'am. Not like a brick of cocaine. Right. Now, to your knowledge, did Charlie use drugs? 
Like, has he, have you ever seen him do drugs in front of you? Marijuana? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Do you know if he was using steroids? Only if you know. I know he was. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Now, around the time that Catherine was arrested, all right, that was in October of 2016, did, his did you notice a change in his behavior? Yes, ma'am. Describe for the jury what that change was. Frantic behavior, nervousness, paranoia, uh, restlessness. Did you guys as a group ever even confront or just ask him, or this was just a topic that was off limits when it came to Dan Markell and how he died? Did we confront him as? Like, you know, just in passing or talking, because this was kind of a known thing. Did you ever say, hey, did, you, did your family ever get any information about what happened to Dan Markell? It was never really relating to Dan. It was just relating to the case. Okay, and would he ever talk about the case with you guys or just not? Just that, you know, he was innocent, he's got nothing to worry about, this is nonsense or other expletive terms about it. Okay, Did you, do you remember him ever saying something in reference to, you know, you can get away with murder, you just have to keep your mouth shut? Yes, ma'am. Okay. He's not one to keep his mouth shut, is he? No, ma'am. Now, around the time that, oh, I asked you that first. Now, at some point, you said you had a falling out with Charles Adelson, right? Correct. Has he, since the time of 2016, has all of his close male friendships kind of fallen apart? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is he still friends with Darren Pike? Yeah. As far as you, if you know. If I mean, you know, I, I think they still communicate, and, well, not anymore, but I think they were still in communication. I don't necessarily know at whose benefit that was. Okay. And but Clint Stevenson and some of the others not close. I don't close believe they him. speak to him anymore as well. Now, with regards to you, what happened that caused your falling out? Well, it was kind of a uh, labored relationship, just because all he did was complain, talk about himself, talk about this scenario as well. And he just got old. I mean, it would be four times a day, repetitive, calling me at noon in the middle of the day, forty-five minute phone calls in the middle of the day. And it just got frustrating. And then we had a business together, whereas we had a difference of opinions on how it should go. And because of this trial at hand, or potential trial at hand, he kind of freaked out and pulled the rug out from under me. And I continued to placate the friendship in order to close out our books and do the right thing. And, you know, he kind of crossed me a little bit and then has since opened up. Uh, litigation against me. So. Against you, right? Yes, ma'am. And now, even though you've been friends with him for years, you did not hear from the police until after the pandemic, right? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, all your name is all over his iCloud, but they didn't contact you until 2020. Correct. And this was after he had begun his lawsuit against you. Yes. So they probably yes, knew, they probably knew you weren't on good terms. Correct. And it was a phone call that they reached out to you, right? Yes, yes ma'am. Do you remember who it was that you spoke to on the phone? Uh, Mr. Newlin and uh, someone from the FBI. Agent Sanford, sound familiar? No, Could be. No, no. Okay. He's a special, special agent. Special agent. All right. And um, you told them specifically about the money, right? How, how you've seen had, him packaged it that way before. They asked me about the money and I concurred with their... Oh, question. so they specifically asked you about that? It, it kind of led into it and then, yeah, I because I, I figured they already knew the answer, so tell and the then truth. When, you, when they called you, they specifically directed your attention to, hey, we know you're friends with Charlie. Do you have any information about the murder of Dan Markell? Is that... Basically, yes, ma'am. Okay. And... You told them more or less everything that you told this jury today, right? Absolutely, yes, ma'am. Okay. And that's a lot of relevant information that you have against Charlie, right? Unfortunately, yes. This, you're not here under a state subpoena, are you? No, ma'am. Okay. Who is the, which side brought you here to testify in court? Uh, Catherine's side. All right. And I want to talk to you about one other thing. You know about Charlie's, had a Lexus. Yes, At some point in time, right? Harvey's. Harvey's. Harvey's it was Harvey's Lexus, right? Correct. Okay. And then it ends up, well, the, the records show that Catherine paid for it, okay? 
Have you ever bought a car from Charles Adelson, or do you guys I've, have? He bought one from a friend that I I sold a uh, Range Rover to a friend that sold it to Charlie, and then Charlie since sold it, but. But that's something that he's done is he'll buy cars and then he sells them. It was at a reduced rate too for this Range Rover, right? Very. Very. How much did how much was it sold for? I think it was bought for me for seventeen. I think I sold it like eighty five hundred or something like that. Okay, and Range Rover's a pretty high price car. Do you know what year it was? Two thousand seven, but it only had like thirty five thousand miles right. on it. And I had no problems with it, but as soon as I sold it, they did. But that's something that he normally does, is he yes, will take cars and sell them to his friends, right? Correct. Does he also involve himself? He's not, he's a dentist, right? Is That's not his only source of income though, right? No, ma'am. He has other business ventures and other things going on. Yes, ma'am. We were in business together and then he owns uh, like Class C rental properties. Oh, uh, properties that he rents out to tenants and stuff? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And he has a house in Fort Lauderdale, right? Correct. Is it a mansion? Not at all. Okay. In comparison to some of the other houses in South Florida, how would you describe it? Moderate? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. It was, I don't know. It was kind of gross. But he's still that guy that has a Ferrari parked in his garage, right? Correct. <clears throat> Ron, may I have a brief moment? Yes. <clears throat> I have no further questions, Rich. Thank you. Cross examination. What was your understanding of um, how Catherine McBanwell came to own the Lexus? That it was sold to her for a reduced rate, or I don't know the price or what the terms were. You were given a deposition in this case, right? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm going to turn your attention to page 55, lines 18 through 21. Yes, I said he gave it to her. I don't know, gave it to her a reduced rate. I don't know what a reduced rate is, you know? Like, okay. Could be 50 so bucks or something. You obviously, you don't have any personal knowledge of their bank accounts. You didn't see any check or cash no, exchange. Okay. You said in your deposition that you you thought that he gave it to her, but you he may have given it to her a reduced rate. Possibly, yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So I want to talk about this confrontation. This confrontation that you're talking about, that this is what Charlie Adelson told you, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and he told you that Garcia confronted he and Catherine McBanwell when they were together, right? Correct. Okay, and this confrontation occurred during the day? From my understanding, yes. When he and Cat, when, I need to say who, when Charlie Adelson and Catherine McBanwell were planning to go jet skiing that day? From my understanding, yes, ma'am. Okay, and Charlie Adelson had his jet skis with him. That's what they were planning to go do. From what I understood, from what Charlie said, yes, ma'am. Okay, and that's when Garcia confronted them, tried to run them off the road. Correct. Okay, made a scene. From my understanding of what I was told, yes, ma'am. And Catherine McBanwell was there. From my understanding, from what I was told, yes, ma'am. Right, you weren't there. <laughs> no, ma'am. This is just what Charlie's telling Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you don't, you <clears throat> said that... He didn't tell you about any other confrontation that he ever had with Garcia besides that jet ski incident. No, ma'am. Okay. And you don't have any knowledge of any communication between Charlie and Garcia besides him saying that, hey, he confronted me when we were taking the jet skis out. Correct. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Redirect. Patrick, you describe Charles Adelson as brilliant, right? Correct. He wouldn't be the type of person to plan a homicide on a regular phone that could be tracked, right? I hope not. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. You're free to go. Thank you. Defense may call its next witness.
Your Honor, it's going to be early for lunch. I believe that now would be the time to take the break. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to break a little bit early today, and uh, but we will give you uh, until one o'clock. So you're going to get some extra time, and uh, we're going to be mindful of the time today. So uh, please, no conversations, no looking at the internet, uh, no discussions with any friends or family members, and we'll see everybody back at one o'clock to continue. Okay. Thank you. Jury's out of the courtroom. The door is closed. Please be seated. <coughs> so, Mr. DeCoste, I take it that you will not be calling Stephen Downing? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, I, I will, and I'm not going to elaborate on I have some serious concerns based on that conversation, not against the, the government, but the, the, the change. So, we're not calling uh, Mr. Downing. We are done with all of our other witnesses. We are not calling our expert, uh, John Sawicki. Okay. Um, I do have a there were some exhibits and the government wanted to look at everything again. So I saw it best to wait so that we could have that. There are a series of text messages. Now these are all messages we've already spoken about during the trial. The defense would like to move them in. We're not entering it for the truth of the matter. And I can articulate why we're not entering it for the truth of the matter. And then my understanding is that the government has their demonstrative that has gone in. And if theirs has gone in, we would like to move ours in as well, too. All right. Well, it's not going to the jury anyways, if it's not, if it's a demonstrative. So you can put it in as a demonstrative, but it won't be going okay. back to the jury. It, and we have it as a demonstrative right now. It's already been entered. I just didn't know if the government had theirs in. I can check it um, with the messages. What I can do is I don't think that. Well, let's ask is the picture with all the faces on it uh, that you use, Ms. Kappelman, that, that's just a demonstrative, correct? All right, so that's not going back cool. to the jury. Settles that. We have these series of messages. Now, we've already laid the foundation. They've been authenticated. I just want to, in fairness to the government, have the discussion with them. I can explain how it's not for the truth of the matter. Um, it's to, it, and, and I can articulate it. If it's why, what, why didn't we go ahead and enter them into evidence when we're going through the particular witnesses? Because we were trying, because it, it was my choice at the time trying to move through the witnesses, knowing that we've already laid the foundation. All of these have already been discussed, and witnesses have discussed it. We just haven't moved it. All right, Ms. Kaplan, do you want to take a look at these? Yes, sir. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. All right, we've discussed all of them. Okay, what is uh, the state will take a look at those. Okay, so now our issue is how we're going to proceed uh, this afternoon and whether or not uh, Ms. Magbanoa will be testifying. All right, so Ms. Kawas, I know that you've been having discussions with Ms. Magbanoa, and so has a decision been reached as to whether or not Ms. Magbanoa will be testifying? And you, I'm going to inquire to her after, but you can tell me right now, Ms. Kawas. She will be. She will be testifying? Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask her a few questions. And so, uh, Mr. DeCoast, would you mind putting the microphone, uh, bringing that up to Ms. McManua? All right. Ms. McManua, I'm going to ask you uh, some questions, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand that you have the right to testify, but you also have the right not to testify? Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. And uh, you can discuss this uh, with anyone. You can discuss it with friends or family members or your attorneys, but ultimately it is your decision as to whether or not you want to testify. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Now, uh, you have an absolute right not to testify. You've heard me already instruct the jury that you have that right. And uh, if you choose not to testify, then in the closing instructions, I will again instruct the jury that you have the absolute right not to testify and that they cannot hold that against you or consider that in their deliberations. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Now, uh, you do also have the right to testify. And uh, if you choose to testify, then I will instruct them that they will consider your testimony just as any other witness. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. So have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify? 
Yes, I'll be testifying today. All right. So you have made the decision. Is anybody forcing you to testify? No, Your Honor. Is this by your own free will? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And um, so at the appropriate time, are you certain of this decision? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So at the appropriate time, uh, when we return, uh, your counsel will call you as a witness and you'll come to uh, the witness stand and uh, be subject to examination and cross-examination by the state, okay? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that's how we'll proceed uh, this afternoon, and um, uh, I anticipate it will take a good bit of the afternoon, and uh, so the, uh, but I expect that it will conclude today, okay? So um, we'll be mindful, uh, we were going to be mindful of the time today in regards to the jurors uh, because of obligations. So uh, Ms. Magbano will testify this afternoon and we'll complete that by five o'clock. Now, um, so what we will do then for scheduling purposes is that tomorrow morning, uh, we will go, uh, uh, if there's not, I'll ask for any rebuttal witnesses after Ms. Magbano testifies. Do you anticipate any at this point? No, Your Honor. Okay, so um, then, so defense will rest. I will ask for any rebuttal witnesses. Uh, and if there are none, then I will excuse the jury uh, for the day. Uh, if we need to go over jury instructions, but I expect everybody has taken a look at them, okay? I don't think that there's anything earth shattering there. I think we can get those, through those pretty quickly. And, uh, and then, so then tomorrow morning, I will read jury instructions, and then we'll get right to closing arguments. And then uh, those will be completed by lunchtime. I'll have lunch ready and available for the jury and they'll begin their deliberations at that time. That is the schedule moving forward. Everybody have a good understanding of that? Yes. Sir. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's how we'll proceed. So you have some time here uh, till one o'clock, but let's be uh, prompt in the courtroom at one o'clock to continue with the testimony, okay? All right, in regards to these exhibits, were there any objections to those? Just here say, Your Honor. All right, and you were saying that they're not for the truth of the matter asserted? Correct, Your Honor. All right, if, if I could, wants to take it for lunch and I can articulate when we come back as, as to why these are being brought in, whatever works with the court. I'd rather do it. Let me take a look at them. Okay. <laughs> so I need a magnifying glass for these. I apologize, Your Honor. The first two are quite small. What you have in the first message is Wendy Adelson and Charles Adelson talking about where they're having dinner. And in the second one, you have a text message from uh, Kathy McBanwood to Charles Adelson about the fact that Sigfredo Garcia is upset. We're not trying to prove that, um, th th that there was a dinner on March 11th. We're not trying to prove that Sigfredo Garcia was upset. What we're trying to prove is that he was aware of the relationship, that he's upset about the relationship, but more importantly, that he, he knows where they are and that he has the potential of access to Charles Adelson. The next set of ones is something that the government already has in it's, did Tuto have, I think that I have this order right. Uh, did Tuto call your phone? Now the government entered in, if I'm not mistaken, an exhibit. That is ours. There's actually one slide that's not in there. Um, but that one, we're, we're not trying to prove that Tuto called the phone. We're not trying to prove that that it was deep sea fishing. There was a lot of testimony about this, about the fact that it was a joke or not. What we're trying to show is that there is the the potential access between Sigfredo Garcia and Charles Adelson. Um, I don't know what the next one is, if you want to give me the reference. Uh, yeah, so that's the goodbye tour. We're not trying to prove that there was a trip to Key West. We're not trying to prove that it was actually the goodbye tour. What we are trying to establish is the fact that Charles Adelson, around the time of when these trips are happening, has made the decision that he is no longer going to be dating Kathy McBannell. And then I think the next one is in August where um, Catherine is upset. Now, we're not trying to prove that Catherine was upset, but instead that Charles Adelson was pushing her out of his life. There may be another one in between the two. Right, there's other ones between uh, the defendant and Mr. Adelson 
again in regards to Mr. Garcia. Then there's the ones in regards to are you going to the beach uh, or the pool? We had a lot, and so that's the morning of the alleged money drop, right. 7 19, 2014. We're not trying to prove that she actually went to the pool with the kids. What we're trying to what we're trying to show and illustrate from those messages, and there has been testimony about it. I think Sergeant Corbett was asked by the government specifically about it. What we're trying to show is that there aren't any communications about a murder because the government has this theory that the cell phones were used to communicate about the murder. All right, I'll allow them to be admitted. This will be what? This is going to be a composite exhibit? Uh, I would have them as seven separate exhibits. All right. what, but whatever the court, I think it's easy. Well, let's get them marked and then uh, and numbered, please. And then are they, there's seven different exhibits? Yeah, okay, so it'll be so. 32 through 39. All right. So they're uh, not for the truth of the matter asserted, although they are hearsay, I'll uh, allow them to be admitted. And so defense exhibit 32 through 39 will be admitted. And that's all, Your Honor. That's We're, we're going to confirm over lunch in a few minutes just to make sure all of our stuff is in, but I believe it is. All right. Okay. So this afternoon we have the testimony and then uh, if we need to have any discussions about jury instructions after that, we're going to do that after that okay. because the jury is going to be excused and then we'll make sure everything's ready to go for tomorrow morning. Okay. We'll be in recess until one o'clock. I'm sorry to, to hold up your honor. Will we be able to get any sort of extra access to Ms. McDonald? All right, looks like we're ready to go. And, uh, Sorry, before we get yes. started, I showed um, the defense several messages from Discovery that I intend to show Ms. McVan like this composite exhibit. I'd like to label it the exhibit 136. All right, so the defense has had an opportunity to take a look? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So it's a, a composite exhibit, States Exhibit 136? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, so just ask at the appropriate time. I'll ask if there's any objection at that time. Yes, thank you, sir. Okay. Let's bring the jury in, please. <clears throat> Oh, no, I don't know. Whatever you need to be comfortable. Please be seated. We'll continue with the testimony at this time. Cross-examination. Ms. Dugan, you may proceed. All right. So I want to talk about what you just talked about with your attorney. Yes, ma'am. Um, you said that you and Char Charlie Adelson were together in July of 2014, right? Yes, ma'am. No. Then July 2014? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And then you broke up in August, you said? I believe so. Okay. And then you became friends after that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then you became his personal assistant in September of 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so that's that all goes on in the matter of those two months, July to September 2014? Yes, ma'am. If you're someone's personal assistant, you have to see or talk to them every day, right? and talk to them every day mm -hmm. 
talk to them on the phone, but right. not have to see them. Okay. Did you and Charlie continue to talk on the phone every day, multiple times a day since you were his personal assistant? Multiple times a day? I don't remember. Well, every day then? I don't remember if it's every day. Okay. Well, how often would you talk to him? Um, I don't know. Do you have like phone records? No, um, I'm just asking you, what's your memory of how often you talked to him? From 2014? Mm -hmm, when you um, became his personal assistant. I don't know how often I was talking to him. Well, how would, I mean, if you're working for him and being his personal assistant, you whenever said you he would call me. So, I mean, I, is that some, it's everyday duties that you had? He was calling. I, I don't know how long, how often he was calling me. That's why I don't want to answer like a wrong amount or a wrong number. Okay. Well, you were getting paid every 10 days for your work, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you would have regular work and you'd have regular contact with him during all of your pay periods? Not regular contact, no. I don't know how many times he would call me during the week. Okay. And he had just broken up with you two months before that. We, like I said, like I was telling uh, Miss mm -hmm. Kawas that I never had like a definitive date when we stopped like talking. Sometime between the murder though and when you became his personal assistant, he broke up with you though. That was your testimony? Like it, it was dwindling down like our our relationship. I Meaning guess. that he was ghosting you? That's what Something your like that? attorney yeah. said in her opening statement? Yes, okay. Why would he want you working as his personal assistant if he was ghosting you? Well, I told you that he need I needed that favor for my the insurance purposes. That's why I put that I was working for him. Uh huh. And you needed that favor though. You needed that favor, and you asked him for that favor actually in June of 2014, didn't you? If that's what the record show. Mm -hmm. Showing um, the first the all right, well, let's make sure we're going to get it. You're asking that state's exhibit 136 is admitted in evidence? Right. No objection. It'll be admitted as state's exhibit 136. Yes. Sorry about that. I thought we That's all right. Um, all right. Looking at this, you asked him for this favor. Baby, I need your help with employment. I have to send it to DPS for my kids' insurance. Also, if I end up moving, I need to show I'm working for you or else I won't be able to get an apartment. That was in June of 2014, right? Yes, ma'am. June 24th, actually, right in between the trip uh, to Tallahassee to commit this murder, right? Let's say the dates again. June 24th, that's in between the June Tallahassee trip and the July Tallahassee trip? I believe so. That you asked for this favor for him? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then you guys were together at the time that you asked this favor, right? I believe so. Right, but he didn't put you on the payroll in June, did he? No, I don't think I was on the payroll till September, you said? Right. Okay, so that was a favor that he did for you after he broke up with you, you're saying? We never really broke up, like, I guess when we stopped having, like, that type of relationship. Right. You were no longer intimate with each other? Not that I could recall. Okay. You said that y'all broke up sometime after the murder of Dan Markell, and then about in May, that's when you got together with Sigfredo Garcia, right? I got in 2015. Mm hmm Right. Yes, yeah. But you said that... In August, that's when he broke up with you. I don't know the dates that when we stopped, or not stopped, but like when our communication dwindled down in the relationship. Okay. You it, asked him it, for that favor in June when y'all were definitely together, though. I believe so. And he ghosted you after the murder of Dan Markell. That's what the argument is, right? Okay. Um, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But at the same time that you're saying he ghosted you, you're also saying he asked you to become his personal assistant. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Does that make any sense? I needed the help to get my kids insurance. I don't... Why would he want his ex-girlfriend, who he doesn't talk to and he's ghosting, to become his personal assistant? He talks to his other ex-girlfriends. No, I'm I said, done. why is he asking... Why is he ghosting you but asking you to become his personal assistant? Because I'm asking him for the favor so that I can... Right, but at this point, y'all are broken up. 
What is when that? he puts you on the Adelson Institute payroll, right? Why? We stayed as friends. We we were friends. Okay. So that's your, he puts you on the Adelson Institute as a favor to a friend. Yes. To their yes. payroll. Okay. But the other employees of the Adelson Institute, so mm -hmm. though they said that, you know, you didn't work there. So yes, that's why you're saying that you worked remotely. You worked at home. That's your testimony? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And... Charlie Adelson, we hear him in the recording saying, oh, well, you clean the office on the weekends, but you're telling us you actually did not do that. No, ma'am. Right? Okay. So why didn't you go into the office? Why were you working from home? Like, what was so different about you? What was so different about me? Mm -hmm. so my whole purpose was to get insurance for my kids. I just, I didn't, like... I, and he, whenever he asked me to do some stuff, like I would do it. Like I told you the site and I don't remember, I can't recall a lot of the things from 2014. That's why I don't know how to really answer your question. Well, as his remote personal assistant, I mean, what exactly did you do for him? You said earlier you set up appointments for him, yes, right? And you looked at rental places for him? Yes, ma'am. He had owned properties and like he was telling me to collect from those properties. Okay. From the property. So let's take those one by one, yes, setting up appointments. Did you actually schedule any patients? No, not scheduled uh, um, patients on the thing. It's for the site, like his website. So you did not schedule patients? No, ma'am. Okay. What appointments did you set up for him? No, I can't recall. Okay. What type of appointments if they weren't scheduling patients? I, I can't recall. You don't know what type of appointments you set no, up for him? Okay. But you did not schedule patients? Not that I can recall. So no. it wouldn't have been for his work as a dentist? I'm kind of getting confused about your question. His work as a dentist was he did dental work on patients. Yeah, right? I can't recall the patients that I've called or which ones I've scheduled back in 2014. I'm not asking you for specifics. I'm just okay. saying what type of appointments did you set up for him if you didn't schedule patients? What I, other I types of I appointments? I didn't do this, the appointments. I did it okay. for the site. Like his appointments with other, like if other things that he needed to do, not for patients in the office. Okay, so you were not scheduling patients. You were not, this isn't the office website you're talking about? Yes, the office website. Okay, what type of appointments are you putting on the office website that are not patients? He just needed to, well, like to take the pictures for his office and his website. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what I was setting up the appointment for. You set up an appointment for him to get his website done yes. by a company that does websites. Yes, like my friend that was doing the website, yes. That is the appointment that you set up yes, for him. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that is one appointment you're saying that, that you set up I for him. I can remember, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. And so you earned over $800 a month, over $17,000 over the course of a year and a half, for setting up one appointment with him one time to get his website set up. I don't remember all of the specifics of stuff that he's asked me to do. Okay. That's the only one that you can think that, of. I mean, like right now, yes. Okay. Well, your defense is that you're not involved in this murder, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It, it, and you said it, it seems like Charlie Adelson is, obviously, huh? Yes, ma'am. And your children's father obviously is too, right? And you're yes, caught in the middle of it? Yes, ma'am. All right. And if you're collecting money from Charlie Adelson for no legitimate purpose, that looks suspicious. It looks like he's paying you for, or keeping you happy for your part in this murder, doesn't it? No, ma'am. Okay. If you're doing something to earn those payments, then that no longer would seem suspicious, right? Well, I, I just don't understand when it's like you're talking about like the checks, right? If, right. If you're doing something to earn that money, that would no longer seem suspicious. I don't, I'm not understanding your question. My question is, you're telling this jury yes, that you did something for, you set up some type of appointments for him, but it was not scheduling patients. The only thing that you can tell us today that you ever set up for him, though, is one time you that I can called recall. a website company to have his website, him to have an appointment with him for them to set up his website. Isn't that true? That I can recall, yes, ma'am. Okay. And in that message, that actually that's one of the ones that your attorney showed you, the or showed, it was an investig investigator Isom when he was on the stand the other day. Yes, that was actually in August of 2014. 
That was a month before you started getting paychecks from the Adelson Institute, wasn't it? What was the message? About, hey, I called this person and he'll do your website. That was in August of 2014, wasn't That's it? That's what the text message showed. Okay. So that was before you ever received a paycheck from the Adelson Institute, wasn't it's it? About August. If August is before September. September? I believe so. Okay. Did you keep up with his schedule? I mean, you'd have to know his schedule to be able to schedule patients, right? Or to set up appointments for him, I mean? That's what you keep talking about, like these appointments. I can't remember things that I was doing back in 2014. I'm not asking I, don't, I didn't have specifics. like a schedule right. of his like daily activities and stuff. So I didn't, I would just call him if, or he would call me if he needed me to do something. Okay. Did you keep up with him though and his schedule in order to be able to make appointments for him? Keep up with him, like see what his other appointment. appointment know what's were? going on with him. My boss is here today, he's there today, he's on vacation today, he's working this week. You would have to know his schedule in order to be able to set up appointments I for him, right? I don't know his definitive schedule at that time, but I mean, like I told you, he would just text me what, if he needed me to do something. Okay, and how often would that be? I don't recall. Okay, I mean, you would have some idea. You're, you would have some idea of what's going on with his work schedule if your job that you're getting paid $800 a month for is to set up appointments for him, right? Like I said, I don't know how often he would text me. Whenever he would text me and he would ask me to do something, then I would do it. It was like odd jobs. It wasn't a specific, oh, call this patient or do this. Okay. I mean, isn't it true you had no idea what was going on with his schedule to set up any type of appointment for him or his work? No, right. I would just text him and be like, okay, are you going to be free for this X, Y, and Z if I needed to, but not that I can recall. I want to ask you about the text from October 2014, which is a month after you started collecting the text from the Institute. You send a message to him where you say, how are you, by the way? How's work? How's your and your love life? Didn't you say that? That's what it says, right? Okay. The following year, you say, hey, I was going to text you, but you know, I never know if you're on vacation or not at work. Didn't you say that? That's what the text show, yeah. The following month, you text him and you say, and this is December in 2014, you're getting text from the to you. So how is work? How's your office? Okay. So that's the game. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You were working as a personal assistant, making that money, only set up the one appointment that you can think of, and you're having to check in with him. How's work? How's your love life? What's going on with you? You're not keeping up with his schedule either, are you? Like I said, I didn't have his definitive schedule of what he does. If he needs help and he needs, he needs to text me and he needs me to do something, he'll text me and let me do something. Well, you also said that you helped him with tenants of his properties. Yes, ma'am. What did you do with the properties? He had a couple of properties at that time. I don't remember what location or where it is, but he had asked me to collect like the, yeah, the tenants, pay, the, the monthly payment. And like they had like washers and dryers there too, and like you'd have to open it up and like get like whatever coins are in there. Okay, so you collected rent from these tenants? Yes. So I'm going to ask you about a prior statement that you made. I just gave you a, tr a transcript of that particular day. Yes, um, looking at page 58, Got it. line 22 through 25. Okay. 
Okay. When you were asked in, in October of 2019, would you be responsible for collecting rent? You said initially he wanted me to try to collect rent, but those tenants were so difficult, so I just didn't do it. Isn't yes. that true? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you didn't actually collect rent? No, he wanted me to collect it. Well, obviously here it says that I didn't. Right. And today, though, you're saying that you did. I said he wanted to. He wanted me to collect. I don't even remember what I just said. Right. right I just asked you if you collected rent, and you said you did. Well, and that was a lie, wasn't it? I just said I didn't, and you just collect them on me. Okay. And if you said that you collected rent from him today, and you previously said that you did not collect rent from his tenants, he wanted you to do it, but you never did it. That's a lie, right? I should have told you to refresh my memory instead of saying that. Okay. Was that a yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Why did he do this favor for you? To give you over $17,000 over the course of a year and a half from him and his parents' business. I needed to do it for the insurance for my kids and I had to put it on a bracket so that I can apply for that. I understand why you needed it. Why would he do that for you? That's my question. Because he had a business. He had right. that office. Right, but it you, you're not doing a service for him though, right? You, you only set up the one appointment and you didn't actually collect rents from the tenants. So why would he do this for you if you're not actually earning that money? Objection to speculation. Overruled. I asked him for that favor for the insurance. I understand why you needed it. I don't know. My question is why did he do it for you? I don't know, ma'am. Isn't it because he's keeping you happy because you did a really big favor for him no, in July of 2014? No, ma'am. And you did hang that over his head, though, sometimes, didn't you? Hang what over the fact that you had done a really big favor for him. Not that I can recall. <clears throat> Here, this is part of a conversation I have with him. You say, I know you're busy, but every time I speak to you, it's like you have an attitude. I know you're overwhelmed by everything that you're doing. This is in April of 2014. Don't worry about it. I'll just ask him myself. And then you send him a uh, website. And then you say, that's the website. Next time, don't be such a bitch and send him an email to the website. Right? Okay. What did he do for me? I don't know what he was referring to. <clears throat> I mean, you weren't doing much of anything for him, right? He was the one giving you all this money. And I told you it was I, I did the whole purpose for that was for the insurance for my children. I know, but I'm, my point is he hadn't done anything for you. You were the one do. He was the one paying you the money. You weren't doing anything for him. He was doing everything for you, right? But he was doing that as a favor for me. Right. Yeah. So what are you talking about here? That's something that you've done for him. Well, do you have the rest of the text because that's just like a portion. It doesn't of it. say that remember. day. You're just talking about I, he's being mean to you and you're saying don't be such a dick to someone who's done something for you. Yeah, I don't know what I was referring to. Okay. Um, and that favor, you say it was to get insurance and you're talking about Medicaid is what you were trying to get? Yeah. Okay. And when you get insurance through Medicaid, I mean... The taxpayers are paying for that, right? Yes, ma'am. Right. That's all of us, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people need Medicaid. It's a serious thing, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But you were getting Medicaid at the same time that you were paying thousands and thousands of dollars in cash for a boob job, right? Well, I've already saved up for that. That was a long-term, like, pay, like for the insurance was a long-term for my, for my son because he has a disability. I understand you said that. But I'm, I'm just saying you were you, getting Medicaid at the same time that you were paying thousands and thousands of dollars in cash for a boob job, right? That I saved up for, yes, ma'am. Okay. You had a, you say you saved up for it, but you had a, a habit 
of depositing money into the bank. We saw all your cash deposits by day. And you deposit, I mean, sometimes multiple, multiple deposits every day in the bank of all of different cash, in different banks, Definitely. in cash. OK. So you make all those deposits in cash every day, sometimes at different banks, multiple times a day, right? At different banks at the same day? Yeah, you deposit a lot of cash in the bank. You do it sometimes, it's not just like a once a month thing. You do it almost daily. Sometimes you do it at multiple different banks in a day. If that's what the records show, I don't remember what I was doing. At that but time. you're saying for this particular breast augmentation, you did not deposit that money. You kept that at home. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And it was just all the other money that you had you deposited in the bank, except for that. I've already saved up for, for my breast augmentation. So that's a yes. You and deposited all your other money into the bank, except for the cash for the breast augmentation. I, whenever I would have money with me and I would, from working from the club, then I would save up and then I'd deposit whatever I had. Charlie Adelson, he also gave you other gifts, right? Besides just, it, that wasn't the only benefit being on the Adelson Institute payroll. I mean, he paid for a trip to Santa Domingo for you, right? And the kids. Okay. And that's the, the Dominican Republic, right? Yes, ma'am. All right. And that was in 2015 after you and Charlie Adelson broke up? If that's what the record shows, I don't remember what date it was. He also offered to send you and your mom a cruise, right? Where am I looking at? Because I didn't go on a cruise with my mom, so... I guess so, but I never went on a cruise with my mom, so. And he says, do you want me to get a cruise for you and your mom in 2015? Yes, I guess so, but I never went on a cruise with my mom. Okay, that's not what I asked. He offered to buy you and your mom. If that's what was on the text, okay. then yes. He would also give you cash. Sometimes you would text him, ask for help, ask for loans. You needed cash. If that's what the text says. Well, he would give you cash, right? If you can show me the text message. Okay. In May of 2015, you say, by the way, I have a shitload of things to pay for. I need a little help with tuition this after summer. I stop my weekend job. I hate asking. He says, I'll lend you whatever you need. You say, it's just tight this month. And that's on May 20th of 2015, right? That I, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry. Loud. Okay. And then when you look at state exhibit eighty one D, all your daily cash deposits. And a couple of days after that, on May 25th of 2015, you deposit $1,400 in cash, right? That's what the record shows. Okay. So you're asking for help, and you give you cash. Isn't that true? That's what the record shows. Who is Sully? That's um, the mechanic. Okay. So Sully and... Your attorney was asking earlier about a Sully Mech, M-E-C-H. That was in 
Charlie Adelson or Sigfredo's call list, right? Mm -hmm. Sully is a mechanic. Mech is the first four letters of mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did you find out about Sully? Uh, that was somebody that Charlie used for his um, his his mechanic. Charlie referred you to Sully to fix cars when you were having car trouble, right? Yeah, when when like the like if the Lexus was having issues or like my Mazda was having issues, right? And so you got the Lexus fixed with Sully, right? And your Mazda. Sully fixed. It. Sully yeah, fixed. Yeah, he's fixed it. He's fixed it before. Okay. And Sully uh, is the mechanic for eco-friendly shop. Yes, ma'am. That's the name of the body shop. You brought the body shop. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you got work done with Sully, Charlie Adelson would pay for it. No, I believe I paid for for the unless you have a text that shows otherwise. But I paid for payments for the Lexus getting fixed because it kept breaking down on me. Okay, and your Mazda broke down a couple of times, right? I believe so, yeah, because okay. I got in a um, car accident. At least some of these times, though, Charlie paid for it. I don't know which times, but if you have the text message for it. Right. Here in October, he's saying, I just got a call with Sully for you. I just wrote to Sully, and he said, that has to be a Mazda. He said it was about 1200 You're you know, upset that it's 1200 He says, I'll pay it for you. That was in October of 2015. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was trying to read what was like after the text message. No That's after you got back together with the Greater Garcia. Of 2015? Right. Yeah, I believe I was already with him. Okay. And Sigfredo Garcia would drive the Lexus too, right? Uh, every now and then, okay. we'd switch sometimes. And whenever the Lexus had a problem, y'all would take it to Sully at Eco Friendly Shop because that's the mechanic that Charlie had referred to you. Well, there was also another mechanic that I think I was trying to use for the Lexus, but since Sully's been working on the Lexus, like he's, we've taken it over there. Okay. Yeah. He's also called in prescriptions for you, right? Charlie has? Who has? As a I favor? I We're talking about the favors. We talked about the trip to Santo Domingo, offering you and your mom a cruise, the car repairs. He also called in a prescription for you, right? Called in prescriptions in the past? Prescriptions? Right. I, I guess so. I don't, I don't recall. That was such a long time ago. Okay. Do you remember him paying for a catered fit meal service for you? Um, if you can refresh my memory. You don't remember that? Can't remember. All right. And then he also gave you cash. For when what? you would ask him for help or ask him for loans, he would give you cash. Do you have any text messages that show? I just showed you the one oh, about. Well, for that one, yes. Right. Okay. And those things that I was showing you, all of those things in 2015, that's after you and Charlie Adelson broke up. I believe so. And you heard June say, you were here during trial, that after they broke up, they were together for seven years, he didn't give her any gifts like that. What makes you so special that he's giving you these gifts after you broke, after he broke up I with you? I think she did mention she was getting gifts from He him. said a little something, not a trip, cash. You looked into car repairs. Records? No, I'm asking oh. you, <laughs> what was so special about you that he's giving you all these gifts know, after you broke up? I don't know, man. That you're referring that you had records for her too. No, I'm asking you why you were so special that he's giving you question. the gifts. And you don't know? I don't know. So not just to keep you happy, keep you quiet? No. All right, so... We saw in the financial records that you had a big cash spike yes, in August of 2014. <clears throat> Where did this money come from? 
Oh, well, it was showing, I believe when Chris was talking about it, there's like jobs that you guys didn't account for. Where were you working in July 2014? I don't know if I was in Fate or Hollywood Live, but I know that like my jobs were, and I, I've told you before that Sigfredo has given me cash. Okay. Linda says you were not a Hollywood Live in July 2014. So she quit in July 2014 and you quit two months before. So you weren't at Hollywood Live in July 2014. Not that I can recall. Okay. And she said, you said, actually, today, you worked at Fate, and then you went to Hollywood Live, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So where were you working in well, July 2014? Well, I, I believe it was Fate, Hollywood Live, and I think Fate after that, like, because there was a little bit of a gap between the Fate and, like, me being in Fate. Okay. Where were you working in July 2014? I don't recall where I was working. Okay. So you can't tell us. Not that I know. Like, Do you, you have any work? records of where I was? No, I don't. I'm okay. not asking. Where were you working? I, I don't. I don't recall. That was well, back in 2014. I don't recall. Where did this money come from? I don't recall where I was working or if Secreto gave me money on 2014. You don't remember whether it's money that you earned or money that you gave me? No, ma'am. I mean, this is over twice, $13,200 in August 2014. That's over twice the amount of money that you, of the most you ever deposited before that in this country. I wish I could remember, but I don't know okay. where from 2014. Twice as much money, over twice as much money as any I other month. I wish I could remember. I don't even remember what I did yesterday. You don't remember <laughs> depositing thirteen thousand two hundred dollars in your account in August of twenty fourteen. No, ma'am. You don't re remember depositing seventeen thousand from the day of Dan Martell's murder to the end of August twenty fourteen. No, ma'am. When I look at the records that you guys have, it's it's crazy. Even when I to see how how you guys put it and make it out to be like on my account. Wouldn't that be a memorable thing for you if all of a sudden exactly, it you got be. over twice the amount of money you would normally have? That would definitely be memorable. I mean, before, before July of 2014, you hadn't deposited, deposited $5,000 even close since January of 2013, over a year and a half before us. Ma'am, I wish I knew and I could re recall and remember, but I don't. And then over the course of these three months, you've got over 5000 here, over 13000 here, over 5000 again here, and you're just saying you have no memory of depositing that money or any idea where it came from. I don't have a recollection. And you don't think that's something that you would remember? I would remember that, but I don't have any recollection of, of that date. I don't know I'm what- I'm not talking about one specific date. I'm talking about those couple I of know months. you were saying those months, but right. I remember when we were doing the chart, there was jobs that I was working and I don't remember where I was working, what exact month, and I told you I've gotten cash from Secreto before. Okay, you can't tell us though anywhere you were working in July of 2014. I can't remember, I can't okay. recall. And when you're talking about this money from Secreto. Yes, ma'am. You said he didn't give, steadily give you cash, it was just whenever he had it, he'd show up with it. Yes, ma'am. How much were you making at Fate Nightclub? I don't recall. You can refresh my memory. What? You didn't say today. I, how I, much did I you... I mean, for my testimony? Well, how, how much do you remember making at Fate Nightclub? I don't Night remember. Club? I don't recall. How much did you make at Hollywood Live? I don't recall. Were you making thousands per night? I believe I was making more in fate. I don't know how much exactly. I don't want to commit to like an amount, but I was making more in fate nightclub than Hollywood.
looking at page 36, lines 22 and 23. Okay. In your prior testimony, you said that a good night for you, you would walk out of there at a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Isn't that true? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you said that you would work there sometimes two times a week. Uh. On the next page, page yeah. thirty-seven. Yeah. That's what or, you said back in twenty nineteen. Yes, ma'am. And you gave that testimony that you would walk out of faith. With between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars a night, and that was before Ramsey Neighbor was a witness in this case. Isn't that true? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that was before we had Ramsey Neighbor to come in here and say the club was not successful. It did not work. My employees were not making that much. It it, it was successful when when that was happening because even like his time frame of like he was talking about like it being a hip hop club and then it became like a trans whatever club, but in hip-hop nights, we were making a lot of money. No, he said that his employees made between $200 and $250 a, uh, a night every time they work. So why are you saying back then that you made 1000 to $1,500 a night? Because we were making that much money. We were. Okay. We have a paycheck from Fate where it says that you made $985 for a whole month of your no, tips. Yeah, that was, that was the credit card tips. It, right. There's... Whenever you and whenever you work in the nightclubs, if you if they pay cash, like mm -hmm. whatever the tips are, that's like your money. When it's credit card, then that's when they do like the percentage, and then that's when it's that's why we got that that percentage for the month. Like I guess they added everything up for the whole month. I understand. Ramsey Neighbor says that ninety percent of their sales was in credit cards. No, it wasn't. It's credit card sales. Well, that's what he testified to, right? I, I understand that. That's mm -hmm. why we wanted to get those records so that it could show it, but they didn't have the records available. If you were making $1,500 in cash every night at Club Fate, why were you making only $985 in credit card tips then? That was the like the percentage. I can't recall how much the percentage was. So every single time in the month, that they would collect all the percentages from the credit cards that's the check that we would that we would get if you were making fifteen hundred dollars a night in club fate why were their checks bouncing if they were that successful we were we, when it's cash when the patrons pay cash and it's mm -hmm. a hip-hop club they're paying their cash yes. to the club for yes. the drinks Right yes, and then yeah. whatever the t our tip out is i understand that that's the money that you can keep i understand yes, that I'm saying, why were your checks bouncing from fate if I, you were making $1,500 there every time you work? Objection, speculation. I, Overruled. I can't recall why the, the checks were bouncing. That, it's because fate was not a successful nightclub, right? It was They weren't making money. Even on, like, if you if you look back and you'll see all the events that they, they had, we would have artists come in there. It was a very successful nightclub. Okay, so successful that Yindra says that you left because you were not getting paid. Because of those bounce checks. Right. After a while, there's some, whenever you work in clubs, there's times where it's like you're making good money and uh -huh. then it'll kind of die out. That's why we switch from place to place. I understand that, but you're saying that you made $1,500 in cash per night when you were I understand paid. that, yes. Right. The owner says it did not take off it was not successful, they made $200 per shift. I understand what you're saying. And your checks were bouncing from there, from what, you're not in your bank records. Objection. Isn't that true? Hold on a second. If she could let the witness finish answering, I'm gonna right, object to let, Let's let the witness finish answer. Let's ask a question and then go to an answer. All right, I want people talking over each other. What's the question, Ms. Dugan? Isn't that true? I'm trying to explain to you that that's why they needed the records because it will show on the records how much we were making. We were making a lot of money. I worked there. Okay. Why would you leave Fate then where you're making so much money and go to Hollywood Live? I, I, I believe I did w both or one kind of overlapped with the other. I can't quite remember. You said when your attorney was asking you questions that you worked at Fate and then you left and you went to Hollywood Live. And that's what Yindra said too. And I believe I went back to Fate after that. I just, I can't, I can't fully recall, but 
I know when I was working in Hollywood Live, I was doing bottle service and I was a bartender and I was making really good money in Hollywood when I was bartending. Okay. And Yindra said that she made, she told us how much she made per night. But Yindra was working as a bottle service in that club. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the same amount of money and I've already explained that before. So you were working in, in as a bartender in, yes, Hol in Hollywood Live? Okay. And how much money were you making a night at Hollywood Live? I don't recall in that club, but I know that I was making pretty good money because you can work there throughout the week as well whenever they have events as well. Was it less than fate or more than fate that you were making as a bartender? Live? Yes, whatever you did at Hollywood um, Live. It might be a little bit lower than being a bottle service in fate, but I can't recall this exact amount. Well, then why making. did you leave fate where you're making $1,500 a night to go to Hollywood Live where you would make less? And I told you at that time, too, that sometimes we have peak seasons and it starts dwindling down so that maybe that's why I went to Hollywood. I can't recall. This was back in 2014. You said that you were working in liquor promotions. What's the name of the company that you worked for? I was trying to remember it. Um, you guys didn't pull any records for that either? You have bank records from Encore Worldwide and CO. Is that where you worked for liquor promotion? That was way back. That, that was way back. I did other promotions for, I believe, Absolute. I cannot think no, of the, the name of the company that you worked for. I, I can't recall. I can't recall. Okay, was it Encore Nationwide? One of them, yes, ma'am. Okay, so that was a liquor promotion company that we have here that you worked for from January to December of 2013? If that's what's on my records, yes, ma'am. Okay, and then what's CO? I don't recall. Okay, so then you stopped liquor promotions in December of 2013. I, I don't recall the dates. You said Encore Nationwide was, a, was the business that you yeah. worked for? Okay, so then if your last paycheck is in December of 2013, that's when you stopped liquor promotions, right? If that's what's on your records, I just know that I worked for another liquor promotion, but I I don't know if it was Encore as well. And you said that in certain liquor stores, the owner would allow you to get tips when you handed out drinks. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that you think at the time they gave you paychecks. That's what you said? At the time, maybe. I honestly cannot recall from 20, what? 14 at that time too? 2013, yeah. 2013, I can't. I'm asking you about what your attorney asked you. Is your... Is your, when you were working at liquor promotions though, you said just sometimes you would get tips if the owner allowed that to happen of yes, the liquor store. If that's what I had said, yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Today, you know, you said that this 2014, this cash bike was from your nightclub work and then from Sigfredo Garcia. How much of it was from Sigfredo Garcia? I can't recall the amount. You don't remember? No, ma'am. When you were showing me that chart, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I wish I could remember. I don't remember because you're asking me exact amounts and where I worked and well, he didn't. I can't remember. He didn't provide you much money that often, right? It wasn't like a steady thing. Not that I can recall now. So I mean, it's whenever he, I guess he will, he will come up on something. Then he would he would give it to me. If he showed up and handed you five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, thirteen thousand two hundred dollars, that's something that you would remember, right? That never happens. It's not that it never happens. I told you, like it would happen. I don't I don't know the exact amount that he would give me. I don't want to commit to an amount that you're trying to tell me. I can't remember back in 2014. In your prior testimony, you said that he did not, and I'm looking at page 60, lines 18 through 25, you said that he did not steadily give you cash, he did not have a set date that he'd give you anything. Sometimes he would was there ever, you were asked, was there ever a time when he'd come to you and your attorney asked, well, would you consider a thousand dollars a significant amount of cash? You said yes. Would you, would then he give you a significant amount of cash? And you said yes. So you never said in that prior statement that he gave you anything more than a thousand dollars. 
Um, which which page number? Page again? sixty. Sixty, and in which line? Lines eighteen through twenty-five. I just said that there wasn't like a set amount that he would that he had to give me anything. Right. It, and your, it would be whatever he had. Your attorney asked, did he give, you know, would you consider a thousand dollars a lot when he, if he would give you a thousand dollars and you said yes, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So a thousand dollars, him coming and giving you a thousand dollars, that would be a lot from him. For my testimony. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so if he came and gave you $5,000 in July or October or 10,000 or 13,000 in August, that would be very abnormal. It wouldn't be abnormal. It would just, I mean, I, you're trying to say if I could remember that amount? No, I'm saying that before you said $1,000 was it would be, have been a significant amount. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So if he was giving you more than that, that's something that you would remember. That would be significant, right? Yes, yes, that would be a significant amount. But you don't remember. You have I no idea. Remember. Isn't it true that the reason that you move on? I want to ask you about this night at Yardbird you told us about. Yes, ma'am. In your prior testimony, did you have any indication that Sigfredo Garcia knew you were at dinner there or knew that you had gone there for dinner? No, ma'am. Okay, so Sigfredo Garcia didn't say anything to you that would lead you to believe that, was, that he that, knew you were at dinner. Yeah, that was the Garfield. first time I, I mean, not the first time this time around, but I heard it through the trial. Okay, the, so you had no indications that he knew that? No, ma'am. Okay. And the whole July 1st jet ski incident, that was, you said, the same day as the voicemail to Harvey Adelson from Charlie Adelson? Yes, I'm sorry, from Sigredo Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, so with this wire, Charlie Adelson gets contacted by his mom. She says she was given paperwork, which turns out to be this article about the murder. She says this TV probably cost $5,000. You agree with me that TV sounds like their code for this murder, right? Rejection, lack of personal knowledge. Overruled, overruled, if you know. I don't know, ma'am. Then Donna Adelson tells Charlie that it has to do with the two of them and the man mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Right? Yes, ma'am. And then Charlie calls you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Why did he call you? I have no idea. You don't know? No, ma'am. I don't know if that's before or after or when he spoke to his mom or when they mentioned my name or when he said ex-girlfriend. Like, it's been going round and round. I'm confused myself. Okay, and you said that in your last testimony, I'm looking at page 154, lines 4 through 9. Which lines, ma'am? 154, uh -huh. lines four, 4 through 9.
Yes, was, I was saying that I'm his last ex-girlfriend. That's what you said in 2019, right? Yes, ma'am. That you were his last ex-girlfriend. Yes, to my okay. knowledge, yes. We've had testimony during this trial, though, that he's had several girlfriends since you dated, though, yeah. between that and the bump, right? Yeah, that's, but I was explaining here that I'm his last ex-girlfriend. Like, I was his, he was dating June, I think, at that time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know about Whitney, so I was his last ex-girlfriend you didn't know about Whitney no I just I heard about it now wasn't that like his first serious girlfriend after you and him broke up I don't know I'm that's why I'm getting confused because I'm learning so many things from here that I don't know when I knew that that was his girlfriend or I knew of that girlfriend I I know about June because she testified over here okay, I mean, you knew that he was talking to lots of girls Yes, ma'am. And dating lots of girls. Yes, ma'am. And you would actually chastise him in, in the messages about like him dating so many girls, moving them into his house, letting them drive his cars, right? Yes, ma'am. And you would check in with him about these girls. So you would say, you know, are you still talking to this girl, right? Uh, I might have mentioned it, but just to say it, you'd have to show me. Okay. In December of 2015, you say, are you still talking to the lame chick, the girl who's hot, who's really not, and you said yes, or are you still seeing her? Yeah, but I don't know which one that is. Okay. I guess my point is, you know that you you knew that you were not his last ex-girlfriend. I, To my knowledge, I was his last ex-girlfriend because he was dating June. Mm -hmm. Didn't really know. I didn't know about Whitney. I don't know if I've learned it from, from trial, but I was his last ex-girlfriend. If he was dating June... And he dated me. I'm his last ex-girlfriend. Well, by your own admission, in the wiretap call, you say you've had a million ex-girlfriends, right? I understand that, but I'm saying I'm his last ex-girlfriend. We're talking about this. Right. But he had, you and him had broken up in the fall of 2014. And this bump is in the spring of 2016, right? You'd been together with Sigfredo Garcia again for a year at that point, at the time of the bump. At that point, okay. Right. He had dated tons of girls in between that, right? I believe so. Okay. You were not his last sex girlfriend then. But I'm saying from the timeline from June, like June, the girl June. Right. I was his last sex girlfriend. We were talking about it in here. Like you're talking about the, wasn't this from the that was bump? from October. Of from the bump though? The like, transcript you're looking at is from October of 2019 when you say you were his last ex-girlfriend at the time of the bump. That's what you said last time was the reason that he called you when an ex-girlfriend was mentioned. But and that's what I'm saying. But you're, you're talking about a specific date on this, what's going on right now, too. This is not, not on the 19th. This is the transcripts from the 19th. Right. I'm saying, though, that you knew you were not his last ex-girlfriend. Isn't that true? I'm confused because I'm saying that I was his last ex-girlfriend. What are you talking okay. about from when we were talking in Dolce Vita? Right. So you okay. thought you thought that you were his last ex-girlfriend. Objection. Before. Accent. I'm so judge. So you're going to ask it one more time. Yes, sir. You believe you were his last ex-girlfriend yes, before the bump, and that's the reason he called you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And he called you because he wanted you to deal with this for him, right? I don't know if this is the reason why he had mentioned my name and why he wanted me to call. Okay, well, even before, though, that you knew your name was mentioned, you were willing to help him with the problem, right? I was listening to him. I don't know at that moment if I, I was saying that I was willing to help him. Okay, I want you to look at your that same page, 154, lines 17 through 19. In 2019, you said, before your name was mentioned, you were willing to help him with that problem. I said, I said yes, ma'am. Okay. And you're asked by Charlie Adelson to call this number. You don't know why he's asking you to do this other than you're his last ex-girlfriend. You, and then the person that you get to call the number coincidentally just happens to be 
the shooter of the crime that Charlie Adelson thinks he's being blackmailed for, right? I mean, can you ask your question one more time? You were asked by Charlie Adelson to call this number yes. on the article. Yes. You got someone else to do that for you, right? Yeah, I asked Sigfredo to do it. So you coincidentally get the person who was the shooter of this crime that Charlie Adelson is being blackmailed. I mean, right? I was just asking Sigfredo to call the number. Okay, and just coincidentally, he also, he's the shooter. I didn't even know about any of that until the trial. Okay, so that is a coincidence. I, if the, in your opinion, I believe so. All right. Um, I, no, I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm saying you're saying that that's a coincidence. You didn't actually have anything to do with it. No, ma'am. And you didn't actually know what it was about or who you were getting to call for that reason, anything? No, ma'am. Other than the fact that they said um, Katie and Tutho. Yeah, and when, when Charlie Adelson told you that his mom said it has to do with Tuto and Tato, why didn't you say, you know exactly who that is, Charlie. Tuto is Sigfredo. No, he was saying it in different ways, and then that's why I'm... I never corrected him. I know like they've asked me about that before. I didn't know that I had to correct them and say, well, you know him, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the father of my kids. Like, why are you saying the name different? And he said that though multiple times. He said, I don't even know who Tudo is. He said that on the phone and he said that in Dolce Vita, didn't he? Um, on the phone, I think I heard it, but on the Dolce Vita, I don't remember. And you just, though, you just didn't correct him, just didn't ask why I he just was acting didn't, like he didn't know who Tudo was. That's the whole reason why I'm even in here, because I wasn't asking the questions. Why don't you ever mention Garcia's name to Charlie Adelson? Why don't I ever mention his name? Right. Like the Tuto? No, why don't you ever say Tudo or Garcia to Charlie Adelson? Why do you just say he this, he that? I never mention his name to him. Right. Why not? I just don't like I'm not going to be like saying I don't know I just I didn't. Why don't you ever mention Charlie's name to Sigfredo Garcia? I've always referred to him like my friend or vice versa like I always say my friend. I don't think they want to hear about each other's name whenever I'm mentioning them. So whenever you talk to Garcia about Charlie Adelson you always say that person or my friend. Or my friend yeah. Okay I mean if you if you called him and are talking to him about that person well, how does he know who you're talking about? Did I did I ever message him saying that person in the wiretap call? Yeah, you were you're talking to Sigfredo Garcia and referring to Charlie as that person. I I don't recall. Why don't you just say Charlie? I never mentioned either one of their names because I don't know. I just never. I just didn't. I mean, isn't the reason though that you never say their names is because you are all afraid that law enforcement might be listening. Well, apparently everybody had a burner phone, so why would anybody even be talking on the phone? Charlie called you. Charlie said that he I, wanted the problem flushed. That problem was this bad guy that was trying... not in evidence. Overruled. That was trying to extort his mom? That was a joke. Okay. Um, but he wanted you, you were the person that he wanted to take care of this problem, right? Yes, because somebody mentioned my name. We've right. gone over this. Out of all the people in the world, though, he chose you. And you're saying that... Because they mentioned my name. Okay. Today... And I'm, Tuto's name. And then mentioned Tato's name. So, yeah, that's why I was confused. All right. What happened in the car before y'all went to Dolce Vita? I don't even recall that. That's what I was asking when they said that there's a 10-minute meetup in a car. Like, where's that video or where's that? Did he search you for a wire? You saw him Charlie on Charlie? Yeah. No, because I don't even recall that happening. All right. When did you find out that Dan Markell was murdered? I believe I found that when, when Sigfredo got arrested. Okay, so that was the first time that you'd ever heard of Dan Markell, his brother-in-law, being murdered. Yes, ma'am. Charlie Adelson never told you that. No, ma'am. And you and him talk all the time. Not all the time. You'll see the phone records. It shows. I've seen them, and y'all talk all the time. You were just telling me earlier that like our conversations stop, like dwindle down. No, I was saying that you said that he was ghosting you. Okay. Okay. You and Charlie Adelson talk all the time, right? 
I guess so. Okay. And when Sigfredo, I mean, he never mentioned to you that Dan Markell had been murdered. No, ma'am. What was it that you thought he was saying that made national news, BBC News, Good Morning America? What was he talking? What was who saying? What was Charlie Adelson talking about? What made I don't know. I didn't even know what BBC was. You know what Good Morning America is? Yes, I, I, I know that, but I didn't. It wasn't anything that was like popping out. He never mentioned Dan Markell. He never mentioned Tallahassee. He never mentioned anything about a murder. Those things would stick out. Right. I would think that they would. But he didn't talk about that. I'm telling you. And why and, didn't you ask? I mean, what what was on Good Morning America? What was on national news? I don't remember what happened. I mean, we have the whole video, and it didn't right, even pick up anything I said. To you, what he was talking about. He didn't explain anything. He was saying scenarios. Okay. In the Dolce Vita video, he's saying it's either somebody trying to blackmail his family or it's the cops working undercover. That's Why right. would it be the police? Why would the police be investigating his family? I don't know. Why isn't your first question, why in the world would the cops be running an undercover investigation on your family? I don't even know if I ever mentioned that. I don't know. Don't remember what happened in 2014. Looking at page 155, lines 3 through 11. You were asked why would it be the cops, page 155, lines 3 through 11. You were asked why it would be the cops. You said, I don't know, because he's always talking about the cops. Mm -hmm. You were asked, but didn't you ask him why the cops would be running an undercover operation on his mother? And you said, no, ma'am. So I didn't ask. Right. You didn't ask. Why no. wouldn't you ask? Why would the cops be running an investigation on your family? I don't know. That's what I. That's the whole reason of why he was meeting up with me because he doesn't even know what was going on now i see that he did right I mean, we're not talking about him though i'm saying you didn't ask why his the, his, the cops would be running an undercover investigation on his family did you Hello. no ma'am okay and this may be the third time objection asked and answered all right that was asked and answered okay let's move on i want to ask you about this dolce vita video yes ma'am Give me more volume. Give me more volume. Okay. Your, your number is on the headset. Okay. Just tell me.
All right, so Charlie Adelson says in that clip. Well, objection, Judge, as to what Charlie Adelson said. Overruled. This is, uh, she can give her interpretation. It's up to the jury to decide, but she can ask the question. When he says at the very beginning of that clip, if they had any evidence, we'd already be gone to the airport by now. Objection. What did you understand? I didn't hear that. Overruled. I didn't even hear anything that the, the recording was saying. You didn't hear but any I did. of that? I didn't hear anything that you, like the line that you just said, I did not hear that on the recording. When that recording started, you didn't hear him say, if they had any evidence, we would have already gone to the no, airport by now. So you had no idea of what he was talking about, evidence of what? I don't know, ma'am. If he did say that, what evidence of what? I wouldn't know. I don't know what I said. Okay, so in the next statement, when he's saying, if they bug your phone, you're still not talking about any of this? I mean, what are you not talking about? I don't know what he's talking about. You couldn't hear anything that he said? No, ma'am. Okay. Maybe my volume is not high enough. Sometimes it's just that I'm at the beginning of the clip that time when he says if we had any evidence we would have already gone to the airport by now uh, the only thing i caught was bug phone okay I, I didn't hear anything in the beginning if he had said to you if they had any evidence we'd already be gone to the airport by now what was he talking about evidence of what i have no idea i told you he was saying scenarios and i can't remember what he was talking about at that time so he wouldn't have been trying to ease your mind let you know if this is the cops they don't have anything on us no when he says, if, even if they bug your phone, and at the end he says, you still have not been talking about this. I didn't, what have you not been talking about on your phone? I didn't hear anything that said anything about me not talking on the phone. When, they, when he was talking about, even if they bug this, even if they bug your phone, okay. at the end of the clip, he says, you still have not been talking about this. So even if your phone is bugged, you're but still not talking about But is he implying to me, like, he's, he might have been saying scenarios. You guys are keep taking things out of context, and it's not, I don't even know. I can't answer that question if I don't know the whole thing. Okay, so I'm, I'm telling you what I'm hearing on here, and I'm asking you about it. What you're, you're hearing? Judge, that's well, improper. All right, I don't want to get argumentative. You've already asked and answered that question. Let's yes, sir. move on. You never went to Tallahassee, did you? No, ma'am. And you never shot anybody, did you? No, ma'am. I want to play the next clip for you. He's telling you there that you have to be able to put the person at the scene at the time in order to prove a crime. You can't just say, oh, my brother did it, or oh, I shot JFK. You've got to have evidence. That's what he's telling you, right? Okay. Is that, that's what he's telling you, right? I mean, that's what I said on the recording. What is he talking about? I have no idea. That's what I'm telling you. He keeps talking in scenarios. I don't know what he's talking about. Right. And last time when you when you testified in 2019, you said that he was just talking in scenarios. You didn't have any specific member memory about what. Exactly. Right? I didn't remember anything specific. Right. Your attorney asked you today whether if last time you explained what was in the Dolce Vita video. Yes, what you explained was that you remember him talking about scenarios. You didn't know what they were. You didn't have any specific memory of that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, 
and you don't know why he's trying, he's letting you know that, hey, in order to prove a crime, they have to put the person at the scene of a crime. You don't know why. I don't know why. And that one, he tells you, if this person went to the cops, they're going to be asked, you know, well, where's the weapon? Did you witness it? No, you just heard a rumor. Well, that's worth zero. You have to get them on a wire. You have to get the person to confess. Outside of that, there's no evidence. That's what you heard, right? Um, parts of it, yes, ma'am. Okay. And he's saying, right, that if you guys all keep quiet, no one's going to have any evidence of you, right? I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't know what he was talking about. He's saying scenarios over and over. Why is he talking to this about, about this with you? I don't know. What is he saying the cops aren't going to have evidence of? I have no idea. You had no clue? No. And you didn't ask either, did you? That's your testimony? I don't remember what we were talking about or if I asked him. I mean, I'm re I hear myself responding, but... Right, but you, you did say that you never asked why the cops would be running this undercover investigation, right? I believe so. Okay. You were in this Prius that Garcia and Rivera rented for the July trip to Tallahassee. You were in it at some point, right? No, ma'am. You never sat in it? Never sat there. Never rode with Garcia just to get food or something? No, ma'am. All right. The father of your children was in that Prius, though, right? Well, with the, with the picture that they've showed, you see, yeah, he was in that Prius. Okay. And... In this video, Charlie Adelson is giving you examples of how just because a person was in a car that someone used to commit a crime, that doesn't mean anything, right? On what video? On the Dolce Vita video. I don't recall that part. Okay. Okay. 
so here in those two clips we listened to, he was saying you have to be able to put the person at the scene at the time, not in the car. Let's say you sat in the car, right? Then I go commit a crime, but your DNA is in there. And I said, Katie was in my car and she did this horrible crime. Okay, they get your DNA in the car and it, okay, okay, Katie was in the car. No, that means Katie sat in the car for two minutes and got out. Katie has nothing to do with me robbing Burger King. That's what you heard, right? Um, parts of it, yes, ma'am. Okay, and then he gives you another rental car example. He said, if you have a car and you can link this person to renting that car that's used at the scene of the crime, you also have to prove who was driving that day. You know, they could have rented it and lent it to a friend. Then he gives you another one, doesn't he? He says, you rent a car and I asked to borrow it. I drive to Orlando, rob a McDonald's and come back. Yeah, you rented it, but you were out. You didn't even know I took your car. Doesn't, isn't that what you heard? Parts of it, yes. Why is he giving you so many rental car examples? I wish I knew. That's what I'm saying. Like he's saying scenarios. Don't you think it's kind of odd? Why is he saying all those scenarios in front of other people or whatever? If like apparently if he thought that I was, what did you say earlier that I'm wearing a wire? No, I think that he didn't think you were wearing a wire. I think he thought that y'all were in a loud restaurant and he's trying to ease your mind. And he's t saying to you, right, that he's saying. But why is he, he keeps explaining himself, like, and he says, I don't have anything to do with it. Why is he trying to convince me that he has nothing to do with it when right, I don't right, know right, what right. he's talking I'm going to stop. I'm you. sorry. Okay. She's going to ask the questions and you're going to respond, okay? He is trying to ease your mind because the car that Garcia and Rivera rented to drive up here and kill Dan Markell had been on the news, right? I don't know of that. You were nervous that police might be able to connect them to having rented it or been in that car, weren't you? Why would I be nervous? I never even knew of it. You never knew that the car was on the news? I knew from when Sigfredo got arrested, and I think they put a picture of that, of the Prius. He was trying to tell you in that video that it doesn't matter if they rented a certain car or were seen in a certain car. Police have to be able to put them at the scene of the crime at the time, right? That's what he had said on the on the video, but I don't know what he was talking about. So he's just talking about that. You have no he's idea. He's giving why. different scenarios. Okay. One of the scenarios he gave was he said, you know, it could be the cops, you know, trying to run an undercover investigation, or it could be somebody trying to blackmail his family. That was the other scenario, right? Yes, ma'am. Why did he think somebody would be extorting money from his family? I don't know. That's what he was trying to figure out. Wouldn't you be curious as to why someone was trying to blackmail his family? Would I be curious? Right. I was curious. That's why I sat there and I listened. Right. But you never asked him, why would somebody be trying to blackmail your family? Why are the cops doing this investigation on your family? I don't know if I asked them at that time or not, because you apparently they didn't even... You did not, right? Mm -hmm. Well, apparently then I don't, I don't, because I don't recall. But if that video said, or like it picked up anything that I was saying, then I would know what I was talking about. Well, you said in 2019 that you did not. Okay, Never so asked I don't. that, right? And now, though, the video is audible, right? And it's pretty obvious you would have known what was going on in Objection. order to listen to all this. Oh, evidence. All right, ask a question, Ms. Yes, Steven. sir. All right, let's listen to one more. about 12, 15 seconds in there, you heard him say that 
you know, if this was somebody blackmailing his family, this is somebody who knows information. That's what he said to you, right? It, that's what it said on the video. Is that what you heard? That this is someone no, who knows information? No, all I heard, I heard a little bit in the end, um, but I didn't hear the first sentence, like what you were just saying right now. What is he talking about that these people know information about? I don't know. I keep telling you, I don't even remember. Clip, he's saying if there's this is a bad guy there's two ways of dealing with it we can go ahead and call the police they'll contact him arrange a setup take him down but then he'll be telling everything he knows or else he's going to serve 10 years in prison and the next thing you know that person's singing and he's going to start calling your name out and my parents are going to have to say they're going to be asked the story of what happened isn't that what you heard I didn't hear that, like not all of everything that you're saying, but like I said, I don't know what he's talking about. Well, you heard him say at the end of that clip that they're going to be calling your name out, that black My name? Right. No. I did not hear that. But this bad guy who knows is going to tell the cops information, why would he be calling your name out? I don't know. All right, got one more.
So in that clip, after he explains that this bad guy could tell information to the police, could call your name out, he says, this is my idea. And he gives you very precise instructions, doesn't he? In yeah, he was talking about the calling mm -hmm. to say to say it's, um, yeah. He told you to say, my friends have no idea what you're talking about. And frankly, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about either, but the name sounds familiar of who's incarcerated. Yes, ma'am. Whose name did he think sounded familiar? I believe it's because his mom got um, bumped and said that you have to help your friend's Tato or something. Right. Like your brother Tato. I don't know. He's talking about Tato or Tuto. Okay. Um, the name Tato and Tuto were familiar to you. Yes, right? ma'am. And you never had to tell him who Tuto and Tato were. He knew and you knew. Right? I don't know if he knew. Well, yeah, he did. He, know, he knew Tuto's name. Okay. I don't know about Tato. Tato was the one who was incarcerated, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you knew that? I knew he was incarcerated by the feds, but I don't know where he was at. All right, and he said, so I'm going to give you something as charity to help the less fortunate, but do not contact these people again or they're going to the police. The only reason we're doing it is because of karma. And the whole time that you're talking, this is what he's telling you to do, right? Okay. You're, he wants you to say, I don't know what's going on, and only use the words help and charity right? Okay. He really didn't want you to give this guy any information about what you knew, did he? Didn't want to give who? The he really didn't want you to give this blackmailer any information about what you knew, right? He's saying, don't say anything else, right? No, he's just t he's trying to convince me. Now, I'm, I, 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 how many times I've listened to it, he's trying to convince me to do this. If I was in any way, shape, or form in this with him, why would he throw me to the cops and tell me to because say you this. were the ex-girlfriend who took care of this problem for him you are his connection to these people he wants you to take care of it no they mentioned my right. name they mentioned tuto's name right and then they mentioned about a brother being incarcerated which was tato i know and then he starts so, talking about sigfredo garcia right after this that clip right that we just heard he starts talking to you about Sigfredo Garcia, doesn't he? Refresh my mind. Like, what Charlie was he Adelson saying? starts talking to you about Sigfredo Garcia, doesn't he? I don't know who he was talking about. I can't take my 
In that clip we just heard, he's saying, now he's fucking with him, he's fucking with his wife. If he's fucking with the king himself, you better kill him because he's going to be a big problem. He knows who you are. And if he can't do it, have someone else do it. Right? Yeah, but he's not talk it's talking about Duto there. Like, where? He's not? No. Okay. Well, let's keep listening, but one second. He's telling you, though, in that part that I just talked about, how mad Garcia needs to be about this, right? Some guy is messing with you, putting your name out there as part of this, and you need to kill him or he's going to be a big problem. He either needs to do it or have somebody else do it, right? That's not, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's, I'm, I don't think he's talking about Secreto there. Okay. Uh, when, when he says that to you, why, why don't we see you jumping up from the table? Why don't we see you raising your voice saying, whoa, whoa, kill? What are you talking about? We don't... Yeah, I would have said something like that, but I didn't even know what he's saying about kill. But obviously, I didn't react that way because it wasn't something that's like... Well, you heard him say, he better kill him or he's going to be a big problem. Either he can do it or have someone else do it. You heard him say that, right? Part of it, yes, ma'am. Okay. And you didn't jump out and run out of there? No. Okay. You didn't raise your voice and start, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not being a part of anything like this, did you? No, but he, if he's like saying scenarios and he's talking about stuff, like I'm probably not even, like it's it's nothing that like made me like, oh my God, like what are you talking about? Like, why are you even talking? Period. Charlie said, so help me God, if they fuck with my family, it's going to be Nazi shit. This will be done. I mean, Katie, I don't care what I have to spend. I swear to God. He's telling you that he needs this guy killed and he doesn't care what he has to spend. That's Objection. what he's saying, right? Overruled. I mean, if that's what he's saying, I, I, can't, I can't say what he was stating it for. What, what did you understand him to mean when he said that? Charlie's always talking about different. You've heard people say that he's always talking about some weird stuff. Like that's not something that like, oh, somebody is messing with his family. I, I get that. And somebody's trying to blackmail his mom or whatever, but it's not to the point where I was like, you know, like it didn't make me like, whoa. I have one question. He said to you, you better kill him or he's going to be a big problem. He can't, if he can't do it, have someone else do it. And he didn't care what he had to spend, right? Objection. Ask and answer. That's been asked and answered. You seem pretty calm when he's saying this to you. Wouldn't you agree with that? No, I don't know how my demeanor was. That's what I'm saying. I don't, I wasn't like, whoa, like I didn't run out and jet out of there. Had he said that to you before? Like when he wanted his brother-in-law killed? Said what? He's never he spoken about- He wanted someone killed. He, he didn't care how much he had to spend to do it. No, ma'am. He's never spoken about- Professor Markel or murder or having anything to do with that. That's why it didn't raise anything to me. I want to show you one thing. Just going to make the screen. So I, this is the same clip we've been listening to, and I've been pausing this one. Let's keep listening and see who he was just talking about.
So right after he's telling you he needs somebody killed, he doesn't care what he has to spend, 30 seconds after that, he's checking in with you about Sigfredo Garcia. He says at 6 minutes and 57 seconds in that clip, he knows I have you on salary. You think you'd be happy to know that. I didn't hear that. You did About not a salary or nothing, no. He says he doesn't have any bad feelings towards me, does he? Our paths never cross. That I can assume that it, maybe he was talking about Sigfredo. Right. He says, I didn't know the two of you would be working out. He's talking about Sigfredo there. I believe so. Like, with what he's saying at that part, yes. Right after from what we just talked about, he's saying, this guy needs to be killed. If he can't kill him, find somebody else to do it. He's going to be a big problem. He's fucking with me. He's fucking with his wife, right? Objection, accent on tape. Overruled. He's talking about Garcia right after that. I don't know if he was talking about Garcia. You He's just, talking about Garcia now that he, the, the part that where you're saying that, oh, our paths never cross or whatever. Okay. I can assume he's talking about Sigfredo, but at that time, I don't think he's talking about Kill and all of this and saying that it was him. Why didn't he just say his name? You do admit, though, he's talking to you about Garcia right after he's telling you that he needs to have someone killed. And if he can't do it, find someone else who can do it. Objection. Accent answer. Asked and answered. All right. So what he's trying to do when he's checking in is he have any bad feelings towards me? I keep you on, I have you on salary. You think you'd be happy about that? He's trying to make sure that Garcia doesn't have a reason not to help you with this, right? I didn't hear anything about the salary and he's saying keeping him keeping me happy. There was no overlap in us dating. I keep you on the payroll, right? I, I'm not going to say yes to that because I don't believe that that's what. So was he checking with you in that about, clip we just heard to see if Garcia had any bad blood against him? Not at that part, no, ma'am. All right. Next, after he's checked, he tells you what he needs done. He's checking with you about Garcia. Then... He says to you, you know it. I don't have to sit here and tell you what I would do for you. I show you what I do for you. You know how I am. I look for things to do. What's your objection? It's motions in limine, Judge, just in, in terms of Miss Duguid's interpretation of what is being right. said. It's going to be up to the jury to, to decide. That's overruled. Isn't that what he said? Uh, keep going, ma'am. He's saying, I look for things to do for you. You don't have to ask me for shit. I'm the one that's like, hey, someone's birthday is coming up. I got you, right? That's what he said, yes. Okay, just like when he's offering to send you and your mom on a cruise, right? Well, he offered it, but like I told you, I would never went on a cruise with Paying my mom. Paying for the uh, Dominican vacation, right? He looks for things to do for you. 
Okay. To keep you happy. I guess. When you were with Charlie Adelson, you were they you were sleeping with both Charlie Adelson and Garcia at the same time, right? I mean they I weren't aware can't. of each other. I mean they knew of each other, but they didn't know you were with both of them at the same time, right? Not that I was I, I mean it might have overlapped, but I don't remember I don't remember that. Okay. I mean I don't remember if it was Charlie the same Adelson time. didn't know that there was any overlap. <clears throat> That he didn't know. I don't know what he knew. Okay, well, he told you. I we we didn't have any overlap. Oh, with, with the from the video, right? And you tried to keep them separate. That was something that you did when y'all were when you were with Charlie, right? You tried to keep Garcia separate from him. Well, I didn't think they'd like each other. Right, Gar Garcia was jealous of Charlie. I believe so. We heard Charlie say he helps you out when it's somebody's birthday. Who's he talking about? I have no idea. I don't know if he's talking about Secreto because I know there was a comment about like some GoPro or whatever, but. Isn't Garcia's, when is Garcia's birthday? The 27th of April. Of April, okay. So is he talking about getting Garcia birthday presents? I Not, not to my knowledge, I don't know. I'm assuming maybe that's what he's talking about, but. Why would he get Garcia a birthday present? He always jokes about stupid things like that. Why would he get his ex-girlfriend's boyfriend a birthday present? I wouldn't know, but he'd make jokes like that before, just like the GoPro, but he never got him a GoPro camera or whatever it was. Um, after your discussion about Garcia, well, he checks in on Garcia's gang connections, right? See if those are still there? Who checks in? Charlie Adelson. Checks in. He's never evidence, been in a judge. gang. Overruled. Okay. Garcia's not in a gang. Let's look at the journal. So when I first started that clip, he said, I don't think they want to mess with his connections. And he says, is he so far removed? Does, does he still have people? Does he have anybody that he can call up that's, right? He's, I didn't even I, you didn't hear I'm that? I'm trying to like, hear what he's saying, and I didn't hear that. Okay. He then says to you at the end of that clip, listen, you giving money to somebody is not an admission of any kind of guilt. I heard that part. Okay. Guilt of what? I don't know. What would you be guilty of? Exactly. I don't know. Well, then why is he saying that to you? I don't know. You were, what did you understand it to mean? I don't know. I, don't, I can't interpret what it was happening at that time. Like, I don't know what it means. He was saying that because you were concerned that giving this $5,000 would make you look guilty, right? That it would make me look guilty? Yeah. If that's your assumption, but I, I didn't do any of that. All right, I have two more very quick ones. Yeah, I'm just going to object to the state's little subtitle. All right, it's coming on. Yes, I'm going to object to the state using any 
demonstrative or anything that has their work product or their opinion on it. All right, that's overruled. It was just uh, your identification. It meant nothing to the jury. It came up on the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, he says, let me ask you a question. When everybody was there the next day, did any of you take any money? It's not like you're driving around in a Bentley, cruising around in a mega yacht. You heard that, right? Yes, ma'am. What did you understand that to mean? I don't know, but now it kind of makes sense with everything that, you know, like with other people saying it about the money, but nobody ever got money. I don't know what. When he said when everybody there was there the next day, what day is he talking about? I don't know. Isn't he saying when everybody, you, Tuto, Tato, were together the next day after the murder when you gave them the money, none of you took it and did anything extravagant, right? None of y'all were that's what it, it's assuming. That's what it makes it look like to me. Okay. I see it now. He's checking to see y'all weren't too flashy with this that would draw attention to you, right? Okay. Objection, mischaracterization of the evidence. Overruled. In the form of a question next time, Ms. Dugan. Okay. Did you ask him what that meant? Mm, I don't recall if I did or if I didn't. Okay. Let's listen to the end of that clip and then I'll go straight into the very last one. <laughs> At the end of that conversation, in that last clip, he says, You know who this is coming from? The inside. What did you understand that to mean? I didn't understand what he was talking about. He keeps saying it has nothing to do with me. He's giving scenarios and you're misinterpreting it and I can't remember because that was from 2014. Okay, I, I did not. Did you hear him say, you know who this is coming from, the inside? He's saying that, but he's not saying it toward, like he's not implying me directly. What did you understand that to mean? I didn't know. Okay, so not the inside circle, you, him, Tato Tuto, of who knew well, how it's this murder went That's down? what I'm saying. You keep implying these things and that's not, you're taking it out of context. And I know that looks bad now with everything that we've been hearing, but it's obviously it didn't make <coughs> me like, oh my God, like I said, I didn't run out of there and think it was a big deal chose you for a reason though, right? You were the person that he chose to take care of this. I mean, I know you're saying you don't know today, but we heard you on the wiretap call. In that call, you say, I, I fuck up bitches for no reason. You say, this guy is going to have a big ass problem. I am the wrong person to God forgive him that he said the wrong fucking name. Now this is my business. You yes. said that, right? Yes, ma'am. And that's okay. taken out of context as well. well you were I pretty... was angry by that. Yeah. I'm sure you were angry. You were pretty tough in those calls, though. You were somebody who knows how to take care of things, somebody who people shouldn't mess with, weren't you? You should have played all the other calls as well. You just, one little call that I was so upset already. We've been, he's been annoying me with this different scenarios. Right. For today, all the other calls. Today. And I was 
you're acting, mm. you're pretending not to be that person. You just don't know anything about anything, didn't ask Judge, any questions. Objection. Improper question. She's pretending to be someone today. All right, I'll we'll strike the question. Ask another question. Today you're saying you don't know anything and you didn't ask any questions, right? Yes, ma'am. Why were you talking in code on the wire? I guess that's what everybody's implying is code. I know I made a comment saying, like, I'm so tired of this code shit or whatever because we're around, I'm either around my coworkers, I'm around my children, I'm around other people. So he's probably around his coworkers. You told Sigfredo, or you told Sigfredo Garcia that Ethan's clothes cost $65.70, right? Yes, ma'am. Those were actually the last four digits of the undercover, undercover phone number. That was a code, right? I just did not want to say it over the phone, somebody's phone number, because I was either at work or I don't know where I was. Why would giving a phone number cause an issue for somebody at work or one of your kids? He's trying to call some number that they want me to figure out if it's somebody blackmailing their family. Why would I say that phone number out loud? Right, but you're not saying the whole story. You've already told Garcia the story when you're at home. On the phone, you're just giving him the number. Why couldn't you just say the number? I just said it that way. You didn't say the number because you were afraid law enforcement was might be listening and you knew exactly what it was about, right? Why would I think they were listening? I wouldn't use my phone. All right, you say that... What's a, you said that you got a burner phone, and you got a burner phone the day after the police went to uh, his job, right? I never got him? the burner phone. I said Sigfredo got the burner phone when mm -hmm. after what, before he got arrested. Didn't you think it was crazy that Garcia wanted you to use a burner phone? They just went, the feds just went to go question him. And at the same time, I didn't even know that they were doing it the same exact moment that they were banging on my door. If you had nothing to do with the murder, why did Garcia get you a burner phone, not just him? I don't know. He's the one who got it. Because okay. he figured that it, it was somebody banging in his door, and then I guess that's why we wanted to talk. But you'd have the same phone number your whole life. Weren't you curious as to why he wanted you to use a burner phone now? No. You didn't ask? No. The feds just came to his job. Okay. Um... And after getting the burner phones, you fled your home. I never fled. You never stayed at your home again. I packed up myself a couple of days after, but my family you wanted... You had someone pack up your stuff. No, I packed it. If they had the cameras over there, they would have seen that I went there. I packed my stuff, and then I had one of Sigfredo's guy friends to go do the U-Haul for me because I can't lift anything. Dan Markell occurred that summer of 2014, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so he never, Sigfredo Garcia never, where did he say that he was going when you, you took him to the comfort rental car? I never took him. Okay. It's just a coincidence then that of all the places. I, I never was, knew his whereabouts or whatever around that time because we weren't even together. Okay, just a coincidence then that of all the places you could be in Miami and that he could be in Miami, you're using a cell site that services Comfort Rental at the exact moment that he's renting a car and you go straight there, time on the rental car, and you go back home. I never took him to go get a rental. Okay, so that is just a coincidence you're saying? If, if that's your opinion, yes, ma'am. And he was also in that rental car as soon as he got back from that trip to Tallahassee. That was outside of your, of your apartment, right? They had that the GPS car, ping? Yeah, the GPS ping on that parking lot, but that parking lot, other people live there. Okay. Did you ever see him in the rental car? No, I did not. Okay. And you went right back to that area later that day? Right back to what area? To the area of Comfort Rental Car. And you weren't taking the car back with him? No, I did not. I never took him to get a rental. What about when the Prius was at your house the night before the Tallahassee trip? Did he mention either of those times that he's at your house right before, right after the June trip or right before the July trip, where he was going and what he'd been doing? 
I never even knew that that Priya's car was in the parking lot. Did he just min did he say that he was about to go to Tallahassee? No, I would have remembered if he said something about Tallahassee. He doesn't know anybody in Tallahassee. What about during the 15 or 20 times that you communicated with Garcia during the June trip or the July trip? He never mentioned where he was. You never asked him where he was or what he was doing. I never asked him where he was, and he wouldn't tell me even if I was to ask him. He doesn't tell me things. What about the night of the murder? You're July 18th, when you're consistent with being at Rivera's house after you go past Yindra Mascaro's residence. Did you go to Louis Rivera's that night? No, ma'am. Where were you? I don't recall what I, where I was in July 18th. Okay, well, you were talking to Garcia, and then it shows you going up near Rivera's house, and then after that, your phone is powered off for the night, right? And that's when you go spend the night at Charlie's? I don't know what happened in July 18th. That's what it's saying on the pings or whatever. Well, you told your attorney when she was asking you questions, you did spend the night with Charlie that night, right? No, I was, I, I don't even remember where I was. I don't know if I was up north or whatever. I don't remember that day. Yindra was taking care of your kids that night, right? Well, apparently, yeah, when she had said that she took, I didn't remember that day until she mentioned that it was, it might have been that night. Okay. Yindra was taking care of your kids that night then? That's, yeah. that's what That's what I'm saying is I don't see her. My daughter was little at that time. Like, I never leave my daughter overnight. That's why it wouldn't make sense to me. I never leave my daughter, like, overnight at so somebody's Yindra house. So Yindra was not telling the truth when she No, I, I don't know if she babysat that day. I just don't remember. I don't recall ever leaving my children at night. I was living with my mom at that time. Well, if that was the case, I would have had my mom because they, they would, the kids would have been more comfortable. If Charlie invited you over, you're going up there, your phone's powered off for the night, and you're coming back for that direction that next morning. That's the route that it's showing, but I don't remember what I did that night. Well, There's you no stayed text with Charlie messages. during that time, though, right? No, I didn't. I don't remember what I was doing. Okay. What about the next morning, the morning of July 19th, when you and Garcia were at Rivera's place? Me and Garcia were in Rivera's place? Right. That was the whole situation. There were so many different versions of that story. Okay. Well, in your previous testimony, you were asked what you were doing that day, and you were shown this text. I didn't know at what time, but I was at the pool from the text. Like, I was shown the text, and mm -hmm. I guess I don't know what the timestamp was at that time. Okay. This message does not say you were at the pool or anything, right? Because you just got back from the pool at 4.54 yeah, but what time did I go to the pool? You said you saw Probably at the pool. At okay, so. So you were not at the pool at 11 a.m., like you said in your prior testimony. Well, when I was shown that, I'm pretty sure it had like a timestamp or something on it. I don't know why it said 11 at a, a specific time. Objection because you were. Proper impeachment judge, that's not what she said in 2019. Okay. If we could look at page 53, 52, lines 23 through 25, and 53, lines 5 through 7. I'm sorry, can you say that again? 52, 23 through 25, and 53, 5 through 7. Mm -hmm. Objection in proper impeachment. That's what it says. I just said that. It said, okay. All right, hold on a second. Take a let Ms. Dugan, you take a look at it first. Okay. You were asked, where were you that day? You said you took Ethan to the pool. You were shown that message. You said, do you remember what time? And you said, I believe it was 11. That's that not correct. correct. You're not reading. You're right. I'm looking no, at page 53 at the top. 
Say, I believe it was around 11 in the I morning. I believe it said around 11. All right, it's, that's, that's proper impeachment. Okay. Wow. You were not at the pool, though, around 11 a.m. that day, though, were you? For me to have said this day because I didn't remember what I was doing, and for me to come up with that time, it's because I was shown something. Well, this is these are the messages that. about you going to the pool that day. I, I see your messages now, but right. at the time when we did this, and I was shown what time I went to the pool, I wouldn't have just come up with it at 11 o'clock without seeing a text message with the time. You said in 2019 you were you were took Ethan to the pool around 11 a.m. I believe because that it, means that you wouldn't be at the money drop around 10:30 and 11 a.m. Right? Characterization of what she said in All right, that's sustained. Mr. Okay. Okay. Move on. This has been asked and answered. All right. Um, you call. We need to be mindful of the time also because yes, I have sir. to give time for redirect. I'm almost done. You call Luis Rivera during the June and July trips, you called his old number, right? That 934 number you had in your phone as Tato? I called the number, but right. I never spoke to Luis. When you couldn't get in touch with Garcia, you called that number. I believe so. And you didn't talk to Garcia because that wasn't his phone at the time, right? What, the 934 number? Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You never talked to Luis Rivera on the phone, usually. Not that I recall, no. Okay. You did talk. You did talk to him, though. You called him those two dates, and then you talked to him the day of the money drop, July nineteenth, right? It said that he had called me. Right. You called him. He called you, and then you called him back, right? I believe so. That's okay. what the call log says. And you spoke to him. You tried to call him in June and July because you knew that he and Garcia were together in Tallahassee during that time. I didn't know that they were here. Well, then why would you call Luis Rivera? I don't remember why I called him. I called him in June and in July? Yeah, on the June trip and the July trip. If he was with Garcia, maybe I was trying to get a hold of Garcia. Those were the only times all summer, though, that you called that number, though. I don't that's recall that. That's what the expert that. said? I don't recall that, that that's the only time. If you were always trying to call Rivera whenever you were looking for Garcia, you would have called it more than two times the whole summer, right? I don't recall that. And then on July 19th, the reason that y'all were talking that day, you and Luis Rivera, was because that was the day you were supposed to deliver money, right? I never delivered any money. You said, so the only time that you call him is during his June and July trip to Tallahassee and the day of the money drop that summer, and your phone locations are consistent with being at his house, but those are just all coincidences. You didn't have anything to do with this murder. That's what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Aren't you mad at Garcia and Charlie for doing this and you're innocent and you're having to answer for it? Am I mad at them? Yeah. Yeah, I've been upset. If you were mad at Garcia, I mean, just uh, not long ago, just this month, you said on a recorded call to him, I can't talk to you, I can't touch you, I can't see you, I can't feel you, and you were crying about it. Yeah, he's the father of my kids, so I'm going to love him forever. And this $17,000 cash spike during the six weeks after the murder being put on the Adelson payroll, even though you didn't collect rent, you made the one appointment, your $4,000 breast augmentation, all of that within the two months of the murder, those are just all coincidences to it. You didn't have anything to do with this. It, the money had nothing to do with anything that you did. I've explained everything already. Okay. All the favors that Charlie did for you after you and him broke up, the trips, Nothing, nothing with that had to do anything with the murder. That was just a coincidence, too. Just him being nice. Mm, I guess so. Okay. The fact that he called you out of all of his ex-girlfriends after his mom just said an ex-girlfriend was mentioned. That's a coincidence, too. I guess so. The fact that your husband committed a murder for your boyfriend. That's also just a coincidence. You didn't have anything to do with it? I didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, those are some pretty unbelievable coincidences, right? Objection in process. That's sustained. Okay, you either have the worst luck or you did this, right? Objection in proper question. Sustained. Garcia would never do anything to help Charlie Adelson, would he? 
I wouldn't think that, but with everything that's been, that's all in the evidence and stuff, I mean, it looks pretty bad. And you said in 2019, he would never I, do anything. I did say him. that because I would never think that they would like each other in any way or do favors for each other. Okay. I and see why I'm in the middle. I'm smack in the middle. I right. see it. That's why I'm fighting for my life. And so you did say Garcia would never do anything to help Carly Adelson. In my 2019 testimony, yes, I did mention that. Right. And in opening, your attorney said that there was definitive proof of a link between Garcia and Charlie. What is it? What did my attorney say? No, what's the link between Garcia and Charlie? That they knew each other or they spoke to each other. How? I don't know. Apparently, everything's being done behind my back. That's why. That's all. Thank you. Redirect. Ms. McBanwell. Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about your memory. Yes, ma'am. All right. Miss Dugan was not present at Dolce Vita, was she? No, she was not. Okay. And as much as she's trying to insert her opinion as what is being said, it's just that, right? Yes, ma'am. You have heirs, correct? Yes, ma'am. So does the jury? Yes, yeah. ma'am. So they can listen for themselves of what happened at that, that, that restaurant. Yes, ma'am. Now, I do want to talk about some things that Miss Dugan purposely left out that we could all hear on that video. Like the time when he said, if they are the cops, I'm happy because I have nothing to hide. Yes, ma'am. You remember when that was played, Miss Dugan skipped over that part and went to what she thought she heard afterwards, right? Yes, ma'am. And that's because that makes no sense. Of course. If you are all involved in a homicide together, why is Charles Adelson telling you that if it's the cops, I'm happy? That makes no sense. No sense. Okay, because if you were all involved in a homicide and it was the cops, what would happen? He'd get arrested. And if you were involved, what would happen? I'd get arrested. All right. Now, she also brought up all of these portions of what Charlie Adelson is supposedly saying, okay? Yes, it's clear that half of that entire video is missing. Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about how that enhancement came to be. You provided testimony back in 2019, right? Yes, ma'am. That's before the state was able to create this new audio. Yes, ma'am. So when you testified in 2015 and answered questions, yes, you had no idea that they would even be able to create this new audio. Yes, ma'am. That's what I stated, that everything in my testimony is consistent with everything that was on the video that they just enhanced. Now, let's get to that about just enhanced, right? You were set for trial in February of 2022, right? Yes, ma'am. Valentine's Day, you were supposed to go to trial. Yes, ma'am. And then the state provided us with this magic, well, this new enhancement. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And we actually agreed to reset your case. Yes, ma'am. So that we could all get the enhancement. Yes, ma'am. Because as far as we concerned, it would only contain evidence to exculpate you. Yeah, exactly. If you thought that there would be anything on there that would prove your guilt, you would have gone to trial in February. Exactly. You wouldn't have even given them an opportunity if you thought anything on that video. Yes, ma'am. Would have come up against you. Yes, ma'am. And as we sit here and listen to this video, this covert undercover thing that they did, do you hear any direct evidence in there of something to do with the homicide? That's why I stated that I've never heard Dan Markell's name, I never heard homicide, I never heard murder, I never heard Tallahassee, nothing. And I'm telling you that he is going on and on about different scenarios. Like one of the clips that she played where he says, he starts talking about a scenario like if I go to Orlando and I rob a Burger King. There's no robbery of a Burger King, right? Yes, ma'am. Are you here for a robbery of a Burger King? No, ma'am. Okay. But that's what he, one of the scenarios he prevented, presented to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, he also mentioned about something about, well, Miss Dugan says, he says something about robbing a McDonald's. Yes, ma'am. Okay. He doesn't say any scenarios about a homicide. Yes, ma'am. Or a murder. Yes, ma'am. It sounds like he is just trying to justify 
why it is that they would say your name. And for me to make a phone call. Okay. How many times did he repeat to you, it's because they said your name? If uh, you can remember. On this video? Um, I, I can't recall. How many times have you had an opportunity to sit down and listen to the video that we just received a couple months ago? I haven't even seen it in its entirety because they can never get anything to the jail. And so can't this, get that evidence. Was this the, maybe the second time in this trial that you were able yes, to listen to it? This is like the second time. Okay. And we still don't know what the first half was or this time that I went to the car for 10 minutes. Like They have no record of that? Right? Apparently, that's what I, want, I wanted to know. Where was the record for that? There's no video of that? No video. Okay. And had they been able to enhance the entire audio, not just bits and pieces of what Charlie is saying, we, would, we wouldn't have to speculate about what that conversation was, right? Exactly. That's why I didn't want to commit to a certain thing that I'm saying or how I'm interpreting it because... Clearly, it wasn't big enough for me to be like, oh, my God, why are you talking about this? Or, oh, my God, we got to call the cops or me run away because you said this. It's like everything was taken out of context, just like my phone calls, just like this video. And and everything that we've all sat down and listening to, every single thing, there is no direct evidence of you being involved in a homicide. No, because they've had this video forever. I would have been arrested a long time ago. Let's talk about that. These wiretaps and this Dolce Vita, that was all known to them in May of 2016, right? I believe so. Before Sigfredo was arrested? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. They released your probable cause affidavit, right? Yes, ma'am. And said it's because there was no probable cause to arrest you. Yes, ma'am. So they didn't have probable cause to arrest you until Luis Rivera was arrested, right? Yes, ma'am. Obviously, if they had some direct evidence in those wiretaps, they wouldn't need Luis Rivera. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So everything is innuendo and speculation. Yes, ma'am. You would expect if you are wiretapping people who are involved for over 400 recorded phone calls that there would at least be one thing in there, right? Yes, ma'am. In the Dolce Vita video, you can hear that you're talking. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Your voice isn't raised. No. You don't sound like you're, well, we can't hear you at all. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So where Miss Dugan keeps asking you about things of what it is that you said, we won't know because they can't clarify your voice, right? Yes, ma'am. This case has always been focused on Charles Adelson. Yes, ma'am. The video was pointed at who? Charles. Whose voice is the only one that was able to be amplified? Charles. And you're always the person that is left in the dark. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now, going over, I want to go over some of the text message that Miss Dugan tried to commit you to try and explain what they meant, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you tell me what we talked about, I don't know, four months ago on February 23rd of this year? No, ma'am. Okay. Do you even know what day of the week it was on February 23rd of this year? No, ma'am. You were asked questions about text messages over the course of 2013 to 2016. That was, that's why I was getting a little upset because I can't remember those times and I know they want me to commit to a certain date, certain times, certain scenarios and I just like I want to be able to provide that information and I can't. Now, I'm referring to one of the exhibits that on March that was previously shown to you in regards to the text message page of 12, 11, 2013. Right? I'm showing you this. This is a snippet of a full blown conversation, right? Yes, ma'am. The tape did not include the entire conversation. Well, that's why I had asked what's, what did the rest say? Because they always take bits and pieces of everything and make it to look like something else, and it looks bad. I get it. I see it. This is my second time around. I see how it makes it look so bad. You see, when you see these things in pieces, even though it's you, you're like, this looks bad. It looks bad. And you understand why Ms. Dugan says, oh, all these coincidences. You understand that, right? Yes, ma'am. But it's because they don't have the whole story. 
Yes, ma'am. We tried to introduce some of the phone calls, right? Yes, ma'am. I don't know why not, but we couldn't. I'm going to show you another text message that was shown about Charles Davidson offering the value of trip for your mother. Okay? Can you read that to the jury, please? The I'm scared? No, right about it. Oh, by the way, she's having a major surgery for her spine on January. She has to be out for six months. That she had something was hurting on her on her spine, okay. and so a back surgery that she needed to do. This has anything to do with your cancer diagnosis later on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so Charles knew that you were going through this with your mom. Yes, ma'am. How close was it to your mom? It was very, very close. Okay. And this he was offering if you and your mom to take a trip. Yeah. Apparently, yes, ma'am. And you got the trip back, right? No, ma'am. You couldn't. You can never take that trip with her. Objection to relevance. Over, uh, just if you can ask, answer the question. Overruled. No, I can't because my mom passed away while I was in here. Okay. And you've always felt that you hold the key to your own freedom, right? They said that themselves that I hold the key to my own freedom. That's sustained. Your Honor, we to disregard that statement. It goes to our state of mind. Over uh, that your your objections over there. Okay. Now I want to show you some other text messages that's already been introduced into evidence. I'm showing you what's been marked as detention for the jury. Do you see the date of the text message? 3-12-2014. Okay. And this would be the morning after you had dinner at Yardbird, right? He called me and said, yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you read that text to her? I guess. I don't know. He called me and said, have a nice dinner and to never call him again. I'm like, WTF. Okay. And you're talking about the trail there, right? Yes, ma'am. These text messages come from Charlie Guy. Yes, ma'am. We don't have text <laughs> I don't know why we don't. But that indicates that someone was watching you have dinner, right? Yes, ma'am. And you said, and it sounds like he laughed. Objection to reading. That's yeah. sustained. Does it sound like he laughed? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Also, too, kind of strange, don't you think, that Charles would be asking you about people the next day? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's look at the defense exhibit 29. Good. Good. Right there. Can you read that to the jury, please? I'm letting go of the night job. I'm not going in this weekend. They're behind on paying me and shit, and it's a lot of work. Like, we shouldn't have to clean up after that. What I tip out the bus boys for, and they suck. Okay. This is evidence that he's working that night. Yes, ma'am. Objection, can we ask for a date on that? Sure. April 30th? I'll turn it over. And this is in evidence. I'm also going to show you this already because it's been taken to evidence. Hi. From November 6th, 2014. What does that say? Put that you work in the office, not at home. All of these little statements that come from the ice cell, all of these are just little pieces of evidence that prove that you were working for him. Yes, ma'am. Okay? And there was a text message also about you paying for the Lexus. Yes, ma'am. There's also paperwork to support that you're paying for the Lexus. Yes, ma'am. But this is not a response that they want to hear from you. No, ma'am. Okay. It's only about their truth. Yes, ma'am. Not the real truth. Or what they have. Now, I want to... She asked you about Charlie, that there being evidence that Charlie yes. called in prescriptions for you. Yes, ma'am. Did Charlie treat your son? Or his father did, dentally? 
I, I, I don't quite remember. He might have. But you got services from them, right? Yes, ma'am. I believe one time they even, they're bringing up something about you pulling your wisdom teeth. Yes, ma'am. You need a prescription after that, don't yes, you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, no, it wasn't for any type of weird prescriptions. It was for the pain. The Vicodin. Like, I, I'm assuming it's Vicodin. I don't even remember what it was for. But yeah, from like an extraction. Now, the state tried to discuss with you about that money spike. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And she wants you to pinpoint where that money came from. Yes, ma'am. Do you remember where that money came from? No, I didn't. I didn't even know that it was spiked up like that on that exact month and from you their chart. You could easily look at this jury and say it was on that day, right? No, ma'am. I'm saying you oh, could do that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, if you wanted to make the evidence look better for you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but that's not what you've done. No, ma'am. Even though you keep saying, I, I, I don't remember, you've said I don't remember a lot. Yes, ma'am. Let's talk to the jury why it is so difficult for you to remember what happened in 2014. Why do you think it's what? so difficult for you to remember things? Besides the fact that it was eight years ago, I've been incarcerated for six years and I had COVID twice and I just, I, I can barely remember anything. Okay. And then you were able to recollect certain specifics once these text messages were shown to you. Yes, ma'am. And it's because it jogs your memory. Yes, ma'am. And it's right there. Even that I'm scared because who created those? Now, the state is saying that it would be weird for Garcia and Charlie to be speaking. As far as you knew, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Wouldn't it be more weird if Charles Adelson asked his girlfriend to ask the father of her kid, who hated him, to commit a murder for him? That would be extremely weird. Okay. The person who doesn't tolerate cocaine use is going to be okay with a murder, right? Exactly. Now, if law enforcement, if you are even worried that you did anything wrong, okay, and that it could possibly be law enforcement monitoring what you're doing, what would you or any other reasonable person do? Apparently, everybody had a burner. Like, I'm learning it every single time. Or don't speak on the phone. If you were involved in this homicide and Charles Adelson came to you and said, listen, some dude from up north went and mentioned your name and Tuto's name to my mom. What's up? Yeah. You were involved in that. Would you have freaked out? Of course. Would you have agreed to call someone who could have potentially been the FBI? Yes. You would have if you were involved? Oh, no, 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 no. I, if I you miss, were involved, I you'd, took be, that you'd out. probably say, don't ask me to do that. Exactly. Do that. Exactly. And he kept pushing for me to do it. That's the part that I don't quite understand. He kept telling me, kept telling me. And he kept saying to you, it's because they said your name. Yes, ma'am. He also says to you, they brought this out, go in there and say that this is charity and give them the money. Yes, ma'am. Is that because he says if they take the money, then it's not the cops? Yes, ma'am. He also insinuates that, hey, we're helping out the cops by finding out who this person is. Right? Yes, ma'am. He even mentions in there that when we kind of bring him out, mm -hmm. we'll then call the FBI. Yes, ma'am. He was trying to convince you that he had nothing nefarious going on. Exactly. Okay? And he just kept repeating himself over and over again. And over. That's why I wish they heard the other, however many other calls. Or if there was an actual full recording of what was happening at that table. Yes, ma'am. Okay? Miss Dugan keeps saying that you didn't say this or didn't say that or your voice didn't get loud. If you were involved, your voice probably would have gotten louder, right? I mean, what would I would probably be pissed off and reacting a completely different way. Because you'd be suspecting that, oh my God, I'm about to go down for a murder. Exactly. And I have two kids. Exactly. You wouldn't sit there and let him talk his mouth off, mm -hmm. right? Or continue to use the phone. Why? Exactly. Why use the phone? Why meet up? Why be in a, even a public place? I mean, 
Can you pinpoint to all of the recordings that you listen to, okay? Is there ever a time where there is something about anyone, you, yes, talking ma'am. about being worried about getting called by the police? No, ma'am. You are actually, explain to the jury why you got so angry on that phone call. On the, the one that I was yelling at Charlie to stop aggravating you and to do something about this. It, because it was just so many phone calls after phone calls and he's been talking about the same thing over and over and over different scenarios or do this or do that or whatever and like you call him you 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 call the number and is that part of what annoyed you is that he was pressured like you call you call yeah because they kept saying my name that's the only reason because they kept saying my name and every time you start saying i'm gonna call the fbi myself because if anyone's messing with me Because it said your name. I hear that now, and I hear it from the the phone call that it, he was trying to calm me back down. Immediately as you suggest that you're going to call the FBI, what does he say? No, Casey, listen. Yeah, yeah all of a sudden it's, yeah. The other things about them talking about, oh, he, you hear them saying, oh, they can't put you in a car. And if that segment is in relation to his scenario talking about a robbery, right? I believe so. Like he's explaining to you probably why, hey, listen, the FBI might be suspecting us of something, but don't worry, we're not involved in anything. Uh, that, uh, that's why I was getting kind of confused and like how she was saying like what was being said because I could barely hear it and I can barely understand it. And like I said, I don't want to commit. I know how it is with this whole thing, committing to certain things, and then they go back and they make it look bad. It already looks bad. And I don't even know like the which clips. I don't know if it's a consistently happening like that or that's what happened right after it because we were seeing different clips of of the video. And you trust that the jury can listen for themselves yes, the ma'am. entire video in its entirety. Yes, ma'am. That's without... why we waited for the for this video to come out so that my jury will be able to see this. And we were hoping we could hear you. Yes, ma'am. But coincidentally we can't. I don't know why. I never moved from the table. I was the same exact spot. And we just can't hear you. Now the state also brought up The fact that Charlie does favors for you and pays for things for you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. You may. Ms. McDonald, I'm showing you what the green mark has been entered with the search map. Do you recognize what this is? Yes, ma'am. Okay, do you see your name there? Yes, ma'am. And do you see Charles Edison's name there? Yes, ma'am. Does this look like a fair and accurate representation of a segment of his iCloud account? Yes, ma'am. The cell right turned out. Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time I move into evidence that the green mark has been entered with the search map. Any objection? No objection. Be admitted as defense 39. Thank you, sir. May I talk to the public? Yes. <coughs> And this is from February 2nd, 2014. You say, by the way, I need a table. Whenever you get the chance, I need to borrow one. Yes, ma'am. Charles Davidson's response. No problem. I'll call you tonight. Thank you. You know I'll pay you back. Yes, ma'am. No worries, I know the 
not a situation where Charles Davidson would just shower you with gifts and money. No. He'd help you out sometimes? Yes, ma'am. And you'd pay him back? Yes. Okay. You weren't driving around in fancy, expensive cars, right? No, actually, that Lexus that I bought from him always broke down. That's why he was helping me with Sully because of the fact that I bought that and then he just breaks down every time. Anyways, I was getting frustrated with the car. He didn't pay your rent? He did not pay my rent. He didn't pay your kid's tuition? No, ma'am. Okay. He didn't buy you fancy bags like how June has and mm -hmm. fancy shoes? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay, one, Judge, I'm going to just take the, they're two separate exhibits. Let me show it to the state. I'm going to go ahead and give them to Tracy so she can mark them. Okay. And then I'll ask a few questions so that when I do this, I can, I can take it. All right. Now, you had mentioned previously, and Ms. Dugan brought it out, that there were times that you were speaking in code on the phone. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can hear it, right? Yes, ma'am. Now, back in 2019, when you were on the oath, and you were asked about this, you admitted that you were talking in code, right? Yes, ma'am. And you said to the state exactly why it is that you were speaking that way. Yes, ma'am. Does Charles Adelson, whenever he talks, for example, about marijuana, how does he refer to it on its on the calls? And in code? The bonsai yeah, treat, the right? Yeah, the bonsai treat, yes. Okay. So it wasn't unusual to him, no. to you, that he was kind of behaving that way. And that's the thing. When he starts talking, it's like you kind of like, pick up like kind of how his you know like his way of talking his little lingo and then it's like you're talking kind of like back like him but you're not really it's not like because you're doing a code or you're coming up with this elaborate scheme of how to talk on the phone you wouldn't talk on the phone to begin with since the date of your arrest have you heard a peep from charles Adelman? no ma'am okay. has he done anything to help you no ma'am okay have you even spoken to him? No, ma'am. And you've known from the date of your arrest who the state wanted. Yes, ma'am. Okay. They made it very clear. Yes, ma'am. And you know they wanted you Objection, to cooperate. Objection, motion and lemonade. The next question is, do you know they wanted you to cooperate? Uh, you can ask that. You know they wanted you to cooperate? Yes, ma'am. And it would be as easy as you could have pled guilty and just given them what they wanted, right? Yes, ma'am. But that wouldn't be what? Truthful. Okay. You'd have to lie about your involvement. Exactly. Or how, whatever they wanted me to say. Okay. And you've tried to explain yourself to the government over and over again. Uh, plenty of times. Okay. And your story has never changed since day one. It never changed. Not like Luis Rivera's. Definitely not like Luis. Okay. And you know that this is a very tough time for you right now, sitting here having to answer all of these questions about your personal life, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And there's a camera behind us. Yes, ma'am. So you've had to go through this before and have all of yes, your personal business all over, everywhere, right? Yes, ma'am. It's not easy. No, and you still elected to get up and do it again today. <sighs> yes, ma'am. Why? Because I want him to know the truth. It has to come out for me. All this speculation and all of this evidence and how everything's been. It's, I've been living this for six years. And I, I just, if I didn't come up here and I didn't talk to my jury, <laughs> I, I don't even know. I, I don't know what the outcome would be. Okay. All right, so that's 40 and 41. 40 and 14. All right, they'll be admitted.
about data because I ain't even ended up with one of them, right? And then this one, we can talk about one of the kinds of five words out. 11, 15, 11, 14. Oh my God, I have a bad, I'm bad news. FML. I have to take it back tomorrow, but the car came on with expenses for both, so I need a loan, buddy. Wow, imagine if I took it to another mechanic. I just texted Charlie my PC, which would be credit card. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm taking care of Katie's car. Thanks, buddy. Are you sure it's going to be like a brand or so? Now, this is between Charles Avis and a solid, right? Okay, yes, ma'am. This is Charles Avis and one behind your back. In place, right. Is that because he knows that you are not somebody that just you take all these handouts? No, I don't. I don't. I don't like to owe anybody anything. No further questions, ma'am. All right, Ms. Navarro, you may step down to council table. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, we can just leave everything there. All right, is the defense calling any other witnesses? No, Your Honor, the defense rests. All right, the defense is rest. Does the state have any rebuttal witnesses? No, Your Honor. Okay, so that completes the testimony portion of the case. Okay, I apologize for keeping you so late, but I think you understand the importance of getting this done today. So I hope you bear with me. Um, so tomorrow when we uh, reconvene, we will start with the jury instructions and then closing arguments, okay? That will be done all in the morning. I expect that what we will do is um, that will be done by lunchtime. The court will provide lunch to you and you will go back at noontime and start your deliberations at that time, okay? So that's what I'm expecting, uh, absent any uh, anything that is out of my control or anything that I don't know up to this point, but that's what we're expecting for tomorrow, okay? Everyone, I don't want to hold you any longer. Have a great evening. No talking about the case with anyone else. You can leave your pads right here on your chairs, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow morning at 8.30. We'll start promptly after that, okay? Thank you. All right, jury's out of the courtroom. The door is closed. You may be seated. <coughs> uh, both uh, uh, the state and the defense have now rested. And uh, would you like to uh, bring any motions on behalf of the defense? Yes, Your Honor. I move to At this time, the defense would like to renew all previous motions and objections and now make our second motion for judgment of acquittal. Okay. Um, even in the light taken most favorable to the state, the state. I think this, the standard is now that no reasonable juror could find Ms. McVan were guilty beyond the, the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. At this, now that the standard has changed, judge a little bit, and we've also had um, evidence from Ms. McVan. Uh, I would rely on the same arguments I made as to the elements of um, all three charges, in that all of the cases circumstantial, but for the evidence of Luis Rivero. And now that Ms. McBann has taken the stand and explained everything as it relates to the circumstantial evidence in this case, and she's been consistent since day one, that weakens the evidence against that the state has as, as it relates to the circumstantial evidence. And then now, all you have left to evaluate is still Luis Rivera. Same argument, Judge. All we have in front of us is Luis Rivera, who admittedly says, I don't know anything about this. I don't know who did the hiring. I don't know anything. It's only Garcia's telling me that Katie is in the one doing the middle. There's no evidence that she knew what in the middle was for. Was if, if you believe him and he says, oh, she was in the middle hiring us for this, Louis Rivera himself says, I thought I was going to commit a robbery. And the elements say that you have to have intended the crime to be committed. There's no evidence that Ms. McDonnell conspired with anyone to have a murder committed. Mr. Rivera was not able to give any information as to who it was in the Adelson family that this was done through. Ms. McDonnell didn't do anything to assist. There's no evidence that the paperwork with Dan Martel's face on it didn't come directly from Charles Adelson. Mr. Rivera never said that that information came from Ms. McDonnell. It actually came from Mr. Garcia. 
And the only evidence they have is supposedly her the next day being picked up by Sigfredo and going to the house. And their own witnesses say that she didn't know what was in the bag. Even believing that that took place, there is no evidence to establish that Ms. McBanner knew there was money in the bag or that this was money for any criminal activity. So in addition to all the cases that I cited earlier, Judge, for my first JOA, this, this is the additional argument that I'm making for the second JOA. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kwan. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge Ms. Kaplan. I'll rely on my previous arguments, Your Honor. All right. The second motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. There is uh, sufficient evidence uh, for a reasonable juror to find the defendant guilty on all three charges. Uh, so there certainly is sufficient evidence for this to go to the jury. Uh, and for my reasons also stated uh, previously, uh, the motion is denied. All right. Um, can we take a look at the jury instructions now? I think we can get through these pretty uh, efficiently so that we can have them ready to go uh, when we uh, bring the jury back tomorrow. So uh, who's going to handle this on behalf of the state? Uh, Mr. Evans is going to come down, Judge, but I'll stand in until he arrives. All right. And do you all, um, Ms. Dugan, do we have the same technology that we have out in Gadsden where we can make changes to them right here? Yes, sir. I can make changes as well. Okay. Can you do that? All right. Good morning. Good, good, after, well, good evening, Your Honor. All right. Good afternoon. Good late afternoon. Late afternoon. All right. And so, uh, Ms. Kawashi, you're handling the, yes, the jury Your instructions? Honor. Okay. <laughs> no. I could have this one going in the full room. All right. Uh, Your Honor, I just want to let you know, it's very minor changes. It, a lot of it really just includes taking out some instructions that the state included. Okay. And um, right. I'm a stickler for mirroring the language from the Florida Supreme Court's um, All right. standards. I, so it's I just appreciate that. relatively minor changes. What I'm going to do is since the state submitted them to me, I'm going to take it as if uh, they don't have any objection to them. And so I'll be going primarily to you to see as we work our way through. Right, Your Honor. And I have the copy that they provided to you. So I've, I've been going based off of their copy and the, the minor changes that I want right, to have made. We'll let Ms. Dugan uh, bring them up and then she can just make the changes there. And then we can get uh, the appropriate copies made for tomorrow. All right. You're ready? Yes, sir. Okay. The only thing that I see on the first page is uh, just a, a minor change with there's no space above justifiable homicide on my copy. If you could just make sure that's a space there. Uh, well, all right. Yes, sir. And then also on the bottom, it's uh, it's the wrong. I don't know what those are called on the bottom there, but can you see underneath the page number? It has Mr. Garcia still on there, so we yeah. need to take oh, that yes. out for the page Thank number. Thank you. No, too fast. Okay, so for the statement of charge, introduction to homicide, and and the justifiable homicide uh, instruction, and the excusable homicide instruction, those are standard instructions. Any discussion on those? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, just like I said, I'm a stickler with the Florida Supreme Court's guidance. So in the statement of the charge, I would I would just add that conspiracy to commit murder and solicitation to commit murder is just just the addition of those words instead of conspiracy to commit murder and right. solicitation, solicitation to commit, to commit murder. murder. Right. All right. I'm in favor of that. So we'll just make that more specific. Yeah, it's just more clarification for the jury. Conspiracy to commit solicitation to commit. Conspiracy right, to, to commit murder and solicitation to just commit until murder. Just until it's charged in the information. Just to add those words. <laughs> I just want to make sure that our camera here is not getting any work product oh. by looking at the back of these. Okay, thank you. Um, Your Honor, as for the introduction to homicide, we would ask that the first three paragraphs be taken. We are, uh, the defense is waiving all lesser included. Um, in this case, we, we believe that based on the facts, there, we're, we've never disputed that a first degree murder has been committed. Um, so we would be waiving all category one lessers. We, we would ask that second degree murder not be included, um, manslaughter not be included, any lessers of murders. We're not disputing that um, Dan Markell was premeditatedly murdered. State is not waiving the lessers, Your Honor. All right, we're keeping the lessers. That's a standard instruction. So um, I, we're keeping in both the second degree and the manslaughter. Okay, uh, Your Honor, we would, um, we're not asserting justifiable homicide or excusable homicide. We would ask that those be taken out. I think those are required to be read, Your Honor. And so we are requesting them. 
All right, um, I'm going to keep them both. It's a standard instruction that's given in every uh, first degree murder uh, case, and so they, they will remain. All right, so now we go okay. to count one first degree murder uh, and uh, any discussion on that. Ms. Kawaz? Uh, no, Your Honor, I have no objection to the um, the actual where it says count one first degree murder. Okay. I have no objection to it's the All standard right. jury instruction. And then the standard instruction with the lesser included crimes. I understand that you have Over, an objection or, to including right. them, but that's the standard instruction if we right. are. Okay. All right. And then second degree murder, any discussion on that? Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay. And any discussion on the manslaughter? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Okay. The principal's instruction, uh, any discussion on the principal's instruction? Um, Your Honor, I know that it was probably just put in there just to facilitate everything for the jury, but the way, the way it starts with there are two ways in which a person may be a principal is not in the standard jury instruction. We would just ask that it read principles and then the, the, it, that language is taken out and it starts with if the defendant helped another person, which is the standard language. Um, I do note that it says if the defendant helps another person or persons commit a crime, it says that defendant. I don't know if that's maybe just because Ms. McBannon was tried with Mr. Garcia the last time. The standard language says the defendant, not that defendant. I know I'm being particular, but I'm just, like I said, you're honest. All right. No, that's, it, it, whenever it's clear, that's, I don't have so, any problem. With right. Uh, so, and then the first, the rest of the paragraph is fine. And then it says the first num number one, it says that defendant. I would just ask that it be changed to the defendant. And the same for paragraph two. So instead of that defendant, it says the defendant. All right. Uh, the language otherwise is from, is, is standard. Okay. All uh, right. right. So the, there are two ways in which a person may be a principal is not in the standard instruction? No, Your Honor, because the, the standards are differentiated <coughs> between three point, I think it's eight for okay. principles. Um, the second one would be okay. principles, and then then it says when active participant hired by defendant. That would All be right. the second principle instruction. Mr. Evans? Your Honor, the reason it was being requested for both, uh, or this line was inserted the last time and it needs to be inserted this time is because there's two ways to prove principle. One is the first paragraph, or the first one that goes through um, if the defendant helped another person and goes through one and two, all right. I think it's repetitive. I don't think we need it. I mean, it, if you read it all in its entirety, that you can tell. That's what the jury instruction says, that there's two ways. So we're going to take that out, Ms. Dugan. And then if you could change uh, that on that first line to the V, and then also with one and two, change that to V. If you have any question about what I'm saying, then let me know. Okay, and then on the next uh, way to be a principal, where it's one, two, three, on the first, on number one, we'll need to change that to V. V. And also, I believe in the initial paragraph, um, it, I have it here as an addition. I think it might have been inadvertently left out. It just says defendant instead of the defendant. And, Your Honor, I'd just like to note for the record that the, the first line of that paragraph where it says the defendant may also be a principal if he or she is not standard language, it just starts, the standard language starts with if the defendant paid or promised to pay another person. That's how the standard reads. All right. The May was instructed for the same reason the first line was instructed, to differentiate their two ways to prove principle, which is the first part, which would be um, 3.5A, I believe. This is Andy. Uh, yes. Yeah. 3.5A. And the second part is um, the second way you can prove a person as a principal is 3.5b, which is where it starts to offend it, um, paid or promised is what it says. But the reason that line, the, the first part of that line was inserted, it was inserted last time, was to. I don't to, care if it was inserted last time. I don't need to hear that. Just, is it just, in the standard instruction? It is not in standard instruction. Then I don't want it. I don't want it. The defendant may also be a principal is struck. And so if it'll start with if. If the defendant, right. And Your Honor, I'd just like to note in element one, it says that defendant again instead of though. And Your Honor, for the record, the reason the state has made this is requesting an obstruction and is objecting to removal of it is that it needs to be clear to the jury that there are two ways to prove the defendant may be a principal. One is under 5A, the other, or 3.5A, the other is under 3.5B. And the way it's being worded now, does not make it clear to the jury uh, that distinction that there are two different ways. Your Honor, if I, if I may respond, 
I believe that how that could be clarified is where you have principles, which is how the 3.5a is titled principles. 3.5b is actually titled principles when active participant hired by defendant. I would ask that that title be included before the second one so that the jury is well aware that there are two different ways that principles can be uh, would, proved. Would not have any objection to that, Your yeah. Honor, because then it clearly makes it, the yeah, it's different. I, I agree with the state, Your Honor. I don't want to come. All right, want we'll to make, that, the make that change then. Sarah, Sarah, it would look like this. Okay. So it would just be the title of the actual 3.5b. So take out this language here that says the defendant may also right. And then so that will be capital. And then you can add in this title, which says principal dash when active participant. Because I understand that the state wants to differentiate the two. So it would be that title, but with a hyphen right before the second one. Um, I don't know if you want to include in the standard. I know it's repetitive, but after both principles, it says to be a principal, the defendant does not have to be present. When it's, I don't know if you want to have that. Okay, hold on a sec. We, if we need to get this on the record. Okay, Your Honor, if, we're, if, um, if the court agrees that we should have them um, differentiated by title under the first principles instruction, the standard language, and it's repetitive to both principles, but I, I want to make sure that it's clear to the jury for both. After the second element on the first principles, there should be language that reads, to be a principal, the defendant does not have to be present when the crime is committed. That language is read for both principles instructions. So it will be repetitive, but since we're delineating them into two different types of principles, I, 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 I'm sure the state would agree that that, that line needs right, to be so read. All right, Mr. Evans, one. is that a distinction? Is that a good enough distinction for the state? Yes. Well, it's since we're breaking the two, two of them out, they should read, and put them under different headings, right. they should read as the standard instructions read. It does include that line, so we have no objection right. to it reading All right. as standard right. read. Thank you. I know that everything's fine. The only thing that's changed is in red. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm looking right here now. Okay, and sorry. I've got a VU over to the side. Oh, and Your Honor, in paragraph two on the 3.5b, which is when active participant, um, I would request that it cross out he or, because it reads he or she, but in this case, Ms. McBannell is, it's just Ms. McBannell alone. That's acceptable, Your Honor. All right. Yes, please. Yeah, that line needs to be put in right above. Huh? Oh, yeah, in all the, yeah. In both paragraphs, this line has to be. Oh, we already have it in this one. Right. Yeah, in both paragraphs, it'll both just paragraphs say if she. Right. Oh, okay, so I'm just going to copy and paste this then. Well, yes, that needs to. And then in both paragraphs. Um, All right. I'm just going to copy oh, and paste. Oh, right this. in here at the top. If if she, as if she. So right here, just cross out he or. Because I remember last time Mr. Garcia was sitting here. Okay. Right. All right. Just look over that real quick. There's a lot of changes. Let's make sure. Do you want to get over here? Yeah. Here. I've just made my changes in red. So the and then the defendant. The defendant. And then the language, the standard. <coughs> right. And then it starts with if the defendant, right? Two, da, da, da. The first needs to be in. Oh, this wasn't a separate line. I didn't know it's in the standard. Your Honor, in the in the 3.5B, the active participant. Um in the state's version, it, it's broken down into two separate sentences. It's actually just one sentence. So it says, if the defendant paid or promised to pay another person or persons to commit a crime, comma, the defendant is a principal right. and must be treated. They have it as two separate sentences. So I would just ask it if the state has no objection, just to no objection have it read. To read it. As okay. one, one fluid sentence. All right. Are you on, sir? Yes. So it would be crime. So it would be so comma and then it would a be comma T. the defendant. And it, all the language is the same after that. Yeah. Okay. And then oh and the line. Okay. Uh you go. Yeah. Okay. All right. The changes have been made? Yes. Okay. All right. So now we're to independent act. Uh, Your Honor, we were asking to remove that instruction. I did some case law, and I, I found case law that says that when the defendant's theory at trial is supported by the testimony at trial from the defendant is that they're denying any involvement, it negates the propriety of an independent act instruction. 
and I can put the case site on the record. All right, Mr. Evans, any objection? No objection. If they were put in there last time, I think at one of the defendant's requests. I right. think it was Mr. Garcia's okay. request. Yeah. So we'll take out independent act. Yeah. Count two for uh, conspiracy. Any discussion? Uh, Your Honor, the only language that's not standard is the first line that says, in count two, Catherine D. McManus, the defendant in this case, have been accused of the crime of conspiracy to commit first degree murder. That's the only language that's not standard. I mean, I don't. All right. It's just the introductory line. We'll right. keep that in. Okay. So everything else is standard. You're okay with it? Yes. Okay. Ms. Dugan, you're all caught up? No changes. No changes. No, no changes. No yes, I am. Okay. All right. Count three solicitation. It has the same introductory line. Right. And then any other discussion? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The amended information for the solicitation count actually lists who the one or more persons were. So I would ask that it track the language of the information. So we would take out the defendant solicited one or more persons and put in the defendant solicited Luis Rivera and or Sigfredo Garcia because that's how it's charged in the information. Do you have any objection or? Or do you have discussion on that, Mr. Like Fredo Garcia? Do you, want, do you want me to pull up the information? So they want the specific names of. Yes, that will be acceptable. And that's okay. exactly how it's, it's worded in the information, Your Honor. So All right, so the defendant solicited. Luis Rivera and or Sigfredo Garcia. So All that, right. That's how it's charged in the information. And Lewis that would also go for Rivera the second element. And slash or. Yes, and or. Okay. I hate that language in jury instructions, but that's, that's how it's charged in. Sigfrido Garcia. Right. And that would also go for element two, Your Honor. Where instead of one or more persons, it would say Luis Rivera and. <coughs> All right. You see that, Ms. Dugan? Yeah. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Uh, plea of not guilty, reasonable doubt, and burden of proof is the standard instruction. Any discussion on that? Like I said, Your Honor, I don't mean to be a stickler. I just like to track the language. Um, it says to overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has a burden of proving. The standard instruction doesn't, it doesn't pluralize crimes. It just says crime um, with which the defendant is charged was committed. And the defendant is the person who committed the crime. It's just, it's mere semantics, Your Honor. I mean. I, I doubt whether it says crimes or was or were or individual or person really have an effect on the jurors. I'm, but just, mm -hmm. I'm just a very big stickler for tracking language for, for the instructions. All right, so do we want that in plural then since there's three crimes charged? That was the reason it was included, John. All three right. Three crimes charged. And the defendant is the individual who, so then it needs to be consistent with the last crime on that paragraph. Has the burden of proving the crimes with which the defendant is charged were committed and the defendant is the individual who committed the crimes? Got it. Got it. All right, then we go to weighing the evidence. Judge, everything is exactly as worded. I would just ask that the 10th factor be considered, which was, does the witness have a general reputation for dishonesty? And I would be pointing to Mr. Rivera. I don't. Was I don't know if reputation evidence was was admitted in this. Ah, uh, Your Honor. Garcia. Yeah, I said. Well, Garcia and Rivera, several witnesses, Your Honor, were asked about Mr. Rivera's reputation. Uh, was he known as a Latin King member? Um, which I would. All right. Uh, when, I, when out of well. an abundance of caution, we'll we'll yeah. put that back in. And Miss Adelson, of course. Which so, do you know that possible. language, Miss Dugan? Eric. Yes. So let's see. We keep it. All right. So we're adding number 10. I can't remember, but I do have the actual. No. You got the actual yeah, one. actually, I have that. I, I okay. You can double check it before. I'm 
I got chocolate from it. Ooh, that's nice. And the rest of the, the rest of that instruction is, is perfect. If I okay. Know. We keep in law enforcement. We keep in expert witness. Mm -hmm. One through ten. The nine that they included was were, were properly included. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm moving down from that. So burden of proof instruction, law enforcement instruction, expert witness instruction. We keep in uh, the paragraph in regards to immunity. So now we're, Ms. Dugan, have you caught up? Yeah. Okay. Now we keep, we will keep in the defendant has become a witness. So we right. can take off the shading off of that and keep in the next two paragraphs and then take out defendant not testifying. Got it. Right. Okay. Defendant's statements. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask that that be removed from the research I've done. That seems to the language, the language of the instruction talks about whether a statement was made knowingly, voluntarily and freely made. It seems to deal with statements of the defendants that were made to police, um, like a confession, anything of that sort. And there's no evidence that Ms. McManaw has given a formal statement to the police. Any discussion from the state? Yeah. We don't have any objection to taking it out. It's just usually okay. a standard That's one anytime. Right. Any All right, we'll take out defendant statements then. <coughs> Rules for deliberation. Uh, we keep in all of those except for number seven. Seven, yes, that's what I was going to say. Okay. I don't believe that that was applicable in this case. Let me know when you're ready. ready. Okay. And then so we'll have uh, renumbered to just seven of those. Mm -hmm. Cautionary instruction and single defendant multiple counts. No objection, no. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll need a verdict form. Oh. Right. So... Uh, have you, did you send that to me? I didn't get one. No, sir, we have some verdict for All right, it. if you could send me one in the morning, well, um, then we'll go over that in the morning. And then submitting the case to the jury. Uh, Your Honor, of course, I just have to lay the record. For the verdict um, instruction, I would, of course, object to the inclusion of any language that deals with lesser included based on my prior objection, but All based right. on Your Honor's ruling. All right, and uh, you can put that on the record when I show you the verdict form okay. also. So submitting the case to the jury, uh, anything in regards to that? Your Honor, there was one line that was left out from the standard, which is in the second paragraph, it, uh, which would be a, the second sentence after our present in the jury room. The language that was left out was, if a juror goes to the restroom, the deliberation should stop until the juror returns. That's the only discrepancy I saw with the standard. All right. Let's, what, what number is that instruction, do you know? Um, no, there were no numbers. Is it, let's see. It might be three point. Submitting case to the jury instruction. 13. One, three. Oh, I guess well. Yeah. Okay. It's 13. Yeah, so there's the one sentence. Paragraph. The second sentence. It says something about the restroom. So if a juror goes to the restroom, the deliberation should stop until the juror returns. If a juror goes to the restroom, comma, the deliberation, deliberation should, should stop until the, the juror returns. returns. That's the only line that I saw that was was not present. All right, we'll include that. It might, no, I think it was updated since. That's why I had to go to the website to make sure, because I, I know that this, it, this, it's been a couple of years. Got it. Yeah. All right, I think that we're set then. <coughs> um, Your Honor, just one more thing. Yes. Oh, the last that? paragraph, it says, during the trial, items are received into evidence. Uh, you may examine what of exhibits you think will help in your deliberations. The standard language gives two options. Either A, these exhibits will be sent into the jury room with you when you begin to deliberate, or if you wish to see any exhibits, please request that in writing. Mm -hmm. it, it, I didn't see any language that said the exhibits will be delivered to you shortly, so I'm not sure if Your Honor wants to select A or B. I, we're fine with which either, whichever one the court prefer to keep in um uh, let's see you may know uh, the exhibits will be delivered to you all right so the exhibits will be sent into the jury room when you with you when you begin to deliberate 
is appropriate. That yes, I left that up to your honors. Um, I didn't know if you'd want them to request it before they see, or if you would just send everything back. And so either one would be fine with with the defense. Uh, well, they have the capability to to view video and audio back in the jury room in this jury room, I believe. I checked on that. We don't have this special equipment though. If they want to hear both of you there, the wiretap calls you might have to come back in here. Mm. Maybe we, I mean, none of us could be in here, and they could just come. I don't know. John, I wouldn't um, object if you wanted to add an extra, especially for the Dolce Vita video. So you'd say if you wish to see, I mean, that particular exhibit, because I, I, I really don't know how they would get this. Okay, this equipment. is what we can say. We can let's. Let's take out the exhibits will be delivered to you shortly. We'll, we'll put right. in these exhibits will be sent into the jury room with you when you begin to deliberate, and then we're going to add another sentence. Right. Here. I don't know. That might have been an update. I don't understand. And let me know when you're ready with that. Okay, if you wish to use the audio headphones provided in the courtroom, comma, please request that in writing. Any objection from the defense? No objection, Your Honor. All right. I'm trying to fix the footer. Um, yeah. I'm, There's a footer. Yeah, I, but I. She has two case yeah, numbers. It's just. Yeah, but there's so there's two case. Oh, uh, the case numbers are two thousand. Are we putting both of them in the footer? Right I've been now? using both of them because okay. for some reason that's what the clerk's office has. So it's two thousand sixteen CF three zero three six and two thousand eighteen CF four nine seven. And Your Honor, I'd just like to say I I I had all the intentions of removing the letters. I so I I'm not going I'm going to be honest with the court. I didn't really look through. Of I'm removing gonna, what? I'm, I, the lesser included. I okay. because we were had been asking. So I'm I'm going to go and look through them tonight. I'm sure they're standard. Uh, but if I do see anything that I would be happy to contact the state and just to let Your Honor know. But I'm I'm sure they're standard. All right. I, don't I mean, think you can have things. discussions and then just let me know in the morning. Yeah. But. Um, and uh, but we'll go with this as the final form unless unless you have any discussion to change that. Right. OK. And then um, so, Miss Deegan, you you have that if you could or when you get back to your office, ask somebody to. Print that out and can you make the copies? Yes, sir. All right. We'll make okay. twenty five. All right, are we all set? Yes, sir. I'm okay. going to email these to everybody if that's okay, just in case there's anything else. <coughs> right. <coughs> All right, they're coming as an email to everyone. All right, we're all set then uh, with the charge conference. And so tomorrow morning, uh, we'll meet back here. We start been starting uh, promptly at 845. We'll have the jury instructions ready to go. Read the jury instructions. We'll go right into closing. All right, who for the state, Ms. Dugan, who's doing closing for you, Ms. Kaplan? Yes, sir. All right, she's not here. Okay, and what about for the defense, Ms. Kawas? All right, so I want to get them into the jury room by lunchtime. So, are we going to, uh, uh, these jury instructions aren't going to take that long to read. Okay. So, we're going to be starting at approximately nine o'clock. Okay. All right, so. Uh, do you think 90 minutes is sufficient for oh, you, Ms. Kowas? Your Honor, I think so. 90 minutes and 90 All right, minutes so I'm going to hold you to that, okay? <laughs> I, um, I won't talk too fast, I promise. <laughs>
All right. <laughs> and so if Ms. Kappelman can get the same message, uh, and then uh, as I stated to the jury, then I'll excuse the alternates. We'll send them back to start deliberating at that time, and I'm going to provide them lunch, and then I'm going to tell them now the time is in your hands in regards to that. Okay. Just to be clear, Your Honor, the 90 minutes, she can divide up however she, she can. She can, yeah. Right. Okay. However she chooses. Okay. We don't have that. Okay. All right. Anything else before we break for the evening? From the not defense? Not from the defense. Good. Yeah. From the state? No. Sir. All right. Thank you. All right. We're in recess till tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.